Preface to Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Preface. The Department of Education, after open competition, decided to produce a new public school geography, entirely Canadian, both in authorship and in point of view. Former textbooks in geography, adapted from books issued in the United States, have proved, in many respects, unsatisfactory. Therefore, it was deemed expedient to utilize Canadian talent, to encourage Canadian enterprise, and to secure a thoroughly Canadian outlook however formidable and hazardous such an undertaking might provide. An earnest attempt has been made to make the text suitable in style and content for the pupils of the elementary schools. As a result, many teachers will miss in these chapters the treatment of some topics usually supposed to be indispensable in a textbook in geography. Other topics, usually treated extensively, have been simplified as much as possible. Teachers wishing to supplement the textbook by more extensive treatment will find abundant material in the revised teacher's manual. The ingenuity of the editors has been taxed to keep pace with the kaleidoscopic changes in political geography which have occurred during the period in which the text has been prepared. They have done their utmost to make the text accurate, but that is no guarantee that it will be equally accurate six months or a year from the time of publication. Accordingly, it is the intention of the Department of Education and of the publishers to revise the book at frequent intervals as future events may demand. The publishers are indebted to many companies and individuals for the use of photographs for purposes of illustration. They wish to mention, particularly, the Canadian Pacific Railway, the Canadian National Railways, the Hydroelectric Power Commission of Ontario, the Massey Harrison Company, General Motors of Canada, the Dominion Textile Company, the Associated Screen News, the Canadian National Exhibition, the Canadian Manufacturers Association, the International Nickel Company, and Mr. Ewig Galloway, New York. They have also to thank for the use of a large number of photographs, as well as for many courtesies received. The Department of the Interior, Ottawa. The Department of Trade and Commerce, Ottawa. The Department of Railways and Canals, Ottawa. The Department of Mines, Ottawa. The Department of National Defense, Ottawa. And the Department of Natural Resources, Ottawa. The various departments of the Ontario government have also been very helpful in the way of supplying both information and illustrations. End of preface. Section 1 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Ontario Public School Geography by the Ontario Department of Education. Section 1. An Aeroplane Journey Over Canada. We are going to begin our study of geography with an imaginary journey across our own country. That is no small undertaking, for Canada is a very large country. In fact, it is one of the largest countries in the world. From your home in Ontario, you may travel eastward, or westward, or northward, for many hundreds of miles without leaving Canada. In the days of our great-grandfathers, we should have traveled by wagon, or by horseback, or by boat. Now there are fast express trains. They speed across Canada, wide though it is, in less than six days. For our trip, we shall choose a mode of travel that is even faster than a fast express train. Many of you have seen an aeroplane, like the one shown in the picture. We have chosen the aeroplane for our trip because it is so fast and because we can see much more of the country from high in the air. The trip across Canada by aeroplane has actually been made. 
In October 1920, two officers of the Canadian Air Force flew right across Canada, from Halifax, far to the east of Ontario, to Vancouver, even farther to the west. Think of flying for more than 3,300 miles over the forests and farms, the rivers and lakes, the cities and towns of Canada. What a wonderful trip they had! Imagine yourself in the harbor of Halifax. You are seated in a seaplane, that is, a kind of aeroplane adapted for starting from and landing on the water. Everything is ready for the start. The engine begins to roar, the propeller blades begin to whirl, and the plane glides forward over the surface of the water. Then it rises gently into the air and soars higher and higher as it gathers speed. The pilot heads toward the northwest, across Nova Scotia, and we are off. Behind us is the Atlantic Ocean. Far out on its green water you can perhaps see a trail of smoke. This marks a steamer coming to port with a cargo of goods from overseas or one leaving with a load of Canadian products for Great Britain. Perhaps you can see the white glint of a sail. It probably belongs to a fishing schooner. Out there beyond the sight of land are the finest fishing grounds in the world. Ahead of us is the narrow peninsula of Nova Scotia. A short flight takes us across it. At first the ground below us is rocky, rough, and wooded. As we approach the other side of the peninsula, it improves. There are many fine farms and splendid orchards in this part of the province. Leaving Nova Scotia behind, we sweep across the Bay of Fundy and begin our flight over New Brunswick. It seems to be a province of trees. For mile after mile we see almost unbroken forest. Through the woods run many rivers, some of them of great size. Here and there on the river banks are little villages, each clustered about a sawmill. There are farms, too, and occasionally we see a town or a city, but we shall always remember New Brunswick as a forest province. At last we reach a very large river running between high cliffs of rock. This is the St. Lawrence, the greatest river of Canada. We have now left New Brunswick and are in the province of Quebec. The St. Lawrence marks our course for us. We follow the river, noting, as we fly, the boats plying up and down it. The St. Lawrence is the great waterway of Canada. It makes a broad highway for ships from the Atlantic Ocean deep into the heart of Canada. Soon we reach the city of Quebec, with its citadel perched high upon a lofty bluff overlooking the river. It is a busy city, and we can see several large ocean steamers berthed at its docks. Beyond this city, the banks of the river become lower, they are lined with fine farms, cozy hamlets, and busy towns. The traffic on the river is becoming greater, for we are approaching Montreal, the largest city of Canada. As we fly over the city, we notice huge factories with smoking chimneys, big office buildings, and large warehouses. Down at the waterfront are miles of docks and wharves. We can easily count forty or fifty big steamers, receiving or discharging cargo. Some of them will go down the St. Lawrence and out into the Atlantic. Others will go up the river into the Great Lakes. From Montreal, we continue our flight along the St. Lawrence and the shore of Lake Ontario. We are now flying over our home province. On our left, Lake Ontario lies like a sheet of silver. Here and there is a dark smudge of smoke, marking a steamer carrying passengers or goods up or down the lake. To the right, as far as we can see, is field after field of green or yellow or brown. There are dark green patches of woods scattered among the tilled fields. There are many comfortable farmhouses. Often we sweep over quiet little villages. At longer intervals are towns or cities where smoking chimneys show that busy workmen are making some of the many things which we need in our daily life. Toronto is our next stopping place. It is a city almost as large as Montreal, and just as busy. From Toronto, our pilot heads northwest, across the Lake Peninsula of Ontario. How different southern Ontario is from New Brunswick! In southern Ontario, nearly all the land is farmed, and large towns and cities are found everywhere. 
After reaching Lake Huron, we settled down to a long and rather monotonous flight over Lake Huron and Lake Superior. After hours and hours of flying over the water, we reached the twin cities of Port Arthur and Fort William. At Port Arthur are large docks and many ships. These are mostly grain carriers. We can see them loading grain from huge buildings, towering right up at the water's edge. These buildings are called elevators. In them is stored grain, brought by rail from western Canada. Fort William, too, has many such elevators. It is interesting to see the grain pouring down the long spouts from the bins into the holds of the vessels. Leaving Fort William, we pass over the roughest country we have yet seen. It is rocky, hilly, and covered with trees. There are many rivers and streams and lakes, both large and small. For the first time in our journey, we have reached the great northern forest which covers more than half of Canada. We could fly for hundreds of miles to the north, for many hundreds of miles to the east, or for as great a distance to the northwest, and never leave this immense tract of forest. In it we should see few signs of life. Yet life is there. Many animals make it their home, and there are hunters and trappers who make their living by catching them. Along the southern edge of the forest are lumbermen busied in cutting down trees for timber, or for pulpwood, from which paper is made. Yet these men are so few, compared with the endless miles of forest, that in a flight of hundreds of miles we might not see a human being. Our course, however, is almost due west, and it will soon take us out of the forest. The trees become more scattered, and at last we are flying over a flat, treeless country. It stretches to the south and west, farther than I can reach. This is the prairie. Our first glimpse of it tells us that we have passed from Ontario into Manitoba. Less than an hour's flight over this beautiful farmland brings us to Winnipeg. This is a large and busy city, one of the largest that we shall see in our trip west of Toronto. And now, for eight hundred miles and more, we fly due west, over great fields of grain and wide stretches of grassland. In this part of our trip, we scarcely see a tree. The most conspicuous objects on the level ground are tall wooden buildings, built at intervals along the railway lines. These are elevators, to which the farmers bring their grain when the threshing is over. The grain cars are loaded at them and carry the grain away to the big elevators at Port Arthur and Fort William. We notice, too, that the farmhouses are more scattered on the prairie than in Ontario. At times we pass over large tracts of land which are not occupied at all. There is plenty of land in the Canadian West. At last we reach Calgary, the largest city of Alberta. Since leaving Winnipeg, we have crossed the provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and most of Alberta. We must now prepare ourselves for the most dangerous and thrilling flight of all. Even before reaching Calgary, we saw a wall of dark, cloud-like forms far to the west. These, however, were not clouds. We were looking at the Rocky Mountains, and as we approach them and see their peaks soaring high into the air, we wonder how our pilot will ever be able to take us safely over them. But we soon see that we do not have to go over the highest peaks. We fly between them, through passes in the mountains. Even so, we have to climb higher and higher, and at one time we pass through a bank of clouds and rise above them. What a wonderful sight to see the clouds swirling below us while we fly in dazzling sunshine above them. For four hundred miles we fly on over mountains, over deep, narrow valleys, in which are foaming streams or quiet lakes, or over rough, hilly ground covered with dense forest. Here and there in the valleys are farms and towns, and on the largest mountain lakes we see steamers. Sometimes we pass mines, where men are busy cutting deep into the mountains in search of coal, or gold, or silver, or lead. This flight over British Columbia ends when we reach the city of Vancouver, on the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Here again we see docks and wharves and many steamers bringing goods to Canada and taking away others in exchange. We have finished our trip across Canada. 
We have seen something of Canada's forests and farms, her cities and towns, her rivers and lakes, her mountains and mines, her railways and ships. Yet we have seen only a little of southern Canada. Beyond it, to the north, lie the immense agricultural, forest, and mineral areas on which the future of Canada depends, and which, as yet, are only partially developed. Still farther north is the great northern forest, bordering on the cold, desolate, treeless land along the shores of the Arctic Ocean. Life in the Arctic regions or in the northern forest is very different from that which we know in our comfortable homes in southern Canada. Let us now see how the inhabitants of these parts of Canada live. End of section 1 Section 2 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Bryce Allen, Woodbridge, Virginia. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book of Toronto. Section 2 Introductory men who live by hunting and fishing the men of the frozen north far far to the north of our province live the eskimos their land is very cold for nine months of the year the snow lies deep over all the ground and thick ice covers the water for months during the winter the sun is never seen at all <clears throat> terrible blizzards often rage for days together when the sky is clear the bright stars help to lighten the gloom. The northern lights, which can be sometimes seen flickering in the sky, are much brighter in Eskimo land. Their greenish radiance casts a weird light over the snow and ice. The summer is only three months long. During that time the sun never disappears from the sky, but it does not give nearly so much heat as in our country. It is always low down in the sky near the horizon. Its slanting rays melt the snow and ice from the southern slopes that thaw the surface of the soil. Mosses, lichens, and coarse grass grow on the cold ground during the summer. No trees or grain or fruit, such as we have, can grow there. A few varieties of berries which grow in the warmer parts of Eskimo land are the only vegetable food Eskimos can get. They must live almost entirely upon the flesh of animals to eat. The Eskimos are a race of people quite different from us. They are shorter than the men of southern Canada, but sturdy and strong. Their skin is yellow, their hair is straight and black, their faces are broad and rather flat. There are not many Eskimos, but their country is so cold and poor that there is food enough for only a few people. During the summer, the Eskimos live in tents made of skins. The tents are small and easily moved as the Eskimos roam from place to place in search of food. During the winter, they have and round houses built of blocks of snow. The thick snow walls of their igloos keep out the keen winds. A block of clear ice serves as a window. The door is only a hole in the wall, so low that the Eskimo has to creep through it. A tunnel of snow is built up to the door to keep out the wind. A curtain of skins hangs over the doorway between the tunnel and the house. The big, furry dogs, which pull the Eskimo sled help them in hunting, are sheltered in the tunnel. The Eskimo has no furniture in his house. A bank of snow covered with furs serves as a couch and bed. In the middle of the house stands a cooking lamp, which burns oil made of melting the fat of animals. It has a wick made of dried moss. Over the lamp hangs a stone pot. In this pot, the Eskimo melts snow and stews the fish of the animals which he catches. Sometimes he manages to get an iron kettle from some of the white men who come to his land to catch whales. Most of the Eskimos live on islands. These are separated from one another and from the mainland by wide straits. 
In the sea around the shores live seals, walruses, whales, and fish of many kinds. Of these, seals are the most useful. They provide the Eskimo with warm fur for clothing, with fat to burn his lamp, and with meat to eat. The Eskimo makes his own weapons and tools. His spear is made of bone, sharpened and barbed at the tip. A long thong of hide is tied to it so that he can throw it into the water at seals and fish and pull it back again. The framework and runners of his sled are <clears throat> made of bone. The harness for his dog team is made up of strips of hide. He makes a serviceable boat by stretching sewn seal skins over a framework of bone. He finds that small sharp splinters of bone make good needles and that tough sinews make excellent thread. Like this, like us, the Eskimos are fond of games. They run races and play football. They skate with bone runners fastened to the soles of their skin shoes. During the long winter nights, they play many indoor games with bones and leather strings. Often the men carve pictures of sleds or bears or dogs on pieces of flat bone. Most Eskimo boys do not go to school. They know nothing of the world except their own bleak land. They do not know what farms are, or factories, or railways, or stores. They have only one ambition. They want to become great hunters. They spend much of their time with their fathers, learning to hunt and to fish or to make weapons. The US Eskimos are able to live without many of the things which we use. Most of them have no wood, no coal, no iron, no gardens, no farms. Yet they're able to get food, cook it, build houses, make clothing, tools, and even play things. They cannot have the comforts which we enjoy because their land does not produce so many of the things which help us to live comfortably. They cannot get these things from us because they live so far away. There are no railways in their land because of the ice. Ships cannot reach it easily. Therefore, these Eskimos have almost no trade with other people. Of course, those Eskimos who come in daily contact with the fur traders and the mounted police live as much as white people do. They live in heated houses, wear clothes, and eat food very like our own, and enjoy many modern comforts and conveniences. These Eskimos depend on their living chiefly upon the whaling and fishing industry. Men of the Northern Forest before the white man came to America, the Indians hunted over the whole continent. They did not know how to work iron, so they tipped their spears and arrows with chipped stone. They also made hatchets called tomahawks out of stone. They dressed in clothing made from skins of animals and lived in wigwams to, or hide or bar, of hide or bark. As white settlers kept coming out of the greater and greater numbers from Europe to America, they gradually spread over the sections of the country which were good for farming. Large tracts of ground, called reservations, were set aside for the Indians. There were several such reservations in most of the provinces in Canada. They are Indians, they are Indians farm as we do, dress in a similar way, and live in much the same fashion. Lying to the north, between us and the cold Arctic regions, is a broad stretch of country which the Indians still live in and hunt as much as they used to do. Nowadays, of course, they use rifles and cartridges instead of bows and arrows. They have good steel knives and axes instead of stone tomahawks. The hunting grounds of the Indians are covered by the northern forest, which stretches across the whole continent from Alaska to Labrador. Part of this great forest of spruce and fir lies in the northern part of our own province. The ground is for the most part rough and rocky, with many swamps in the low parts. There are innumerable lakes and countless streams and rivers in this part of Canada. The winters are long and cold. The snow lies deep on the ground for six or seven months of the year. The winter days are shorter and the summer days are longer in southern Canada. The short summers are quite hot, so that several varieties of wild berries grow in profusion in the woods. Along the edge of the forest there are many trading posts. Usually they are built beside large rivers. 
A great many of them belong to the Hudson Bay's Company, which was formed in England over 250 years ago. There is a store at each post where the Indians can buy flour, bacon, beans, canned fruit, blankets, tobacco, knives, axes, rifles, ammunition, and many other things which they need. They give the storekeeper furs in payment. Some of these furs are sent down into southern Canada where they are made into caps, coats, muffs, gloves, and capes. Many are shipped away to other countries. Good furs are, as you know, very valuable. By the beginning of June, the rivers in these regions are all free of ice. Then the Indians come paddling down to the posts. The summer is their holiday time. They camp close to the trading post and trade their furs for the goods which they need for the coming winter. By the end of August, the trader's store is filled with bundles of furs and his stock of goods is almost exhausted. Then the Indians start back to their hunting grounds. The rivers <clears throat> are their easiest paths into the wilderness. In some places, the rivers are broken by rapids or falls, and then the Indians have to carry their canoes and their goods along the bank until they reach calm water again. Sometimes they paddle so far a river that it becomes too small to float their canoes. Then they have to carry these and all their belongings over land until they reach another stream flowing in the direction in which they wish to go. This is called portaging. The high ground between two rivers flowing in the opposite directions is called a divide. The Indians know well all the divides in their hunting grounds. The Indians live out in the forest all winter, often hundreds of miles away from the nearest trading post. The families live in tents by themselves. The nearest neighbors are probably 20 or 30 miles away. There is no lack of fuel, for the forest provides plenty of firewood. They can build as big a fire as the uke in, the camps, in their camp stove and keep their tent warm and comfortable. As soon as there is heavy snowfall, the hunting begins. The trapper sets out from his tent and walks in a wide circle around it. At every place where he sees the tracks of animals he wants to catch, he sets a trap baited with meat. A trapping line is usually about 20 miles long. Every day or two, he makes his round of his traps on his snowshoes. Often he catches a muskrat, sometimes a fox, or a mink, or an otter, or a beaver. Occasionally he gets a shot at a lynx or a wolf. He is very glad to shoot a caribou or a moose, for the flesh of these animals is very palatable, and their hides make excellent moccasins. The bears sleep in dens all winter, so the trapper does not see any of them until springtime. Of course, there are no paths or roads in the forest, yet the Indians seldom lose their way. They keep their directions by the sun. If the sun is hidden, the moss, which grows chiefly on the north side of the trees, helps them find their way. At night, they look for the north star, which is the brightest star and is quite easy to find. The two stars, which form the side of the Big Dipper, farthest from the handle, always point toward the north star. When the ice breaks up in the spring, the Indians make ready to go to the trading post. They put their tents and traps and all their belongings into their canoes. A big bundle of soft furs, the winter's catch, is placed in the middle of each canoe. Then they begin the long journey to the store. It may take them two or three weeks or even longer to reach it. If they had to walk all the way and carry everything, they would need the whole summer to make the trip. Canoeing is ever so much faster and easier. The life of the Indians is not easy. They often suffer from the long winter in the forest. Sometimes some of them get lost in blizzards and freeze to death. When the Indians are hurt or sick, there's no one up there to help them. At the best, tramping many miles every day on snowshoes or paddling heavily laden canoes up swift rivers is tiring work. Yet they have plenty of warm furs and blankets to wear. They have some other kinds of food in addition to the meat from the animals which they kill. The rifles and steel knives are much better for hunting than stone-tipped steers or arrows used for, for, in former times. They are fairly well off because the land provides them with food, clothing, and fuel, and because they can trade their furs for tools and weapons from southern Canada. The Fishermen of Nova Scotia 
You remember that we began our trip across Canada from Nova Scotia, the province which is farthest to the east and closest to the Atlantic. The sea around the coast of Nova Scotia teems with fish, and many of the people who live there make their living by fishing. The shores of Nova Scotia are much broken by inlets of the sea, which make excellent harbors. Some of these are tiny ports, just large enough for shelter a few fishing boats. Others are so large that they provide safe anchorage for many large ships. The whole coast is dotted with fishing villages built on the shores of, in, of the inlets. The houses of the fishermen are comfortable dwellings. Each house has a garden, in which the fishermen in their spare time grow potatoes, carrots, cabbages, and other vegetables. The boats of the fishermen range in size from small rowboats and motorboats to large sailboats called schooners. The small boats are used for fishing close to the shore. The big schooners, however, make long trips far out to sea, staying away from the port for months at a time and returning only when they have secured a full cargo of fish, or when the fishing season is over. That part of the Atlantic which lies east of Nova Scotia is comparatively shallow. The deep sea fish come into shallow water to spawn. They can find plenty of food there. These are two reasons for the immense number of fish which are found in these shallow waters. The shoals which border the coast of Nova Scotia are called banks. The banks are separated by channels or gullies, in which the water is quite deep. East of the banks of Nova Scotia is another great bank, which measures roughly 300 miles across. It is southeast of the island of Newfoundland, and is called the Great Bank of Newfoundland, or more familiarly, the Banks. These banks are the finest fishing grounds in the world. Fishermen come there, not only from Nova Scotia, but also from Quebec, Newfoundland, the United States, and from France, to share in the harvest of the sea. They catch many varieties of fish, such as herring, halibut, haddock, and cod. Most of the big fish schooners of Nova Scotia are engaged in cod fishing. Each schooner carries a crew of 16 to 25 men, and two of these, two or three boys as helpers. When the cod fishing season opens in March, the schooner sets sail for the fishing grounds. In the hold are stored barrels of bait, usually small fish called kaplan, and barrels of salt to cure the fish. On deck there are 6 to 12 small boats called dories. When the fishing grounds are reached, the dories are swung overboard. Two men, one to row and one to attend to the fishing lines, form the crew for each dory. The dories are stationed at intervals along the course 4 or 5 miles long. The fish are caught either by hand lines or by long lines. The hand line is simply a long, stout cord armed with several hooks and weighed so that it will sink to the bottom. The long line is a thin but strong rope, 700 to 800 yards long, a yards long. An anchor and a flag buoy are attached to each end of it. Short fines are tied to the intervals of three feet or so, and hooks are attached to these. When the long fine is put in, when the long line is put into the water, it sinks to the bottom and uses stretched out straight between the two anchors which hold it in place. The flag buoys mark its position. Sometimes the long line remains down half a day, sometimes only an hour or so, the time depending on how well the fish are biting. When the fishermen are ready to pull up the line in, one man rows the, the dory slowly along, while the other hauls up the line. This is back-breaking work. The line is heavy and stiff, and the fish are not light, for a cod of good size weighs from 15 to 20 pounds. The fisherman is cramped, too, for the dory is so small that he cannot relieve his tired muscles by changing his position. Even in the evening, the dories return to the schooner with the day's catch. The fish are put on board, the dories are hoisted, and then the crew have their supper. The men have been up busy since 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, but the day's work is not yet over. The fish have to be cleaned, salted, and stored away in the hold before men can go to sleep. The better the fishing is, the harder the fishermen must work. The life of the fishermen is dangerous and hard. The banks are often swept by storms, 
which take their toll on the fishing fleet. The fishing grounds are on the right path of the ocean steamers, and many a fishing boat is run down or sunk by them. The weather on the bank is often foggy, and this increases the danger of collision. When the cod fishing season ends in October, the schooners make for their home ports. If the season has been good, their holds are crammed with thousands of codfish. Their cargoes are worth a great deal of money, and they are easily sold, for the fish are always in demand. With the money received for the fish, the fisherman can buy almost anything he wants. He can have a lumber or brick to build a comfortable house, plenty of clothing to keep him warm and dry, and food of every kind. He can have good furniture and pretty pictures in his home. He can buy coal to warm it during the winter. He can have books to read, a piano, a phonograph, or a radio to give him music, or in fact, anything he likes. The railways or boats which take away his fish bring back all these for him. His life is much pleasanter than that of the Eskimo or the Indian in the far north. He has a much better home, better food, better clothing, and many luxuries which they do not know at all. It is much easier for him to sell and buy than it is for them. You have seen how the Eskimos, the Indians, and the fishermen of Nova Scotia get their living. They all live by hunting or fishing. They all live in Canada. And yet, what different lives they lead! Now give the reasons for this great difference. End of section 2. Section 3 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Ontario Public School Geography by the Ontario Department of Education, Section 3. Men who live by lumbering and mining. The Lumberman. Trees provide the Indian with fuel for heat and for cooking. We are not so dependent upon trees for fuel. We value them chiefly because they provide us with good material for making useful things. All trees do not yield the same quality of timber. Pine is much softer and more easily worked than oak, but it withstands the weather much better. Hemlock is much more open-grained than pine, and so splinters more easily. Yet all have certain uses to which they are especially well suited. Tough hickory and ash make excellent hammer and axe handles. Oak, so hard and with so beautiful a grain, is one of the woods most used in furniture making. Pine, hemlock, and spruce are used a great deal in building. The wood of certain trees, such as spruce and poplar, is ground up into pulp to make paper. Much of Canada is covered with large forests of these useful trees. Many men are employed in the Canadian woods, felling trees, cutting them into logs, and transporting them to sawmills, where they are sawn into lumber. Toward the end of August, the advance parties of the lumbermen make their way into the woods. Each party goes to the section in which it is to work. The men build a camp, bring in the winter's supply of wood, and make rough roads through the forest to the river. As soon as these preliminary tasks are finished, more men come to the camp, and the work of felling the trees begins. One man goes through the forest and blazes the trees which are to be felled, that is, he cuts off some of the bark. The axemen follow. They chop a deep niche into the trunk upon the side toward which they wish the tree to fall. Then come the sawyers. Their keen, two-handled saw bites deep into the tree with every stroke. At last, only a few fibers hold the tree upright. As it begins to sway, these fibers are torn loose, and the tree crashes to the ground. The limbs are trimmed off and piled in brush heaps. The trunk is sawn into proper lengths, and the logs are ready to be moved from the woods. As soon as there is a keen, steady frost, the roads are prepared for moving the logs. The snow makes a good roadbed, and if it is lacking, the men sprinkle water over the roads until their surface is a smooth, solid sheet of ice. 
The teams haul great loads of logs over the smooth ice. The big sleighs upon which the logs are loaded are called bunks. The logs are hauled out upon the frozen river and piled upon the ice. Sometimes the river is too narrow to hold all the timber. Then the banks, too, are piled high with logs. Each log is stamped with the mark of the company to which it belongs. When the ice breaks up in the spring, the current sweeps the logs downstream. The rivermen are careful that none are caught on snags or stones. In this way, the logs are brought from the forest to the mill much more cheaply than if they had to be hauled by rail. At last the logs reach their destination, which is usually some town where there are sawmills built beside the river. A boom made of heavy logs chained together end to end is stretched across the river. The logs gather behind this. They are then sorted according to their marks and taken to the mills of the company to which they belong. Big saws there rip them into lumber. In British Columbia, lumbering is carried on somewhat differently. The country is very mountainous, and the trees are very large. The logs, when cut, often weigh from 10 to 15 tons each. Frequently, they are loaded on flat cars by means of machinery and taken direct to the mill or to the seacoast where they are formed into huge rafts. Ontario is but one of the many places in the world where lumbering is carried on. In Quebec... New Brunswick, and British Columbia, it is a very important industry. Great quantities of timber are cut yearly in the United States, in Norway, and in Sweden. The most useful kinds of timber grow in the northern forests. The trees of the great tropical forests, such as are found in Africa and Central and South America, provide some useful timber, particularly for the purposes for which an extremely hard wood is required. Teak and mahogany are the two most valuable of the tropical trees. The Miners Of all the metals that man uses, such as iron, nickel, gold, and many others, iron is the most useful. We see so much of both wood and iron that we are apt to overlook their great value just because they are so common. The Eskimo, who cannot find either in his country, looks upon them as the greatest treasures which he can possess. Iron is usually found combined with other substances. The process of obtaining pure iron from the ore in which it is contained is called smelting. For this, great heat is required. Civilized man requires a very great quantity of iron. He uses it for making machinery of all kinds, for building great factories, for rails, for bridges, for tools, for nails and screws, and for hundreds of other purposes. Indeed, if the supply of iron were suddenly cut off from the world, our mode of living would soon become entirely different. Mention some of the changes that would take place. Fortunately for us, the world's supply of iron is very great. Africa contains billions of tons of it. There are enormous deposits in England, France, Sweden, and Central Europe. It is found in many parts of North America. The submarine beds of iron ore in Newfoundland are among the largest in the world. On our own continent, one of the most important deposits of iron lies just south and west of Lake Superior. The ground slopes up from the lake and forms five little ranges of mountains. These are so rich in iron ore that it is scarcely an exaggeration to say that they are mountains of iron. This district is dotted with mines in which thousands of men are employed. Iron ore is also mined in the district north of Lake Superior. The entrance to the mine is usually a long, sloping tunnel driven into the hillside. Far within, the miners are working. They use large steel drills driven by compressed air, to bore deep holes in the brown, rocky ore. Then sticks of dynamite are placed in the holes and exploded. Each blast loosens tons of ore and breaks it up into pieces, large and small. The miners load the broken ore into little steel cars run by electricity. The cars are hauled to the lake shore over the special lines of track built for them. Often the whole distance from the mine to the lake is downhill, and the cars run down without using any power at all.
the tracks are extended far out over the water on great steel trestles big pockets or bins are built under the trestles into these bins the cars empty their loads of ore the trestles and bins are so high over the water that the ore steamers can sail right underneath them when a ship is to be loaded it is brought beneath one of the bins a trap door in the bottom of the bin is opened and the ore drops into a chute which carries it into the vessel's hold a big freighter can be loaded in this way very quickly hundreds of thousands of tons of ore are shipped down the great lakes in large ore steamers to hamilton buffalo and other cities of canada and the united states coal is another mineral of which civilized men need and use a great deal it is used for fuel to heat our homes it provides us with steam power by which much of our machinery is driven iron ore would be almost useless to us unless we had coal with which to smelt it on our own continent hundreds of thousands of men are engaged in mining and distributing coal in canada we mine practically no hard or anthracite coal nearly all our coal being soft or bituminous our own country is now one of the great gold producing countries of the world one of our largest mines has yielded gold to the value of one hundred sixty million dollars since the first shaft was sunk mining on a large scale is very costly the machinery is expensive mineral land is very valuable therefore mines are seldom owned by an individual usually many men form a company and contribute money to buy land and machinery since a company can afford to purchase plenty of machinery and equipment the miners can get out a great deal more ore or coal than if they were working with no tools but pick and shovel end of chapter three Section 4 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Swart. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 4 Introductory How Man Obtains Food from the Soil. Farming with Machinery. Many men, as we have seen, make their living by hunting, or fishing, or lumbering, or mining. They are few, however, when compared to the number of people who live by farming. At least three out of every five persons all over the world grow plants for food. In America, and in the greater part of Europe, a great deal of machinery is used in farm operations. Plows and harrows prepare the ground. The seed drill sows the seed evenly and without waste. The binder cuts the ripe grain and binds it into sheaves. The separator threshes out the grain from the head of the stalk, blows away the chaff, and sifts the small weed seeds from the good grain. American and European farmers grow more grain than their own families can use. The surplus is sold to the millers, who make flour out of the wheat and the rye, and meal comes out of the oats and the barley. A good deal of grain must be fed to animals on the farm. Many other crops are grown in addition to grain. Hay... Indian corn and turnips make good fodder for the cattle. Vegetables are always in demand in the big cities and are grown in large quantities. One farmer can use a great deal of ground if he has machinery with which to work. Could he till so much if he had no horses, no plows, no seed drill, no binder, and no threshing machine? Our grandfathers had none of these except the horses and the plows. They scattered the grain by hand. They cut it with cradles and bound it into sheaves with wisps of straw. They threshed the grain by beating it with big jointed sticks called flails. In those days, it took 20 men to grow as much grain as one man can grow nowadays. Even yet, there are many places in the world where men have little or no machinery to help them in their farming. The tools used by these farmers are generally of the rudest kind. Their use entails a great deal of toil for comparatively small crops. In some cases, these farmers have no animals to help with the work, and so all the farm work must be done slowly and laboriously by hand. There are many countries where there are so many people that each farmer can have only a little patch of ground. Can these farmers raise much more food than they need for themselves? Most of the white peoples of the world farm much in the same way as we do, although many of them have not so much land or so many machines. 
There is so little land in proportion to the population of the countries inhabited by the yellow races of Asia that each farmer can have but a small farm, and he has very little machinery. The black peoples of Africa have plenty of land, but no machinery with which to work it. The brown people of the islands in the South Seas do not need to farm their lands, for they find plenty of food growing wild in their islands. The Japanese Rice Grower The Japanese live far to the west of Canada. To reach their land, we should have to travel by train for some days to the western border of Canada and then sail in a big steamer for 10 or 12 days more. During our voyage, we should cross the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean in the world. The Japanese are not white skinned as we are, but yellowish brown. As a rule, they are shorter than white men, but they are strong and active. They are kind and hospitable and very clever in many ways. Nearly nine times as many people live in the islands of Japan as in Canada, yet the whole Japanese Empire is only a little over half the size of the province of Ontario. How large do you think Japanese farms are? The farmers in the southern part of Japan do not grow wheat or oats or barley as we do. Their country is much warmer than ours. The winds which blow over it from the ocean bring heavy rains. It is too hot and wet for our grains to grow well there. Perhaps some of you have seen wild rice growing in a swamp. Rice grows best in wet ground and needs hot weather to ripen it. Rice is the main grain crop of Japan. Japan is very hilly. The hillsides are covered with tiny level plots of ground, forming terraces. The plots are separated by small embankments of earth. Other fields, not much larger than our gardens, cover the plains at the foot of the hills. These small fields on hill and plain are the farms of Japan. The farmer and his wife and his children all work in the fields. They break up and level the dry ground with heavy hoes, for they have no plows or harrows. One field is set aside as a nursery for the rice. It is flooded with water after the grains of rice are sown in it. Soon the seeds sprout, and the nursery bed is filled with young rice plants. Then the other fields are flooded. Each worker pulls up an armful of rice plants from the nursery bed and starts to set them out in the other fields. He wades through the muddy water, stooping at every step to thrust the seedlings into the rich soil. It is very slow, tiresome work. Can you imagine planting a big wheat field in this way? After the plants are set out, the farmer has to keep the fields moist. Sometimes he has to carry buckets of water up the steep hillside. The water runs down from terrace to terrace over the whole hill. Some of it will even reach the fields on the plain. Sometimes water wheels are used. These are big wooden wheels hung over a well or reservoir. Several jars are tied at intervals around the wheel. As the wheel turns, the jars dip into the water, come up full, and then empty into a trough, which carries the water into a canal. From this canal, the water flows into channels cut between the fields. In this way, water can be turned into the fields which need it by simply cutting a hole in the embankment between the fields and the channel. Watering fields in this way is called irrigation. When at last the rice turns bright yellow, it is almost ready to cut. The rice fields look much like fields of barley. The grain stands nearly as thick and as high. The whole family work at the harvest, cutting the grain with small, sharp knives. They each cut an armful of rice, tie it in a sheaf, and lay it on the ground. They work on in this way until the whole crop is cut. Then the sheaves are carried home and stored in a granary. The husk of the rice grain is not loose like the chaff of wheat or oats. It sticks tightly to the grain. The farmer has to pound it off. Sometimes this is done in a hollow mortar of wood or of stone. Sometimes the grain is flailed and sometimes trodden by oxen. After the husks are loosened from the grain, the mixture of husk and grain is tossed into the air. The wind blows the light husks away while the heavy grain falls to the ground. Think of the labor required to grow even a little rice in this way. It would be a costly food if the Japanese farmer had to pay high wages for farm labor. He is not obligated to hire anyone, however, for he himself and his family do all the work. The farms are so small that the farmer cannot grow much more rice than his own family needs. The little he can sell does not bring him much money, but his wants are few. He eats little but rice, with some fish occasionally. He and his children are half naked, and his wife usually wears only a plain blue cotton dress. He makes his own shoes and hats out of rice straw. His house is just a tiny hut built of bamboo poles and thatched with grass or reeds. You see, the Japanese farmer has to work very hard indeed for a bare living. You know now the reasons for this. 
the African Negro. Far to the southeast of our country, across the Atlantic Ocean, is the homeland of the Negroes. It is a very hot country. The sun is almost directly overhead all year round. There is never any snow or ice there. Instead of seasons like ours, in some parts of their country, they have a dry season when it rains little, and a wet season when it rains a great deal. In other parts, there are two wet and two dry seasons in the year. In the land of the Eskimos, the winter is one long night. In southern Canada, the days are much shorter in winter than they are in summer. In the land of the Negroes, the days and nights are almost of equal length throughout the whole year. Plants need heat and moisture to grow well. In our own province, they grow fastest in the warm, sunny month of June. In that month, we have frequent showers, and the earth is kept moist and warm. It is in June that the wheat and other grains shoot up so fast that you can almost see them growing. It is then that the trees add most to the length of their branches. In the country of the Negroes, there is plenty of rain, and the sunny days are long and hot. Therefore, all the plants there grow very large. In the drier parts of the country, where there is only one wet season in the year, the land is covered with grass. During the rainy season, the grass grows to a height of 6, 10, or even 12 feet. After the rains are over, the hot sun soon dries the ground and withers the grass. In these parts of the country, roam large herds of antelopes and other grass-eating animals. In the regions where rains are more frequent, trees grow instead of grass. Many of the trees are enormous, towering up to two or three hundred feet into the air. Their big branches spread out high up from the ground. Their foliage is so thick that little light or sunshine can get through. Much of the land of the Negroes is covered with huge forests of these great trees. These forests are dark, silent, gloomy places. Big, rope-like creepers stretch from tree to tree and make the forest almost impassable. Here and there are narrow paths winding among the trees. These are the roads of the Negroes. In the forest live many strange animals. There are huge apes and monkeys, stronger than the strongest men. The biggest of them are called the gorilla and the chimpanzee. Herds of elephants roam through the forest. Great snakes, called pythons, lurk in it. These pythons sometimes grow to a length of 20 or 30 feet and are as thick as your waist. They are very strong. When they catch an animal, they twine around it and crush it to death with their powerful coils. Even more dangerous are some of the smaller snakes, which infest the forest. Many of these are so venomous that their bite means certain death. So much water falls during the rainy season that the ground cannot soak it all in. For this reason, there are many rivers running through the forest, and the low ground is all swamp and marsh. Hippopotami and crocodiles live in the rivers and the marshes. The hippopotamus is a large, ungainly animal with a huge head and a wide mouth. It lives on the grass and weeds, which grow near the water. The crocodile is much more dangerous. Imagine a huge lizard, 20 feet long and covered with a horny, scaly skin. Its terrible mouth is armed with sharp, cruel teeth. It lies motionless in the water until some animal comes to drink. One stroke of its powerful tail, one snap of its great jaws, and down it sinks with its prey to the bottom of the river. Many Negroes are caught by crocodiles. When a river has to be forded, the Negroes try to frighten the crocodiles away by shouting and splashing as they cross. The Negroes have black skins. Their noses are flat and their lips thick. Their hair is woolly instead of being straight or curly like ours. Many of them are tall and well-built. They go about almost naked, as they do not need much clothing in their hot land. The Negroes live in the more open parts of the forest. They build their houses of wooden poles and cover them with straw or with big leaves. They do not need warm houses. They cook outside, over a fire built in the center of the village. Around the village, they build a wall of mud or a palisade of tree trunks to keep out the wild animals. The wall also helps them to defend their homes against their enemies of the neighboring villages, with whom they are often at war. Around the village is a clearing in which the Negroes grow their food. They have fields of sweet potatoes. They grow Indian corn also, and the cobs, called mealies in Africa, supply many a good meal for them. Then there is minoy, a plant which has thick root stalks, much like those of the sweet potato. You have not tasted minoic, but doubtless you have eaten tapioca pudding. Tapioca is made from minoic. The Negroes, however, merely mash the minoic roots, make a stiff dough, and cook it in lumps like dumplings. The most useful plant of all is the banana or plantain. The green fruit is roasted and eaten as a vegetable. 
and the ripe fruit serves as dessert. The leaves of this plant are so large that the Negroes use them to thatch their huts. The fiber of the leaves makes good string, and from it the Negroes weave mats and cloth. These crops are planted and cultivated by hand. Among the Negroes, the women alone do the work. They break up the ground with heavy iron hoes, keep the crops weeded, and gather them when mature. The men do not work in the fields. Occasionally they hunt in the forest or fight with hostile tribes. Iron is plentiful in their country. Long ago they learned how to smelt it with charcoal and to hammer it into useful tools. Almost every village has at least one blacksmith who makes their rough hoes and heavy spear blades. The Negro uses his spear not only as a weapon, but also as a knife or an axe. The Negroes have many useful plants and trees growing wild. There is the oil palm, which is a tall, slender tree with long, graceful leaves springing from the top of the trunk. Each oil palm bears a cluster of nuts filled with oil, which the Negroes press out. They use palm oil for cooking, for lighting, and for greasing their bodies. Another useful tree is the boabab. It bears a big gourd filled with seeds, which the natives pound into meal and use as food. The empty gourds are used for holding water, salt, meal, and such things. The Negroes live in a land of plenty. Food can be had for the gathering of it. Although there are many Negroes, there is plenty of land for all of them, much more, in fact, than they can use. In their hot, rainy country, the crops seldom fail. Life for them is very easy compared to the life of the Japanese rice grower. People seldom work harder than they must. In the hot, wet parts of the world, men do not work hard because the earth is so generous. The Negro can grow all the food he needs with no tool but a hoe. But in our land of cold winters and short summers, that can scarcely be done. We should soon be hungry if we tried it. The Negro is warm enough without any clothing. We should freeze to death unless we had plenty of clothes. The Negro can live in a shelter of straw or leaves. We must have warm, solidly built houses. The white peoples, who live mostly in the colder countries, have had to think and to work hard to find better ways to get food, clothing, and shelter. Therefore, they have learned how to build machines, erect great buildings, make wonderful cloth out of wool and cotton, and to do many, many other things which the Negro does not know about at all. People who, like the white races, have learned much, are called civilized to distinguish them from uncivilized or barbarous people, like the African Negroes. Everybody in the world must get food, clothing, shelter, fuel, and tools in order to live. The way in which this is done is not the same in all parts of the world. It depends upon the plants which grow in any particular country, upon the animals which make their home there, and upon what useful things can be found there in the ground. It depends too upon opportunities for trade with other people. End of section four. Section five of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section five. Introductory raw materials manufacture, transportation, and trade. The hunter, the fisherman, the grain grower, the lumberman, and the miner all help to provide the materials needed for clothing, food, fuel, shelter, or tools. But furs cannot be used just as the Indian sells them to the fur trader. They must be cut and sewn together to make garments. Wheat is not ready for use when it leaves the farm. It must be first ground into flour. Carpenters take the rough lumber from the lumberman and fashion it into doors and window frames or other useful things. The iron ore, which the miner digs out of the earth, must pass through many hands and undergo many changes before it appears as a finished rail or beam or machine. The earth yields us very few things indeed which are ready to use just as we find them. Materials which must be worked into a different form before we use them are called raw materials. The process of changing them into the form in which we use them is called manufacturing. Before the days of machinery this meant making by hand. Very often the raw material is found far from the places in which it is manufactured. 
the indian has to transport his furs by canoe to the trading post the trader has to send them on by boat and rail to the fur markets of the world much of the ore from the lake superior mines has to be shipped down the great lakes to the cities where coal is easily obtained the wheat has to be brought from the farm to the mill in the same way the manufactured article has to be shipped from the mill or factory to the place where it is to be used for this reason many men are busily engaged in transporting goods from one part of the country to another thousands of men work on our railways thousands are needed on the ships which traverse our lakes and rivers thousands more are busy with trucks and wagons carting goods to and from docks and freight sheds lakes and rivers railways and roads are all highways of trade railways and good roads cost a great deal to build and keep in repair lakes and rivers are provided for us by nature a lake or a river boat can carry as much as scores of trucks or freight cars therefore it is cheaper to ship goods by boat than by rail especially if the goods like coal or grain are bulky countries which lack broad deep rivers and large lakes are at a considerable disadvantage for railways and roads can never entirely compensate for the lack of good waterways waterways are so desirable that many places artificial waterways called canals have been constructed canals are built to join lakes or rivers to avoid falls and rapids or even to provide a short and convenient route from sea to sea or from ocean to ocean long ago when good roads were few and no railways had yet been built men liked to live near rivers so they could easily send away their products and receive others in exchange even today when railways and good roads are numerous the towns and cities upon the banks of navigable rivers and lakes are better situated for trade than those far from the water when we study the various countries of the world we shall find that most of the great cities stand upon the banks of large rivers lakes or oceans canada is particularly favored with splendid waterways there are countless rivers in our country which are of value as highways of trade most important of all is the waterway formed by the great lakes which stretch for hundreds of miles along the boundary between ontario and the united states and by the st lawrence river which flows from lake ontario to the sea many large cities such as montreal toronto and hamilton are situated on the shores of this great highway of commerce large steamers ply over it carrying passengers and goods from city to city the transportation facilities afforded by the great lakes and the st lawrence river are of an estimable value to canada so far we have considered only internal trade that is trade between people living in the same country but external trade that is trade with people living in foreign countries is equally important different parts of the world produce different things we cannot grow rice or tea in canada the japanese and chinese do not grow much wheat and have very little timber therefore the big steamers which ply over the pacific ocean carry across to asia the wheat and the timber which we have in such great quantities and bring back tea rice silk and many other things which we need but cannot grow all over the world there is a ceaseless movement of food raw materials and manufacturing goods from places which produce in excess of their requirements to other places which need the surplus from city to farm and from farm to city from province to province from country to country from continent to continent every day huge quantities of goods are moved from place to place the world can supply all its wants by this constant exchange of products the more a country produces the more it can have from other lands in exchange for its surplus the goods which are brought into a country from abroad are called imports the goods which a country sends out to other countries are called exports imports and exports together make up the foreign trade of a country all countries to a certain extent depend upon their foreign trade to supply their wants you know now why it is of immense importance to a country to have an abundant and varied production of raw materials good manufacturing facilities and easy and cheap transportation how has the lack of these things affected the life of the eskimo end of section five Section 6 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ontario Public School Geography by the Ontario Department of Education. Section 6 Landforms. 
the soil solid rock underlies the surface soil of the land just as it underlies the water of the ocean no matter where you live if you dig deep enough you will come at last to solid rock the fine soil which covers the rock in most places in the world really consists of fine particles of stone with a considerable amount of decayed vegetation and animal matter mingled with it if you examine a handful of sand with a magnifying glass you can readily see that sand consists of small bits of stone if you rub a handful of soil between your hands you can feel an unpleasant gritty sensation due to the fine particles of stone of which the soil is largely composed rock or stone like wood decays when exposed to the weather this process is called weathering the sunshine the air the rain and the frost all play some part in softening and rotting the rock at the foot of any cliff you may see pieces of rock of varying sizes which have fallen from the cliff on account of the weathering of its surface these pieces of stone are being transformed slowly but surely into soil there are many kinds of rock and each kind contains substances which are peculiar to it therefore there are many kinds of soil due to the weathering of the different kinds of rock sandstone and granite for instance yield a poor sandy soil slate and shale when weathered become clay soil is necessary for plant life all soils contain more or less of the materials needed by plants soils which contain much plant food we call fertile those which contain little are sterile the fertility or sterility of the soil is of great importance to man for only on fertile ground can good crops be grown the best soils are a mixture of the decayed material from many kinds of rock the depth of the soil is also important if only a thin layer of soil covers the rock beneath the ground dries out quickly in time of drought and plants wither and die a deep fertile soil is best for farming plains hills and valleys the soil and rock which form the surface of the land are not smooth and level the ground is usually uneven and rolling if the slopes of the ground are very slight and gentle they form a plain steep short slopes form hills the trough which is formed by the converging lower sides of two slopes we call a valley the hills which you see about your home have been carved out of the land by running water you have doubtless seen little muddy rivulets on the slopes of the land after a heavy rainstorm each rivulet carries away with it a certain amount of soil there are many rainstorms in a year and each alters to some extent the face of the ground by washing soil away during many hundreds of years the water has washed away an enormous amount of soil and rock in this way deep valleys have been formed with high hills on both sides some rocks are softer than others and so decay much more rapidly naturally the rocks which break up first are the first to be carried away by the water for this reason high ground is left where the rocks are hardest the rains are continually washing soil from the high ground to lower levels where then must the soil be deepest on the hilltops or in the valleys where in general are the best farms found mountains mountains with few exceptions have not been carved out by running water the great mountains of the world have been caused by the wrinkling or folding of the rock surface in ages long past we know little of the forces which caused this but their evidences are plain mountains are great masses of rock lifted high above the level of the surrounding country the peaks of high mountains tower so high into the air that their tops are covered with snow the upper levels of the air are so cold that snow not rain falls upon the mountain peaks snow sometimes accumulates in the mountain valleys the mass of packed snow is very heavy and therefore it creeps slowly along the valley moving steadily downward because of its own weight such a moving mass of snow or ice is called a glacier 
the tip of the glacier of course melts as soon as it reaches the warmer air of the lower levels the water from melting glaciers forms mountain streams plateaus in many places in the world there are large expanses of fairly level ground enclosed by mountains such plains are high above the level of the sea they are called plateaus or tablelands volcanoes in some parts of the world melted rock or lava has broken through the surface of the ground with it come steam and other gases often with such violence that the lava is broken up into fine dust sometimes the lava bursts through a long crack or fissure sometimes through an almost round hole such an opening in the earth's crust we call a volcano often the accumulated lava makes a cone-shaped mass of great height at the top of the peak is usually a round depression called the crater the craters of active volcanoes are partly filled with boiling lava and flaming gases many mountains have been made by volcanoes rivers and their work nearly all the surface of the land is sloping and it is well for us that such is the case if the land were all perfectly level the water would not run off from it and swamps would be found everywhere in regions of heavy rainfall low-lying swamps are of no use to the farmer until they are drained and often ditches have to be dug or drain pipes laid to carry off the water from them farmlands should be well drained rivers are natural drains by which surplus water is carried off from the land and returned to the ocean just as good drainage is important for farms so on a larger scale good drainage is important for countries and continents rivers not only carry off surplus water from the land but they also bring water from places where it is of little use to places where it is badly needed in some parts of the world so little rain falls that plants can grow only where rivers fed by mountain snows bring a constant supply of water you have already seen how useful rivers are as highways of transportation it is worth noting too that river valleys form natural routes for roads and railways this is always the case in a mountainous or hilly country where the low valleys between peaks are much easier to traverse than the rough and steep mountain sides rivers play a great part also in tearing down and building up the land rapid streams carry along with them bits of stone and in some cases even boulders these are dashed against one another and rolled along the river bed the stones wear one another down into sand or mud they also wear away the bed of the river in this way some mountain rivers have cut deep beds through layers of solid rock every rainstorm washes down a certain amount of soil from the slopes of the land into the rivers this soil will be carried along when the water flows swiftly but as the current becomes slower the particles of soil gradually fall to the bottom of the water this silt as it is called forms very fertile soil for it is a mixture of many kinds of soil brought from widely separated regions by the various streams called tributaries which flow into the river along its course when heavy rainstorms occur or when the snow melts rapidly in the spring so much water may flow into a river that its banks can no longer contain it the water flows over the country on both sides of the river and this moves very slowly as the water recedes after the flood a thin layer of fertile soil is left behind each flood adds a little to the thickness of the soil until the land is gradually raised considerably above the level of the river such a plain is called a flood plain flood plains form some of the most fertile districts in the world some of the sediment is carried right to the mouth of the river as the river enters the sea its current is suddenly checked and so the sediment falls slowly to the bottom if there are no ocean currents to carry it away it accumulates until it reaches the surface gradually a plain is built up at the mouth of the river such a plain is called a delta and is generally very fertile ground End of section 6
Section 7 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 7 Introductory The Earth as a Whole. Shape The Earth is a huge sphere. If we could view it from high up in the sky, it would appear circular, like the sun or the full moon. As we can see only a very small portion of its surface when we are standing on it, it seems flat to us. Yet we know for certain that it is round. Men have travelled right around it. Sometimes the earth comes between the sun and the moon. Then it casts a shadow on the moon, exactly as your body casts a shadow on the ground. The edge of the Earth's shadow is always circular. When a ship puts out to sea, the hull is the first part of it to disappear. The top of the masts or the funnels and the trail of smoke can be seen long after the hull is hidden. Give the reason for this. Size Have you noticed the little rough spots on the skin of an orange? They are very small in comparison with the size of the whole orange. The loftiest mountains on the surface of the earth are much smaller when compared with the whole sphere than are the little rough spots when compared with the size of the orange. Have you ever travelled one hundred miles by train? It takes two or three hours, and you pass through a great deal of country in that time. Can you imagine travelling in a fast train, day and night, without a stop for three weeks? Your train would need at least twenty whole days to complete a journey round the world. If such a journey were possible, the train would cover 25,000 miles during the trip. That is the length of the circumference of the earth, or the distance around it. Surface. The surface of the earth is partly land and partly water. Of course there is land underneath all the water, no matter how deep the water may be. Land underlies the great oceans, which in some places are more than five miles deep just as it underlies the smallest stream or pond. By far the greater part of the globe is covered with water. In fact, only about one quarter of its surface is dry land. The Pacific Ocean alone is considerably larger in area than all the land in the world. The land which forms part of the Earth's surface is not in a single large block. It is divided by the oceans into two great masses. One of these masses is formed by the two continents of North America and South America. These continents are called the New World because they became known to our forefathers only a few hundred years ago. The other contains the three continents of Europe, Asia and Africa. They are often called the Old World. Since Europe and Asia, as you will see from your school globe, form really a continuous land mass, these two continents are often considered as one, under the name Eurasia. Besides these two huge masses of land, there is the comparatively small continent of Australia, lying far to the southeast of Asia. It is entirely separated by the ocean from all the other continents. Its existence was unknown to Europeans until 1606, 114 years after the discovery of America. These continents, however, do not contain all the land in the world, even if we include in them the islands that lie close to their shores. There is another great mass of land far to the south. It is called the Antarctic continent. We know very little about it, for it is covered deep with ice and snow. On that account it is as yet quite useless to man. Then, too, there are in the oceans thousands of islands which are so far from any of the continents that they cannot be considered part of them. They range in size from tiny islets, too small to be shown upon a map, to large islands like New Zealand. Their combined area, however, is much less than that of Australia, the smallest of the continents. The oceans are not entirely separated from one another. They are all connected, so that it is possible for a ship to reach any seaport in the world by passing, if necessary, from ocean to ocean. Find the Arctic Ocean on the globe. Its shores are formed by the northern coasts of Asia, Europe, and North America. Between Asia and North America is a narrow strait called Bering Strait, which connects the Arctic and Pacific Oceans. 
the much wider gap between europe and north america connects the arctic ocean with the atlantic ocean this gap is broken by the large island of greenland lying close to the coast of north america and by the smaller island of iceland further to the east the west coast of the american continents forms the eastern shore of the pacific ocean the east coasts of asia and australia are its western limits the southern pacific is studded with thousands of beautiful islands the atlantic ocean extends southward from the arctic ocean between the east coasts of the american continents and the west coasts of europe and africa it is much smaller than the great pacific since however it lies between the continents of north america and europe in which live the most highly civilized nations of the world the volume of traffic across it is enormous the indian ocean lies in the basin formed by africa on the west asia on the north and australia on the east south of africa australia and south america there is no dividing line between the oceans a ship can sail right around the world to the south of these continents without meeting land at all the most southerly parts of the pacific atlantic and indian oceans form the antarctic ocean it surrounds the unknown antarctic continent no one knows how much of this area is land and how much is water the thick ice covers all the land and extends over part of the water its edge forms a steep cliff of ice sometimes hundreds of feet high it is very difficult to find a place in this cliff where it is possible to make a landing rotation axis poles equator the school globe is a good model of the earth on a small scale have you noticed that it turns or rotates on a wire the earth also rotates of course there is no central wire running through the earth we think of it however as turning about a line running through it this imaginary line is called the axis of the earth the central wire of the school globe comes through the surface at two places so too we imagine the earth's axis as reaching the surface at two places these points are called the poles of the earth do you remember the bright star which guides the indians by night the north star or pole star as it is also called is always directly over the north pole the south pole is the one at the opposite side of the earth now we can add a little to our knowledge of directions when we speak of a man going north we mean that he is moving directly towards the north pole no matter where he happens to be on the earth's surface in the same way south means towards the south pole suppose a man at the north pole wished to reach the south pole he could set out facing any way he liked as long as he kept straight on he would be moving south what is the only direction in which a man can look when he is standing at the south pole suppose a traveller from the north pole has begun his journey sooner or later he must reach a point halfway between the two poles he is then standing on the equator we think of a line joining all the places in the world which are equally distant from the two poles and call it the equator can you find on the school globe the line marking the equator this line cuts through the centre of the hot country of the negroes in africa the equator is an east and west line if our traveller turns so that the north pole is to his left he is facing east if he turns so that the north pole is to his right he is turning west now tell in what directions run all the lines joining the two poles in what directions run all the lines parallel to the equator the hemispheres the line of the equator cuts the surface of the globe into two equal parts these are called hemispheres the northern hemisphere is the half of the world lying between the equator and the north pole the southern hemisphere lies between the equator and the south pole most of the land in the world lies in the northern hemisphere look at the top of the globe you can see north america europe and asia all stretching southward if you look at the southern hemisphere you can see nothing but water except the tips of the continents of africa and south america all australia and a few islands consequently the northern hemisphere is often called the land hemisphere and the southern hemisphere the water hemisphere we may also divide the earth into hemispheres by a circle around it through the poles the hemisphere which contains the continents of north and south america is called the western hemisphere the other half is called the eastern hemisphere latitude and longitude if we wish to locate a man's farm 
we can say that it is so many miles east or west or north or south of a certain city or town. Location is always a matter of comparison with some place whose situation we know. In the same way, places on the Earth's surface are located by comparison with certain fixed points. North and south locations are made by comparison with the position of the equator. Distance from the equator is called latitude. This distance, however, is not usually expressed in miles. The term degree is used. A degree is the 360th part of the circumference of a circle. The circumference of the Earth is about 25,000 miles. Therefore, a degree of latitude is about 69 miles in length. Instead of writing the word degrees, we generally use the symbol a circle superscript in its place. We read 60 with a circle superscript as though it were written 60 degrees. How would you read 70 with a circle superscript? 35 and a half with a circle superscript. All places north of the equator are said to be in north latitude. All places south of the equator are in south latitude. Since the distance from the equator to either pole is one quarter of the circumference of the earth, there are 90 degrees of north latitude and 90 degrees of south latitude. These are numbered from zero degrees at the equator to 90 degrees at the poles. The globe and all maps of countries show lines indicating latitude. These lines are called parallels of latitude since they are all parallel to the equator. But to define the position of a place on the Earth's surface, we must know not only the parallel of latitude on which it lies, but also its position on that parallel. This is done by means of meridians of longitude. These are lines running directly north and south from pole to pole. A degree of longitude is 1 over 360 of the distance around the Earth on any parallel of latitude. At the equator, the distance between two meridians, one degree apart, is 1 over 360 of 25,000 miles. The distance represented by 1 degree of longitude becomes less and less as the poles are approached until at last all the meridians meet at the poles. For this reason we cannot find so easily the distance in miles which is represented by a degree of longitude. It varies from about 69 miles at the equator, nothing at the poles. The meridian which passes through Greenwich in England is chosen as the one by comparison with which all the others are fixed. The first meridian, or prime meridian, as it is called, is numbered zero degrees. All places east of this are in east longitude, until at the meridian of 180 degrees the opposite side of the earth is reached. All west of the prime meridian, as far as the meridian of 180 degrees, are in west longitude. By the use of these two sets of circles upon the globe and maps, it is possible, with little trouble, to locate any spot on the Earth's surface. End of section 7。Section 8 of Ontario Public School Geography。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepherd. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto, Section 8, Introductory How the Sun Lights and Heats the Earth. The Rotation of the Earth. The sun seems to move through the sky during the day, appearing on the eastern horizon, rising higher in the sky until noon and then gradually sinking until it disappears from view in the western sky. But as a matter of fact, the sun does not really move. You have already learned that the earth rotates about its axis just as the school globe rotates about its central wire. When day breaks, the earth has turned far enough to bring us within sight of the sun. At noon, we must look overhead to see the sun, for by that time, the earth has turned sufficiently to bring us more directly under it. At sunset, the earth has turned so far that we can just see the sun on the western horizon. During the night we are on the side of the earth which is turned away from the sun, and so its rays cannot reach us. The earth turns from west to east, and therefore the sun appears to move from east to west. The earth turns completely around once in every 24 hours. Since the sun's rays can light only one half of the earth's surface at a given moment, one half of the earth is shrouded in the darkness of night, while the other is bathed in the light of day. 
When it is daytime with us, it is night on the other side of the world. When we see the sun just rising over our eastern horizon, the people who live just halfway around the world from us are seeing it sinking over their western horizon. The twilight of their evening and of our early dawn is the same, viewed in opposite directions from two points separated by half the distance around the world. Local Time Let us now imagine that the Earth has rotated to the position in which the sun's rays light the half of the Earth's surface from 90 degrees east longitude to 90 degrees west longitude. At that moment, the sun is directly over the prime meridian, so that it is noon at all places situated upon that meridian, while on the opposite side of the Earth, along the meridian of 180 degrees, it is midnight. Since the Earth turns from west to east, all places lying east of Greenwich to the meridian of 180 degrees have already had their noon, and now it is some hour in the afternoon between noon and midnight. For the same reason, all places west of Greenwich to the 180th have not yet had their noon, and in them it is some hour in the morning between midnight and noon. The Earth makes one complete rotation every 24 hours. We may express the same fact in another way by saying that it turns through 360 degrees in 24 hours, or through 15 degrees in one hour, or through one degree in four minutes. Therefore, it is very easy to calculate the time at any given meridian as compared with the time at Greenwich. For instance, when it is noon at Greenwich, it is 4 minutes to 12 in the morning on the meridian of 1 degree west longitude, and 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the meridian of 15 degrees east longitude. What time is it at all places on the meridians of 45 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees east longitude, of 5 degrees, 30 degrees, and 105 degrees west longitude? Standard Time it would be extremely confusing if every place used its own local time. Let us think what would happen if all the cities of Ontario should do so. The traveller would have to alter the hands of his watch every time that he went from one city to another. For instance, Toronto is about 4 degrees west of Ottawa. Therefore, Toronto time, if exact solar time, would be 16 minutes slower than Ottawa time. A man travelling from Toronto to Peterborough, one degree east, would have to set the hands of his watch four minutes ahead on his arrival. A businessman in Sault Ste. Marie calling an office in Ottawa by long-distance telephone would have to remember that Ottawa time would be more than half an hour faster than his own. This would be exceedingly inconvenient for everyone, and particularly for the railways. What a confusing thing a railway timetable would be under such conditions. To avoid this difficulty, it is customary for all places within a certain area to use the same time, even if it is not the accurate solar time for most of them. So Canada and the United States, for instance, are divided into five regions, or time belts. These run north and south, and are each about 15 degrees wide. All places in each belt have the same time, based upon that of the meridian which runs through the center of the belt. From east to west, these belts are called Atlantic, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific time. The meridians which determine the time in each are the 60th for Atlantic time, the 75th for Eastern, the 90th for Central, the 105th for Mountain, and the 120th for Pacific. As there is a difference of exactly 15 degrees longitude between these successive meridians, so there is a difference of exactly one hour of time between successive time belts. Since the numbers of these meridians are all multiples of 15, the time in each belt is an exact number of hours slower than Greenwich time. Consequently, a traveler crossing Canada from Halifax to Vancouver needs to move the hands of his watch back only four times, when passing from one time belt to another. At Campbellton in New Brunswick, he would put them back one hour, for there he passes from Atlantic to Eastern time. At Fort William, Broadview, and Field, he would have to do so again, as he passes from Eastern to Central, from Central to Mountain, and from Mountain to Pacific time. North America is not the only continent 
which has adopted such a system of time belts differing by one hour. Other continents also have similar recognized time regions. This system of indicating time is known as standard time. The Revolution of the Earth About the Sun Besides the daily rotation of the Earth about its axis, there is an even greater movement of our sphere. It is rushing continually through space in an almost circular path around the sun. It takes one whole year for the Earth to make this journey. The path it follows is called its orbit. Do you find this hard to believe, and do you wonder why we do not feel the movements of the Earth? Have you ever been on a fast express train running over a good road bed? If you close your eyes, you can scarcely tell that you are moving, for everything about you in the car is moving at the same speed as yourself. If it were not for the slight jars and jerks as the train moves over the rails, you would not notice the motion of the train at all. There are no shocks in the Earth's progress. Its daily rotation and yearly revolution are never disturbed in the slightest degree. The Tilting of the Earth's Axis You have seen a top spinning on the floor. Usually the top stands straight up and down. That is, its axis is at right angles or perpendicular to the floor. Sometimes the top leans a little as it spins, then we may say that its axis is inclined from the perpendicular. Let us think of the Earth as a huge top, spinning along on an invisible floor. The axis of the whirling Earth is always inclined a little from the perpendicular, and the amount of inclination never varies. You can see how the axis is tilted by noting how the school globe is set in its frame. You will see at once that the axis of the globe is not at right angles to the surface of the table or of the floor on which it is standing. Although the tilting of the Earth's axis is always the same, the position of the Earth in relation to the Sun is always changing. Thus, at one time of the year, the North Pole is slanted toward the Sun and the South Pole away from it. As the Earth rushes along in its orbit, this position is gradually reversed until the South Pole slants toward the Sun and the North Pole away from it. On June 21st, the Earth reaches the place in its orbit where the North Pole is tilted most toward the Sun and the South Pole away from it. Then the North Pole and a large area around it are in continual sunlight. We speak of the area in which there is continual sunlight during the whole of this day as bounded by a line called the Arctic Circle. Find this line on the globe. The sun's rays, of course, cannot strike vertically on this far northern region, even on June 21st, since the North Pole does not face the sun directly. Therefore, even at noon on June 21st, the Eskimos must look southward to see the sun, although it is higher in their sky on that day than on any other. We must go much farther south to reach the part of the Earth's surface which faces the sun directly on June 21st. Find the Tropic of Cancer on the globe. At noon on June 21st, the sun is directly over all places situated on this tropic. It marks the northern limit of the vertical rays of the sun. You remember that the equator divides the globe into two equal parts. Since the sun's rays fall vertically on June 21st far north of the equator, more than half of the northern hemisphere and less than half of the southern hemisphere are in sunlight. Therefore, it is summer in the north, while it is winter in the south. The wheat grower of Canada cuts his grain in July or August, but in Argentina, far on the other side of the equator, the wheat is ready to harvest in January. For the same reason, on that day, June 21st, all the northern parts of the world have their longest day and shortest night, while in the south, the opposite is the case. As the earth sweeps along in its orbit, the tilting of the North Pole toward the Sun becomes less and less. The polar area, which is continually in sunlight, decreases in proportion. The Sun's rays fall vertically a little farther south every day, as the movement of the Earth in its orbit gradually brings the South Pole closer to the Sun. On September 21st, the equator faces the Sun directly at noon. On that day, the sunlight just reaches both poles, and therefore day and night are of equal length, throughout the world. As the Earth moves on in its orbit, the South Pole remains in the sunlight while the North Pole is tilted away from the Sun and is in darkness. On December 21st, the Earth reaches the point in its orbit exactly opposite to its position on June 21st. 
Now the south pole is tilted most toward the sun. The area in which there is continual sunshine on that day is marked by the line which we call the Antarctic Circle. The vertical rays of the sun are now far south of the equator. The Tropic of Capricorn marks their most southern limit. Find these two lines on the globe. On March 21st, the Earth reaches the point in its orbit opposite to its position on September 21st. Then, once more, the sunlight reaches both poles, and the whole world has light and darkness for exactly 12 hours each. There are two days, therefore, every year, when day and night are equal in length. These two days are called the equinoxes, a word which means equal nights, that is, nights equal to the days. During the year, the vertical rays of the sun pass from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn and back again. Therefore, every place lying between these two tropics receives the rays of the sun vertically twice a year, and at no time are the rays very far from vertical. Would the temperature of this broad belt between the tropics be very hot or very cold? No other region in the world ever has the sun directly overhead. The sun's rays always fall slantingly upon the places which lie north and south of the tropics. The slant of the rays increases with distance north or south of the tropics until the poles are reached. Therefore, in general, the farther north of the Tropic of Cancer or south of the Tropic of Capricorn a place is situated, the colder is the climate. The Zones The hot central belt which girdles the earth between the two tropics is called the Torrid Zone. It extends for 23.5 degrees on each side of the equator. The poles are capped with ice, but the tropical belt knows no winter. Find its width in miles. You have already read of one race which lives in the torrid zone. Name this race of men and describe their life. Describe a tropical forest and some of the animals which are found there. That part of the Earth's surface lying between the Tropic of Cancer and the Arctic Circle is called the North Temperate Zone. The part lying between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Antarctic Circle is named the South Temperate Zone. The temperate zones are best suited to white men. In them, cereals such as wheat, oats, barley, and rye grow well. In the North Temperate Zone live the great nations of the world. The area surrounding the North Pole and bounded by the Arctic Circle is called the North Frigid Zone. Name a race which lives within this zone. Describe their land. The South Frigid Zone is the area between the Antarctic Circle and the South Pole. It is even more bleak and desolate than the Arctic regions. The South Pole is surrounded by a vast expanse of ice hundreds of feet thick. Nobody at all can live in this area. Even animals are much rarer than in the North, and a few hardy species of birds are almost the only living things to be found there. Of course, there is no sudden change at the dividing line between these zones. The change is very gradual indeed. There is little difference in the temperature between the southern part of the north temperate zone and the northern part of the torrid zone, or between the northern part of the north temperate zone and the southern part of the north frigid zone. The zones are important subdivisions of the earth. If we know in which zone a country lies, we have some idea at least of its climate, its vegetation, and its animals. We shall find our knowledge of the zones of considerable help when we come to study the world in greater detail. End of section 8. Recording by Doug Shepherd. Section 9 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepherd. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 9, Introductory, The Atmosphere, Winds, and Rain. The Atmosphere. The whole surface of the Earth is surrounded by air. This covering of air is called the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not of very great depth if compared with the size of the whole Earth. It extends for probably 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. The air is heaviest, or densest, right at the surface of the Earth. It becomes thinner, 
or rarer, very rapidly, with increasing height above the earth. Mountain climbers and aviators have found that the air is so rare, at a height of even three or four miles above the sea level, that they have some difficulty in breathing. The temperature of the air is highest close to the surface of the earth. Aviators who fly at great heights must wear warm clothing to withstand the cold of the upper air levels. Lofty mountains are capped with perpetual snow, even though situated, as many of them are, in the tropical regions. Winds. The air is never still. There is a continuous interchange of the air close to the earth's surface with the air at higher levels. We cannot feel these vertical movements of the air, and when they are occurring we say that there is a calm. The air also moves horizontally over the surface of the earth. Then we can both feel it and see its effects upon the objects around us. The horizontal movements of the air we call winds. It may seem to you that nothing can be more variable than the wind, which, quote, bloweth where it listeth, unquote. Yet the winds are due to certain definite causes and follow in the main certain general courses. There are two essential things to remember. The first is that air, when heated, expands, becomes lighter, and therefore rises, while air, when cooled, becomes heavier and tends to sink toward the earth. An area in which the air is comparatively light is called an area of low pressure. An area in which the air is comparatively heavy is called an area of high pressure. The second essential point to keep in mind is that the air always tends to move from an area of high pressure toward an area of low pressure. We have seen that the torrid zone is the only region on which the sun's rays ever strike vertically. The vertical rays of the sun pass across this zone twice a year. Therefore, there is a belt of light, heated air girdling the earth in the region of the equator. This belt will shift a little from north to south and back again as the vertical rays move across the zone. The heated air in it is continually rising. Since this vertical movement of the air cannot be felt, an area of calm results. This area is called the doldrums. It was much disliked by sailors before steamships made them independent of the wind. A ship caught in the doldrums might be held for weeks, while the sails flapped idly on the yards and the crew whistled for a breeze. The doldrums form an area of low pressure, while the cooler air to the north and south forms two areas of comparatively high pressure. Consequently, there is a constant flow of air from these areas toward the equator, in the southern hemisphere, the flow comes from the southeast. In the northern hemisphere, from the northeast. The winds which result are the steadiest in the world. They were of such great use to sailors in the days of sailing ships that they were called trade winds. Since winds are named from the direction from which they come, these are called the southeast trades and the northeast trades, respectively. The former blows over a belt to the south of the equator about 2,000 miles wide. The latter blows over a belt of equal width to the north of the equator. During our summer time, the northeast trades are felt farther north than during the winter. What is the reason for this? How do the southeast trades vary with the seasons? As the trade winds approach the doldrums, they become warmer, and the air forming them tends to rise. Then, in the area bordering the central belt of calms, they die away in fitful breezes. The air which rises in the doldrums spreads out at a high level, and flows north and south over the top of the trade winds. At last it reaches the area from which the trade winds begin to move toward the equator. There it sinks to the earth to take the place of the air flowing toward the equator. Since there is no wind where the movement of the air is vertical, there is a belt of calms marking the northern limit of the northeast trades and another at the southern limit of the southeast trades. These areas are called the horse latitudes. They lie a little to the north of the Tropic of Cancer and a little to the south of the Tropic of Capricorn. In addition to the doldrums, there are two other great areas of comparatively low pressure. One is north of the horse latitudes in the northern hemisphere, and the other south of the horse latitudes in the southern hemisphere. Consequently, there is a fairly steady flow of air from the horse latitudes 
toward the poles as well as toward the equator. In the northern hemisphere, the flow comes from the southwest, in the southern hemisphere, from the northwest. The winds which result are commonly known as the prevailing westerlies. The prevailing westerlies blow over nearly the whole surface of the temperate zones. They are more variable than the trade winds, particularly in the northern hemisphere, where there is a great deal of land. The effect of large bodies of land upon winds is the next thing to be considered. Land heats more quickly than water and to a far higher temperature when exposed to an equal amount of sunshine. If you have lain upon a river bank or lake shore after swimming, you will agree that this is true. Land also cools more quickly than water. You can see at once what the result of this must be. The air lying over the land tends to become an area of comparatively low pressure during the summer time and an area of high pressure during the winter. Consequently, in the higher latitudes, where the difference in temperature between bodies of land and water is most marked, the wind blows from the ocean toward the land during the summer and from the land toward the ocean during the winter. This is true to a certain degree of all the continents. The finest examples of such winds are the monsoons, which blow over part of Asia. In the summer time, the vast central plateau of Asia becomes excessively hot, and the air above it forms a great area of low pressure. Consequently, from May to September, the wind blows steadily toward the continent from the Indian Ocean on the south and from the Pacific Ocean on the east. The winter monsoons blow just as steadily from the continent toward the oceans from November to February. Rain You have often seen a washing put out on the line to dry. The clothes, even after being wrung out, are still wet to the sight and to the touch. But as you know, after an hour or two in the air and sunshine, they are quite dry. The water which was in the wet clothes has passed into the air in the form of water vapor, which, like the air itself, cannot be seen. Since clothes dry most rapidly on warm, sunny days, we may safely infer that warm, dry air takes up moisture more rapidly than cool, damp air. You have doubtless noticed the little beads of moisture that on a hot summer day gather on the surface of a pitcher filled with cold water. Probably you have wondered what caused them to gather there. They have come out of the air. The warm air of summer always contains more or less water vapor. When the air is cooled by coming in contact with the cold pitcher, the water vapor turns to liquid water and gathers in droplets on the surface of the pitcher. From this we may learn two important facts. Warm air takes up or absorbs water in the form of vapor. The water vapor turns again into liquid or condenses when the air is cooled. Let us see now whether we can apply this knowledge. Keep in mind these two important facts. The warmer the air, the more water vapor it can hold. When the air is cooled, this moisture condenses and it appears as rain or snow or dew or fog. In the tropics, where the heat is greatest, the rainfall is very heavy. The heated air absorbs a great deal of moisture. As this moisture-laden air rises, it becomes cooled. Then the water vapor condenses and falls in heavy showers upon the earth. We have already seen that the belt of greatest heat shifts north and south of the equator with the vertical rays of the sun. In this hot belt, showers of rain are of a daily occurrence. Explain now why the land of the Negroes in equatorial Africa has a rainy season and a dry season, instead of summer and winter. The trade winds blow toward the equator. They grow warmer as they approach it, and so they absorb the moisture during the whole of their journey. This is not condensed until the air rises and is cooled above the central hot belt. Consequently, the trades are dry winds and bring no rain to the lands over which they blow, unless there are mountains in their path. Then the wind is forced to higher levels, becomes cooler, and gives a copious rainfall to the land lying upon the windward side of the mountains. When the trades have come a long distance over land, they become so dry that instead of bringing moisture, they rob the land of the little it possesses. The parched ground is bare except for scattered plants of the few varieties which can live with very little moisture. Such an area is called a desert. The greatest desert in the world is the Sahara Desert in North Africa. 
It lies in the path of the northeast trades. Winds which blow over the ocean toward the land reach it well laden with moisture. If these winds are cooled sufficiently to cause condensation, heavy rains result. In Ontario, the usual westerly breezes are sometimes interrupted by steady east winds, which bring heavy rain with them. These east winds bring some of the water of the Atlantic Ocean for hundreds of miles to let it fall at last upon the broad fields of the province. You have read of the monsoons of Asia. They, too, bring with them the priceless gift of rain. Before the summer monsoons begin to blow, the fields of India and China are parched and dry. Then comes the wind from the great oceans. The rain falls heavily over the land and waters the crops, which nourish hundreds of millions of people. Unhappy indeed is the land where the monsoons are weak. Then the crops fail, and famine takes its toll of the crowded population. The winds, as you have seen, hold within their grasp the power to make a garden or a desert. End of section 9. Recording by Doug Shepherd. Section 10 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 10. Introductory. The Ocean. Ocean Life. Although we often speak of the sea as a waste of waters, yet the ocean teemed with life long before land animals or plants made their appearance upon our planet remains of seaweeds and marine animals which are known as fossils are found in older rocks than any which contain fossils of land life today the ocean is the home of an incredible number of plants and animals as a matter of fact there is a far greater number of them and a much larger variety in the sea than upon the land nor should we forget the life upon the ocean. Many varieties of birds obtain their food from it and spend their greater part of their existence either flying over it or swimming on its surface. Among the best known are the graceful gull, the awkward penguin, greatest of all ocean swimming birds, and the huge albatross, largest of all seabirds. The vegetation of the sea ranges from tiny plants, too small to be seen without the help of a microscope, to huge growths, which would measure a quarter of a mile in length if stretched out straight. The Red Sea owes its name to the fact that enormous numbers of tiny carmine-tinted plants thrive in its waters. These sometimes rise to the surface and tinge the water for miles. Seaweeds grow in all latitudes, even in the polar seas. The larger varieties cling to the rocks in shallow water close to land, or float unattached in quiet areas of deep water. They form marine forests, in which dwell countless millions of sea animals, such as mollusks, jellyfishes, sea worms and crabs, as well as fish of all sizes, which prey upon these animals and upon one another. Some varieties of seaweed provide palatable food for men. The Irish peasant eats seaweed as a relish with his potatoes. The Scottish fishermen are fond of a certain kind, known as dulse, the natives of the South Sea Islands, the Chinese, and the Japanese are all fond of similar seafood. Seaweed serves man in other ways also. Paper can be made from it. Some valuable chemicals, such as iodine, can be extracted from certain species of it. From other varieties, the Japanese make a strong glue, with which they stiffen the paper used for making fans, screens, hangings, and the like. Seaweed is a good fertilizer, and much is used for this purpose by farmers near the coast. The array of animal life which the ocean presents is so vast that we cannot hope to learn more than a very little about it. It ranges from microscopic animals of the simplest type to the huge whale, the largest of all living creatures. The most we can do is to learn something about the ocean animals, which are especially useful to man. The sponges, which we buy at the drug store, are really the skeletons of sea animals of a low type. Sponges are found chiefly in the warm waters of the tropical seas. They are gathered by divers or by men in small boats, who tear them from the sea bottom with long poles. 
the sponges are put through a long process of rotting, beating, rinsing, and bleaching before they are ready for the market. In the warm waters of the tropical seas lives another creature, stranger still. The coral polyp is a very tiny sea animal which builds up its minute body with lime extracted from the sea water. The beautiful coral which you probably have seen consists of the bodies of millions of coral polyps. The bodies of these polyps form massive foundations of coral in the shallow water close to the coast of a continent around an island or upon a submarine volcanic peak. The skeletons of successive generations of polyps heighten the reef of coral until its top rises above the waves. Fragments of shells, pieces of coral, and sand are piled up by the waves on or behind the reef so that new land is made. In this manner coral islands are formed. Certain plants, particularly the cocoa nut palm, flourish on these islands. A great many even form suitable homes for men. The red coral, of which necklaces and other ornaments are made, comes chiefly from the shores of Sicily and Sardinia in the Mediterranean Sea. The gathering, cutting, polishing, and mounting of coral provides work for many men in these islands and in southern Italy. The pearl oyster provides us with an even more beautiful substance than coral. These oyster coat the inside of their shells with a bright iridescent covering. This lustrous substance we call mother of pearl. Pearls are composed of the same substance deposited about some irritating object, such as a grain of sand, which has found its way inside the animal's shell. Pearl oysters are found in the warm waters of the tropics. They are obtained by divers, usually natives, who are wonderfully expert swimmers. The oysters are brought ashore and opened. Many contain tiny pearls known as seed pearls. Occasionally, a lucky pearler secures one of the great, lustrous gems, which are among the most beautiful and precious of all jewels. The pearler depends mainly upon the shells, however, for his living. They are in great demand and command a good price. They are used for making buttons and many other small objects in which a hard, beautiful surface is desired. Most of us, however, are more interested in the common oyster, which is so delicious as food. Vast quantities of these are consumed annually in Europe, North America, Australia, and Asia. The people of London, England, eat more than a billion oysters every year. Yet the number consumed by man is probably not so great as the number eaten by the many varieties of sea animals which consider the oyster a dainty tidbit. Fortunately, oysters multiply very rapidly. A single oyster lays from 16 million to 60 million eggs in one season. The eggs soon hatch into tiny oysters, no larger than a needle point. Oysters reach their full growth when they are three or four years old. No list of sea delicacies would be complete unless it includes the lobster and his close relatives, the crab, the shrimp, and the prawn. All these belong to a single family with hard armor-like shells. The lobster is caught with traps, baited with meat or dead fish, and set on the bottom not far from the shore. Each trap is big enough to hold several lobsters. Every few days the traps are hauled up and emptied. The lobsters are kept in floating cages until enough are caught for a shipment to the market. The east coast of Canada is famous for its excellent lobsters. The Chinese are particularly fond of a curious kind of seafood, which probably you would not like. This is boeche de mer, or trepang, a large sea slag found principally around the coral islands of the tropics. These creatures look much like big cucumbers, two to three feet in length and two to four inches thick. They are picked up by the fishermen at low tide. After being cleaned, they are boiled, dried, and smoked. Then they are shipped to China, where they command a big price. All these, however, are but slight contributions to the food supply of man when compared with the enormous quantities of fish which the ocean yields. Thousands of millions of pounds are taken annually, and the supply seems inexhaustible. Fish like oysters multiply very rapidly. A single codfish lays annually three million eggs or more. You can see that countless cod could be eaten by other fish or caught by man, and still there will be an abundant supply. Among the commonest of the food fishes are the cod, the mackerel, the salmon, the herring, the halibut, the haddock, and the sardine. This list names only a very small number of the varieties of sea fish which are caught for food. 
Southern China, for instance, has so many varieties that the Chinamen may have a different kind of fish for breakfast every day in the year. You have already read of the seal and the walrus, which help the Eskimo to live in his frozen land. One kind of seal also is hunted by white men for its beautiful fur. The hide of the walrus makes magnificent leather, and its large tusks are valuable as ivory. Whaling used to be one of the most important of marine industries. The oil obtained from the fat of the whale was very valuable, and the whalebone brought a good price. Lately, however, the increasing use of mineral oil and of metal substitutes for whale bone has made whaling much less profitable, and comparatively few ships are now used for this purpose. Homer, the great poet of ancient Greece, sings of the unharvested sea, and so doubtless it was in those old days, before man conquered the ocean and exacted from it the tribute which is his due. Now, however, the harvest of the sea ranks second only to the harvest of the land, and the reaping of that harvest gives occupation to hundreds of thousands of men all over the world. Sea water. The water of the ocean is not fresh and sweet like the water of our rivers and lakes. It tastes bitter and increases thirst instead of slaking it. Ocean-going vessels have to carry with them their supply of drinking water. There is no worse fate for a sailor than to be cast adrift in a small boat without a supply of fresh water, with... Quote, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. End quote. About a twenty fifth part of a sea water is not water at all, but consists of a number of substances dissolved in the water. You can make sea water in your own home, buy a package of sea salts at a drug store, add one spoonful of the salts to about twenty four spoonfuls of fresh water, stir the water around until the salts have disappeared. The solution which you have made is very much the same as the sea water taken right from the ocean. If you cannot get sea salts, use common salt instead. Almost four fifths of the sea salts is just common salt. If you place the sea water upon the stove and boil it gently, the water gradually boils away. The salts, however, remain in the bottom of the dish. Salt does not evaporate like water. When the rain falls upon the earth, some of it soaks through the soil to reappear again in springs. Some of it runs over the surface of the ground into creeks and rivers. The soil contains quantities of the same salts which are found in the sea water. As the rain water passes through or over the ground, it dissolves some of these salts which the soil contains. Rivers all over the world are pouring this water into the ocean. In this way, salts are being brought constantly to the ocean. You have already seen how the air is continually absorbing water from the ocean, and how the winds carry it to land, where it falls as rain. You have just learned that the air cannot absorb salt, for when our sea water was boiled, the salt remained after all the water had passed into the air. Can any of the salt brought to the ocean by rivers be carried back to the land by the winds? The ocean is daily receiving more salt, but it loses none. Part of the world's supply of salt is obtained by evaporating sea water and collecting the salt which is left. This method is used chiefly in those regions of the world where the sun is hot enough to evaporate water quickly. For instance, on some of the islands of the West Indies and along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. A much greater quantity of salt is obtained from deposits buried deep in the earth. This salt, too, is really a gift of the ocean. Long, long ago, the land was covered by the ocean. When the land emerged above the waves, thick layers of salt were left in the low places which were the last to become dry. In the course of time, these salt beds were buried deep in the earth. Gradually, the salt was pressed into a hard mass. Such salt we call rock salt. There are many such deposits of salt in the world. Very large salt beds have been found in southwestern Ontario. The salt contained in these beds is exceptionally pure. It is obtained by boring holes down to the layer of salt, which is more than 1,000 feet below the surface of the ground. Then water is forced down the shaft. It dissolves the salt, forming a strong brine. The brine is pumped out and evaporated. Then the salt is purified and boxed or bagged for the market. You have doubtless seen packages of this salt at your grocers and possibly use it at every meal. Thus, although sea water is unfit to drink, we must remember that its very bitterness is a sign that it holds within it the salt which man prizes so highly for seasoning and preserving his food. How tasteless and unappetizing our meals would be without it! 
salt is so common and so cheap in our country that we use it freely and without a thought of how keenly we should miss it in some parts of africa salt is so scarce that it is used in trade instead of money in abyssinia it is said men carry about little sticks of rock salt and suck them just as canadian children suck sticks of candy when an abyssinian gentleman meets a friend he offers him salt stick to lick he can imagine no finer treat the ocean floor the oceans lie in great basins or troughs between the continents the floor of the ocean is for the most part a vast plain laying about twelve thousand or fifteen thousand feet below the surface this plain is covered with a deep layer of fine white particles forming a substance called ooze the ooze consists of the skeletons of myriads of tiny animals these are so small that a microscope is needed to see them at all during their lives they remain close to the surface of the water but as they die their bodies sink to the bottom in this way a thick coating of chalky material has accumulated over the ocean floor the famous chalk cliffs of england and france were once a part of this ooze at the bottom of the sea in the course of ages they have been raised high above the water and now form cliffs which are visible for miles over the sea this great plain of the ocean floor is not entirely unbroken here and there are deep depressions in some of which the bottom is more than five miles below the surface there are also a number of ridges and hills rising from the ocean floor these have been formed by lava poured out by volcanoes under the water in many cases the volcanic action has been so violent and the mass of lava ejected so great that peaks have been formed which are higher than the water these form volcanic islands the islands of japan are examples of such a formation the deep trough of the oceans does not extend right to the coasts of the continents the sea floor rises rather abruptly at a varying distance from the shore so that there is a shallow area surrounding each continent and extending for some distance out from the coast the floor of this shallow area over which the water is usually not more than six hundred feet deep is called the continental shelf the continental shelf is narrowest where lofty mountains border the sea most of the islands which are close to a continent are really high places on the continental shelf the british isles are part of the continental shelf of europe newfoundland stands on the continental shelf of north america find on the map other islands which form part of the continental shelf of our continent currents we speak of the land as terra firma that is the solid land we speak also of the restless ocean and with equal reason we can see the movements of the water upon the surface beneath the surface too there is a constant movement although we cannot see it the water of the ocean is never still water like air becomes lighter when warmed and heavier when cooled whenever a body of water is heated in one place and cooled in another differences of density are produced which cause a movement of the water the heated water tends to move along the surface toward the cooled area while the cooled water flows in the opposite direction below it in the ocean there is a slow but steady interchange of water between the hot equatorial belt and the cold polar seas the dense water of the antarctic and arctic oceans keeps settling down to the bottom then it flows off in the lower levels of the ocean toward the equator there it slowly rises again to the surface becomes warm and moves back toward the poles this constant though almost imperceptible movement of the ocean water is of great importance because of it the tropical seas are cooler than they otherwise would be and the polar seas warmer the winds which blow over them are similarly affected this slow steady circulation of the ocean water is one of the reasons why the ocean exerts a moderating influence both upon the extreme heat of the tropics and upon the severe cold of high latitudes there are however even more important movements of the ocean water in each of the three great oceans are two immense systems of surface currents these currents are of practical importance partly because they have a certain influence upon sailing and steamship routes but chiefly on account of their indirect influence upon climate they determine to a certain extent the climate of the coasts along which they pass by raising or lowering the temperatures of the winds which blow over them toward the land the trade winds of the atlantic covering two belts parallel to the equator drive before them two westward currents called the north and south equatorial currents the south equatorial current strikes the wedge-like coast of brazil and is split in two 
one part turns south and flows down the east coast of south america until it reaches the latitude of the westerlies these turn its course and drive it eastward to the african coast there it turns and flows northward toward the equator until it rejoins the south equatorial current in the trade wind belt in this way is formed a great whirl or eddy of water two to three thousand miles wide in the south atlantic this is called the south atlantic eddy it moves in the direction opposite to that of the hands of a clock and so we say it flows counterclockwise the other part of the south equatorial flows through the caribbean sea into the gulf of mexico the north equatorial also sends part of its flow into the caribbean sea but most of it turns northward before reaching the west indies the level of the gulf of mexico is raised by the great influx of water poured into it from the south by the equatorial currents the surplus water flows out through the strait of florida and is known as the gulf stream the most famous ocean current in the world it forms a vast river of warm blue water sixty to eighty miles wide and several hundred feet deep its bright blue is so different from the dark green of the rest of the ocean that sailors can often actually see the edge of the stream as they enter it the gulf stream turns sharply to the north just outside the strait of florida and sweeps along parallel to the coast it gradually becomes wider shallower and cooler it disappears entirely as a distinct current when it reaches the latitude of the prevailing westerlies the westerlies keep driving the surface water of the north atlantic across toward europe this current is called the north atlantic drift off the coast of spain most of the north atlantic drift turns southward and under the name of the canaries current flows toward the equator until it rejoins the north equatorial current the greater part of the rest of the north atlantic drift is swept northeastward past the british isles and along the coast of norway and loses itself in the cold polar waters to the north the north equatorial current the gulf stream the North Atlantic Drift and the Canaries Current form another vast eddy in the North Atlantic. It moves in the same direction as the hands of a clock, and so we say it flows in a clockwise direction. The circulation of water in the Pacific Ocean is very similar to that of the Atlantic, although, of course, on a much larger scale. There is a clockwise eddy in the North Pacific and a counterclockwise eddy in the South Pacific, a warm current called by the Japanese the Kurosivo, or Black Stream, flows northward along the east coast of asia it corresponds pretty closely to the gulf stream in the atlantic the part of the indian ocean lying south of the equator contains an eddy similar to those of the south atlantic and the south pacific north of the equator the circulation of the indian ocean is determined by the monsoons in the summer when the southwest monsoon is blowing the eddy moves in a clockwise direction in the winter the northeast monsoon reverses the direction of the eddy which then moves in a counterclockwise direction the water in the center of these great eddies is comparatively quiet in the center of the north atlantic eddy is a great expanse of calm water thick with floating seaweed this is called the sargasso sea which means the seaweed sea there are similar sargasso seas in the centers of all such eddies the one in the north atlantic is the best known Besides the currents which form the eddies, there are two important cold currents flowing from the Arctic Ocean toward the equator. The Labrador current flows through Baffin Bay into the Atlantic and creeps down the coast of North America. It meets the Gulf Stream near Newfoundland. The meeting of the warm moisture-laden air above the Gulf Stream with the colder air above the Labrador current causes the fogs, which are so frequent in that region. A very similar cold current creeps down the east coast of Asia these currents have little direct influence upon the climate of the coasts along which they pass they affect climate only by warming or cooling the winds which blow over them toward the land in the northern hemisphere their influence is great the east coast of asia is colder than the west coast of europe to which the north atlantic drift brings the warm water of the gulf stream in north america the west coast has a more moderate climate than the east as the prevailing westerlies are warmed during their passage over the north pacific drift tides the water line along the shores of our lakes does not change very much although there is a slight shifting of the water level from season to season or from year to year it is usually so little that we do not notice it along the sea coast the water line is constantly and perceptibly changing twice daily the water reaches high water mark and twice slowly recedes to low water mark 
if the shore slopes down gently the receding water leaves the wide strip of the bottom exposed so that one may walk far out over the ground that was covered with water only a few hours before at every place on the sea coast high and low water succeed each other at intervals of about six and one quarter hours these rise and fall of the water we call the tide the times of high tide follow each other quite regularly at an interval of about twelve and one half hours the high water mark and the low water mark vary however from day to day the difference between the two is greatest twice a month once about the time of the full moon and again at the time of the new moon for then the high tide is highest and the low tide lowest it is least also once a fortnight at a time just midway between full and new moon in the open oceans the tidal range or difference between low and high tides is not more than two to five feet when however the tides dash against land or enter deep gulfs or river mouths the accumulating tidal waters sometimes reach a great height the average height of the tide along the eastern coast of north america is from nine to twelve feet it reaches its greatest height in the bay of fundy nova scotia up this long v-shaped channel the tidal water rushes headlong in a foaming wave at the mouth of the bay it rises to a height of about eighteen feet above low tide it increases further up the channel until it reaches the almost incredible height of fifty to seventy feet the channels leading into some harbors are so shallow that big ships can enter them only at high tide a thorough knowledge of these tides is necessary for every practical navigator end of section ten section eleven of ontario public school geography this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org ontario public school geography by the ontario department of education section eleven climate and life weather and climate by weather we mean the condition of the atmosphere at a particular time so we say it is fine weather today or we had warm weather last week or we have had much bad weather this year the atmosphere may be hot or cold still or moving cloudy or clear wet or dry so we may speak of the weather as being warm or hot calm or windy cloudy or clear rainy or dry we may also describe it by its effect upon us and so we speak of it as being invigorating or enervating agreeable or unpleasant healthful or unhealthful by the climate of a place we mean the usual or average state of its atmosphere without limiting our description to any definite time we use the same terms when speaking of climate that we do with reference to the weather when we say that florida has a warm climate we mean that the weather is usually warm there it does not mean that there is never cool or even cold weather in florida there is some cool weather but it is unusual you already know the chief causes of differences of climate explain how latitude altitude winds ocean currents and distance from the sea influence climate plants and animals wherever there is enough soil heat sunshine and moisture to allow them to grow plants are found many plants are of great importance to man since they provide him with materials for food clothing shelter and tools and because they provide food for animals which also help to supply his needs all plants do not require the same kind of soil or the same amount of heat sunshine and moisture some flourish in the warm moist regions of the earth others cannot endure the continuous heat of the tropics some are adapted to a dry hot climate others to a wet cold climate therefore plants vary widely in different parts of the world we cannot attempt to describe fully the many varieties or even the chief varieties of plants found upon the earth we may however distinguish three main types of vegetation areas 
forest areas in which there is sufficient heat and moisture to allow the growth of trees grasslands where owing to insufficient moisture trees are absent but where grasses find sufficient moisture deserts in which since there is little or no moisture only a few plants well adapted to withstand drought can grow these great vegetation areas of course are not separated from one another by definite lines between dense forests and adjoining grasslands will always be found a transition area in which both trees and grass are found between grasslands and deserts there is a similar transition area in which the grass gradually grows thinner and poorer as the desert is approached now let us make a survey of the world to see where for the most part these vegetation areas occur in the extreme north the great ice cap surrounding the pole prohibits all plant life this area is therefore a real desert it is called the ice desert farther south the sun is warm enough to thaw the surface of the ground during the short summer and a few lowly plants chiefly mosses and lichens can grow in this area live the eskimos of whom you have already read the desolate frozen plains of the far north are called tundras they are found along the northern coasts of north america europe and asia the inhabitants of the tundra depend upon animals for food and clothing as the land produces little or no vegetation fit for human food still farther south in the northern part of the temperate zone is a broad belt of forest the trees composing it are adapted to life in a cold climate among them are found the pine the hemlock the spruce the poplar the birch and the willow there are in the northern forest many fur-bearing and other animals such as the elk and the moose and hunting is the chief occupation of its few inhabitants lumbering is also carried on along its southern border where the trees are largest and nearest to settlements of people south of the northern forest is a forest of a different character in which broad-leaved hardwoods such as the oak the beech and the maple are found these trees require much rain consequently these hardwood forests are found chiefly along the coasts or in inland areas into which the rain-bearing winds can penetrate in the drier districts as in the central part of north america are found broad grasslands by far the greater part of the north temperate zone consists of the areas of northern forest hardwood forest and grasslands where the forest has been cleared or where the grasslands have been brought under cultivation crops of grain fodder plants fruits and vegetables are grown the cultivated plants of the temperate zone are the best food plants of the world the grasslands provide rich pasturage for sheep horses and cattle in addition the forest provides plenty of good lumber for building and tools these are some reasons why the most progressive and prosperous peoples of the world live in the temperate zone the temperate forest changes in character toward the tropic of cancer many trees unknown farther north such as palms and palmettos make their appearance such a forest is called a subtropical forest the regions near the tropics have but one season of heavy rainfall a year at that time grass and flowers spring up with great rapidity and grow to immense size but after the rains are over the great heat soon withers the vegetation the dried grass however still provides nourishing food for animals such tropical grasslands are called savannas they are often dotted with clumps of small trees giving them a beautiful park-like appearance the savannas are the home of many large grass-eating animals as well as the flesh-eaters which prey upon them hunting and cattle raising are the chief occupations of the people of the savannas in the torrid zone wherever the rainfall is abundant the great heat and bright sunshine favor rapid growth and tangled forests and jungles extend for many miles you have already read of such a tropical forest in them both people and ground animals are comparatively few owing to the denseness of the forest there are however many birds and insects 
and a large number of animals adapted to life among the trees. There are tree frogs, tree snakes, tree lizards and monkeys in abundance. As we pass through the southern hemisphere from the South Pole to the Torrid Zone, we find the same vegetation areas in about the same order. Ice desert, tundra, temperate forest, subtropical forest, savanna and tropical forest. There are, however, several large regions where vegetation is lacking almost entirely. Deserts are found on the leeward side of great mountain ranges which intercept rain-bearing winds and in those parts of the trade wind belts where the winds come over land. The vegetation of such desert areas consists entirely of plants able to endure long periods of drought. The cactus, for instance, has thick, fleshy stems in which it stores up water. Since there are so few plants in the desert, there can be little animal life there. There are only a few small animals and the snakes which prey upon them, and some insects and the lizards and birds which eat them. Wherever underground water approaches the surface, or a stream flows into the desert from some wetter district, the vegetation becomes more abundant. Low bushes and dwarf trees with occasional stretches of grassland are found. Such an area is called a semi-desert. It generally forms a border around the almost lifeless desert. In it live a few people who wander about with their flocks in search of pasture. Thus far we have considered chiefly the effects of latitude, winds and rain upon vegetation. In mountainous regions, altitude also plays a great part. A snow-capped mountain in the torrid zone shows a series of different vegetations. At its base is a dense tropical forest. Above this is a belt of temperate forest. Still higher up the trees become dwarfed and there are many shrubs and bushes. In the very high valleys there are meadows of rich grass. Between the grassy meadows and the level of perpetual snow is a belt of mosses and lichens, much resembling the tundra of the far north. Above the tundra belt is a true ice desert. In climbing such a mountain we pass through a tropical, a temperate and a cold zone, just as we should in passing from the equator to the pole. This, of course, is due to the fact that the temperature steadily falls as a greater height is reached. End of section 11「Section 12 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 12. North America. The Continent as a Whole. Map questions. What ocean is east of North America? West of it? North of it? What large bay is on the north coast? Name two big gulfs on the east coast and one on the west. What strait separates North America from Asia? What is the largest island north of the continent? Name the bay and the strait southwest of this island. What peninsula lies between Hudson Bay and the Gulf of St. Lawrence? Name the island which partly encloses this gulf. What two peninsulas partly enclose the Gulf of Mexico? Where are the West Indies? Name the four largest islands of this group. What sea lies south of them? What separates the Caribbean Sea from the Pacific Ocean? What is the narrowest part of North America? What two continents are joined by this narrow isthmus? What peninsula partly encloses the Gulf of California? Is the southern or the northern part of the west coast of North America more broken? Where are the best harbors on the west coast? How many highlands are there in North America? Name them. Which has the highest mountains? Find the great central plain. 
between what highlands does it lie what river flows southward through it to the gulf of mexico what river flows northward to the arctic ocean what river flows eastward between these two name the lakes which border the laurentian highland on the west what group of lakes lies south of this highland by what river are they drained what is the name of the plain between the appalachian highland and the atlantic ocean why are the rivers in this plain short what are the two largest countries of north america which of these is larger what country lies south of the united states what river flows between the united states and mexico how many countries are there in central america name them where is alaska to what country does it belong name a large river which crosses alaska into what sea does it empty in what zone or zones is greenland situated alaska canada the united states mexico the west indies central america give the boundaries of each of these countries in what zone is the greater part of the continent why is this an advantage shape size and situation north america as its name implies is the northern portion of the great land mass which forms the new world it is roughly triangular in shape being broad in the north and tapering toward the south from north to south the continent extends over 72 degrees of latitude a distance of about 5000 miles its greatest breadth from east to west is considerably over 3000 miles its area is about 9,350,000 square miles almost three times the size of europe it ranks third among the continents in size asia and africa are larger north america is well situated for trade with other countries its eastern coast looks over the atlantic toward europe its western shore faces the east coast of asia the most productive and densely populated part of that continent south american ports are easily reached and a large trade is carried on between the two american continents sea-going trade has been helped by the panama canal cut by the government of the united states through the isthmus of panama through it ships can pass from ocean to ocean without having to make the long voyage around south america the north coast the north coast of the continent is washed by the arctic ocean and therefore is almost valueless for commerce a network of islands extends from the coast to within 500 miles of the north pole itself with the exception of greenland which is a danish colony these islands belong to the dominion of canada their very scanty population consists entirely of eskimos hudson bay the largest and most important indentation of the northern coast is ice-bound for several months of the year and as yet has been little used for shipping it is named after henry hudson who discovered it while attempting to find a passage to asia around the north coast of america the discovery of the northwest passage as the sea route north of america from the atlantic to the pacific is called proved very difficult on account of the ice with which the straits between the northern islands are filled for almost the whole of the year the names of many of the islands and channels recall to mind the men who dared and suffered much in these waters davis baffin franklin and many others vainly endeavored to win their way through to the pacific it was not until the year 1906 that this feat was successfully accomplished in that year captain roald amundsen who later discovered the south pole reached the pacific ocean after a three years voyage of great difficulty and peril amundsen proved that although a northwest passage exists its difficulties and dangers are so great that it can never become a commercial highway the east coast the northern portion of the east coast is rough and rocky it contains many good harbors ranging in size from small bays just large enough to shelter a few fishing vessels to magnificent harbors such as those of halifax and new york farther south 
the shore is low and sandy and good harbors are scarce the continental shelf is very wide upon the eastern side of the continent this shelf was once part of the coastal plain of north america but now owing to the gradual sinking of the eastern coast it lies beneath the surface of the ocean on this shallow submarine platform there is much plant and animal life the grand bank of newfoundland forms a part of the continental shelf the banks are the richest cod fishing grounds in the world the two chief currents in the atlantic along the eastern coast are the gulf stream and the labrador current the gulf stream makes little difference to the climate of north america to it however the bermuda islands owe their existence these are the most northerly coral islands in the world they lie in the midst of the gulf stream and in its warm waters the coral polyps are able to live and thrive much farther north than they could were it not for the gulf stream the labrador current as you have already seen causes dense fogs near newfoundland it also brings down with it many icebergs these are huge masses of ice broken from the ends of the great glaciers which fill the valleys of greenland both icebergs and fogs are dangerous to vessels ships are often delayed in their journey across the atlantic by these menaces to their safety to the labrador current however is due to a great extent the immense number of fish which throng the newfoundland banks it brings down with it from the arctic ocean great quantities of small jelly-like plants called plankton upon which many varieties of small fish feed these fish in their turn provide food for the cod the codfish upon the newfoundland banks could not exist without the microscopic plankton which the labrador current supplies in such abundance the west coast the west coast like the east coast is very irregular in the northern section there are numberless sounds and inlets many of them forming fine harbors a chain of islands fringes the whole of this part of the coast of these vancouver island is the largest and most important toward the south the coastline is almost unbroken the only good harbor is that of san francisco bay the gulf of california although large is of little commercial importance as the chief ports of mexico are upon the coast of the gulf of mexico the western or rocky mountain highland the rocky mountain highland begins in alaska and stretches southward throughout the whole length of north america it is comparatively narrow in the far north but broadens rapidly to the south it is its widest at forty degrees north latitude where it stretches across one-third of the width of the continent the whole of mexico and central america is within this highland with the exception of a narrow belt of lowland bordering the coasts the rocky mountains which extend without a break from alaska to mexico form the eastern ridge of the highland in canada and the united states the western side is marked by a series of ranges rising close to the margin of the pacific between the rockies and these western ranges are several large plateaus in the mountains are many valleys in the widest part of the highland is an immense depression known as the great basin it resembles an enormous shallow bowl the edge of which is formed by the high ground surrounding it the rain which falls on the inner slopes of the great basin forms creeks and rivers which following the slope of the land flow toward the low ground there the water gathers and forms lakes a region such as this in which the rivers flow into depressions which have no outlet to the ocean is called an area of interior drainage the water in the lakes in such an area is always salt for the same reason that the water of the ocean is salt the prevailing wind over the northern half of the western highland is from the west north of forty five degrees the west coast has rain at all seasons brought by the westerlies which sweep over the north pacific drift referred to on page forty nine the westerlies moderate the climate of the west coast of america making it milder in winter and cooler in summer than that of the regions lying inland during the winter they bring rain to the coast as far south as twenty degrees north latitude the mountain girt plateaus and basins have a very scanty rainfall particularly in the south where they lie beyond the influence of the westerlies 
these are the desert lands of north america the vegetation of the western highland varies with latitude rainfall and altitude that part of the coast which comes within the belt of the westerlies is densely forested with coniferous trees of which some species such as the douglas fir attain a very great size many of the higher peaks of the mountains are above the tree line on them the forests rise towards grasslands gay with flowers which in turn merge into areas of bare rock and snowfields the arid plateaus and basins have a semi-desert vegetation the most characteristic plant is the sagebrush while toward the south the thorny cactus is very common the west coast of mexico is too dry to support a tropical forest and so savanna lands of mixed grass and woodland are found there there are many wild animals among the wooded mountains the rocky mountain sheep the rocky mountain goat and the grizzly bear are the most characteristic of them on the dry plateaus there are burrowing animals such as the prairie dog there too the rattlesnake is very common scorpions are numerous in the desert the great central plain the great central plain is divided by a slight elevation of land running from east to west close to the boundary between canada and the united states the southern portion slopes toward the gulf of mexico the northern toward hudson bay and the arctic ocean the higher ground between the two great slopes falls gradually from west to east prove these statements by tracing the courses of the mississippi mackenzie and saskatchewan rivers the central plain of the continent for the most part is cold in winter and hot in summer the winter temperature of the northern districts is very low and the summers though warm are short in the south both summer and winter are naturally much warmer the rainfall occurs chiefly during the summer when it is of greatest use for plant growth during the spring and summer it varies from five to fifteen inches in different districts the annual rainfall ranges mostly from ten to thirty inches the great plain of north america is one of the most fertile areas in the world in the south cotton and sugar cane are grown then comes a great belt of land in which indian corn is the main crop farther north are broad stretches of wheat land which extend northward into canada as far as the peace river most of the great plain is a natural grassland wooded only along the courses of the rivers north of the saskatchewan river however the plain is thickly wooded this forest is part of the northern forest which covers the northern part of the continent right from alaska to the gulf of st lawrence toward the west the ground rises in rolling plains toward the foothills of the rockies the plains lying right in the lee of the mountains are too dry except in the northern part to permit ordinary farming when irrigation is employed or special methods of farming are used to overcome the dryness of the soil good crops may be grown much of this part of the plain is used for grazing great herds of cattle and even the driest districts produce enough grass to support many large flocks of sheep east of the mississippi the ground is very level for many miles until it rises in gently rolling slopes into the appalachian highland the soil of this part of the plain is particularly fertile and some of the most productive farms in the world are found here the prairies were once the home of large herds of bison or buffalo as they are more usually named as late as eighteen fifty eight a traveller upon the western plains drove for ten days through a single continuous herd and the prairie was black with moving animals as far as the eye could reach but man needed for his own use the land over which they roamed railways were built settlers came in ever increasing numbers and the buffalo vanished before the westward advance of civilization another animal of the plains the beautiful prong-horned antelope still survives but in sadly decreased numbers the coyote or prairie wolf the most cunning of all wolves has more than held his own and his sharp bark and the mournful howl are to be heard today almost anywhere on the western plains and in the foothills of the mountains the indians of the plains were among the most picturesque and savage tribes of the continent in the south 
and central regions the apaches the navajos and the sioux the wild horsemen of the plains and farther north the crees hunted over the high plains and the prairies now their old hunting grounds are farms and ranches the game has vanished and the descendants of fierce warriors live peacefully upon their reservations the appalachian highland this highland is much smaller than the rocky mountain highland it is only about two hundred miles wide and consists of comparatively low rounded hills which are usually wooded both sides of the highland are well watered for the greater part of the rainfall comes from the storms which travel from the gulf of mexico to the northeast in a path parallel to the mountains in the north are several distinct ranges of low mountains there is only one good route from the atlantic coast to the great lakes through these confused and tangled hills this is afforded by the valleys of the hudson river and of its tributary the mohawk the hudson mohawk valley early became the main highway of travel through the appalachian highland and still retains its supremacy the city of new york the largest and wealthiest of american cities owes much to its situation at the mouth of the hudson river south of the hudson river the appalachian highland consists of a central belt of parallel even ridges running in a general southwest to northeast direction between the mountain ridges are fertile valleys across the ridges eastward flowing rivers have cut narrow transverse valleys which are important lines of communication within the highland the most easterly part of the appalachian highland called the piedmont plateau presents a very steep face to the east and below this lies a flat coastal plain extending to the atlantic this escarpment as such a steep descent from a plateau is called marks the limit of navigation from the atlantic since the course of the rivers is broken by falls or rapids where they plunge down from the plateau to the plain at the eastern edge of the plateau known as the fall line are located the chief cities and ports of this region the rivers provide them with water power the most westerly part of the highland called the appalachian plateau slopes west and northwest to the prairies and the ohio river this plateau is noted for its mineral wealth it contains the greatest coal fields in the world there are also large deposits of iron vast quantities of petroleum and much natural gas the atlantic slope the plain lying between the appalachian highland and the atlantic ocean is very low and flat it is quite narrow in the north but broadens toward the south it is well watered by many streams flowing from the highland the coast is fringed with sandbanks and islands behind which are many lagoons and marshes in the marshland toward the south rice can be grown there are also large sandy tracts covered with pine forests there is some good land especially suited for the production of fruit vegetables and cotton the weather on the east coast of the continent is more variable than anywhere else in north america northeasterly winds passing over the cold labrador current are usually accompanied by heavy falls of snow in winter and by cool rains in summer southeasterly winds coming from over the warmer north atlantic drift bring rain and mild weather Northwesterly winds blowing over the cold interior bring clear cold weather in winter their influence reaches far south and killing frosts are not uncommon even in southern florida the laurentian highland the laurentian highland is marked by the chain of large lakes which border it this v-shaped highland encloses hudson bay and covers the whole northeastern portion of the continent the Laurentian Highland is the lowest of the three highland areas. In fact, it is much more like a vast plain than a mountainous district. It was once much higher than it is now. Long ago, it was covered with ice, and the rocks were worn down by moving glaciers. During the many centuries which have elapsed since the ice melted, the rivers had continued the work of wearing down the rock. Much of the fertile soil of the West Plains and of the basin of the Great Lakes and the valley of the St. Lawrence has come from the rocks which once formed part of the Laurentian Highland. The vast extent of this ancient highland is broken by many low, rounded hills. 
between the hills are innumerable streams and countless lakes forest covers its whole area except in the far north where only mosses lichens and a few stunted bushes can withstand the severity of the climate natural resources let us now sum up a few of the outstanding advantages of north america which have contributed much to the rapid development of the continent the mineral wealth of the continent is unrivalled coal iron copper nickel gold and silver are found in quantities unknown elsewhere the coal fields of the continent are estimated to be twenty times as large as those of europe iron ore is found in many parts the rocky mountain highland produces immense quantities of gold silver and copper the laurentian highland is very rich in minerals and although its resources are as yet little known it is already yielding great quantities of nickel gold and silver from the mines of northern ontario the forest wealth of the continent is immense the northern forest is providing much excellent timber and a great deal of pulpwood for making paper the trees of the western coast yield in abundance timber of the very finest quality the southern forests of the atlantic coast also contain much valuable timber no continent has a larger area of well watered deep and fertile soil the forest lands except in the far north become good farmlands when cleared the plains of the center of the continent produce great quantities of foodstuffs the farmer of North America is the most prosperous agriculturist to be found anywhere in the world. The Mississippi River and the St. Lawrence River, with the Great Lakes, form unexcelled waterways into the heart of the continent. The influence of these two great highways upon the development of trade can scarcely be overestimated. Beyond these, there are many other waterways which facilitate transportation no continent surpasses north america in variety and wealth of natural resources its people for the most part have taken full advantage of the wealth which lay close to their hands and as a result are today a very prosperous happy and progressive people we canadians have the privilege of owning almost half of this great continent this means that we are among the fortunate peoples of the world each one of us should strive to realize how great a thing it is to be a citizen of Canada. Each one of us should have a thorough knowledge of all those things which make Canada, though so young a nation, second to none either in past accomplishment or in future prospect. No other of our geographical studies is so important or nearly so interesting as the study of our own land. End of section 12《Section 13 of Ontario Public School Geography》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto — Section 13 — North America — The Dominion of Canada Position extent and people the dominion of canada comprises the northern portion of north america with the exception of greenland newfoundland and alaska it extends to the pacific ocean on the west the atlantic ocean on the east the arctic ocean on the north upon the south a long irregular boundary separates it from the united states most of the western portion of the southern boundary is in the latitude of 49 degrees north but farther east it extends as far as latitude 42 degrees north from these latitudes canada stretches northward over half a continent and far beyond into the icy wastes of the polar sea this enormous block of land contains three million six hundred eighty four thousand seven hundred and twenty three square miles an area only a trifle less than that of the whole continent of europe and considerably larger than that of australia canada ranks third in size among all the countries in the world 
being suppressed only by the Soviet republics, including those in Asia and by China. This immense country is divided into nine provinces and two territories. The provinces are grouped according to their geographical position. Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island are called the Maritime Provinces because they are closest to the Atlantic Ocean. Ontario and Quebec are known as the Central Provinces. Since Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta are situated in the great central plain of the continent, they have received the name of the Prairie Provinces. British Columbia, from its position on the Pacific seaboard, is called the Pacific Province. The Yukon Territory is named from the great river which flows through it, while the name Northwest Territories is due to the situation of these districts in the far north and west of Canada. The population of Canada is very small when compared with the vast extent of her territory. It averages over three persons to each square mile. By far the greater number of the inhabitants live in a comparatively narrow belt of land extending from coast to coast along the southern frontier and comprising less than one-third of the area of the whole country the climate of the far northern areas is so severe that the land there will never maintain a large population when britain wrestled the lowlands of the st lawrence from france the population of that district was almost wholly french since that time the descendants of the french settlers have so increased in number that now they constitute one quarter of the total population of canada most of the french-speaking people in the dominion live in the province of quebec but there are some large settlements of them in the maritime provinces ontario and the prairie provinces after the conquest of canada a stream of british immigration set in and has kept up ever since accordingly the remaining three-quarters of the population is largely of english scottish or irish descent there are nevertheless especially in the prairie provinces quite a large number of immigrants from the european nations and in recent years many citizens of the united states have crossed the border to try their fortunes in the dominion there are many chinese and japanese in british columbia and a few scattered elsewhere the indians who once roamed over the whole land are now largely gathered in the reservations and number only about one hundred and ten thousand in the north about six thousand eskimos live along the coast of the islands of the arctic surface canada may be divided into five clearly marked physical divisions each having its own special characteristics these are the acadian region the lowlands of st lawrence the laurentian highland the great central plain and the great mountain region the acadian region comprises the maritime provinces together with the southeastern part of the province of quebec this region is really the northern extremity of the appalachian highland it is a rolling country of hills and ridges of no great height in the river valleys and along the coast are many extremely fertile areas of agriculture land much of the acadian region was once heavily forested with timber trees and lumbering especially in new brunswick is still an important industry the climate moderated by the proximity of the ocean is not subject to the great extremes of temperature as in the interior of canada in the same latitude the rainfall is heavy ranging from an annual fall of sixty inches a year at halifax to about thirty five inches in western new brunswick the heavy snowfall in winter is a great aid to the lumbermen the lowlands of st lawrence valley include that part of quebec 
which is situated between the laurentian highland on the north and the appalachian mountains on the southeast and also that portion of ontario lying between lake ontario and the laurentian highland as well as the peninsula enclosed by lakes ontario erie and huron from a short distance below quebec to the lower end of lake ontario the country is almost level at the western end of lake ontario there is a sudden rise in the land forming a niagara escarpment the country north and east of the escarpment as far as georgian bay and the laurentian highway is fairly level though much rolling and hilly land is also found the country west and south of the escarpment is a broad level tableland which slopes gradually down to lakes erie and huron the whole lowland district is well watered but none of the streams and rivers is of great size with the exception of the ottawa river the soil is very fertile and easily worked some of the finest agricultural land in the world is included in this area there is a greater variation in temperature between summer and winter than in the acadian region since the lowlands are farther from the sea the laurentian highland comprises more than one half of the whole of canada this area includes all the land lying north of the lowlands of st lawrence up to and surrounding hudson bay to the east of hudson bay it constitutes the whole of the labrador peninsula south of hudson bay it extends through ontario as far as lake superior and georgian bay a spur stretches across the st lawrence river into the united states forming the thousand islands to the west its outer edge is marked by the series of lakes from the lake of the woods to the great bear lake the surface of the whole of this vast area is rough and hummocky the slopes are so gentle however that the rivers are very tortuous and winding much of the low-lying land is swampy and poorly drained the whole of the laurentian highland is dotted with countless lakes the soil is generally quite shallow and in many places the moss-covered rock forms the surface of the land in the valleys the soil is quite fertile the only considerable section of the whole highland however offering marked possibilities for agriculture is the great clay belt of northern ontario it contains millions of acres of deep rich soil as yet practically untouched by settlers the clay belt like most of the southern portion of the laurentian highland is thickly wooded in the far north on both sides of the hudson bay only grass moss lichens and a few stunted shrubs are found this part of the highland is known as the northern plain the great central plain extends from the laurentian highland on the east to the rocky mountains on the west and from the international boundary on the south to the arctic ocean on the north the plain varies from a width of eight hundred miles in the south to four hundred miles in the north the eastern portion is uniformly level in western manitoba the plain rises into a second level or steppe which is rolling country diversified by many low hills and ridges this level forms the central section of the plain the third steppe of still greater altitude forms its western part its surface is still more broken than that of the second steppe the slope of this great plain is to the east and to the north a low elevation of the land crosses the plain from east to west in about latitude fifty four degrees north dividing the central plain into two large basins the southern basin is drained by the red assiniboine and the saskatchewan rivers into lake winnipeg which in turn is drained by the nelson river into hudson bay the northern basin is drained by the churchill into hudson bay and by the peace athabasca 
and mackenzie rivers into the arctic ocean the soil of the prairie region is in general good much of it consists of rich black or chocolate loam from one to ten feet deep the southern portion of the central plain is therefore one of the finest agricultural districts in the world the climate is more severe than that of eastern canada and the rainfall is considerably less it is worth noting however that the rains come chiefly in june and july when they are most needed by the crops the great mountain region extends from the international boundary on the south to the arctic ocean on the north and from the foothills of the rockies on the east to the pacific ocean on the west the rocky mountains in the east with an average width of sixty miles and the coast range in the west with an average width of one hundred miles are the two main mountain systems between the rockies and the coast range are several other ranges often called collectively the selkirks between the selkirks and the coast range lies the interior plateau extending for five hundred miles northward from the international boundary west of coast range is another range which has been partially submerged vancouver island the queen charlotte islands and the thousands of smaller islands which fringe the coast are the projecting peaks of this western undersea range between the ranges lie many valleys drained by rapid mountain rivers one of the largest of these valleys extends along the western base of the rockies for seven hundred miles and is drained by the columbia and the fraser rivers and their tributaries the skeena and the stikeen drain the north part of british columbia into the pacific ocean the northeastern section is drained by the headwaters of the peace liard and other tributaries of the mackenzie in the extreme north the mountain area is drained by the yukon into bering sea on all these rivers navigation is much obstructed by rapids but all have navigable stretches which are of considerable value the whole of the mountain area is densely forested with the exception of the rugged mountain peaks which rise above the tree line the western slopes of the mountains are watered copiously with rain brought by the westerlies the eastern slopes are naturally drier and the growth upon them is not so luxuriant the soil of the valleys and along the flood plains at the mouths of the rivers is very fertile and some of the arable land among the mountains is unsurpassable anywhere in the dominion the climate varies both with latitude and with distance from the coast along the coast the climate is moist and balmy the winters are very mild while the summers are cool in the interior the winter is colder with rather extreme heat in summer the northern part is very cold wild animals the forests of canada are the home of wild animals of many kinds the moose is common in every part of the northern forest the woodland caribou is found from new brunswick to british columbia the virginia deer is hunted in the more southern forests of new brunswick quebec and ontario among the carnivora the cougar is still to be seen occasionally in quebec and in the rocky mountain highland the wild cat the canada lynx the wolf and the fox are found throughout the wooded regions the wolverine rare in quebec and ontario is still common in british columbia among the smaller flesh eaters the fisher the marten the weasel the ermine the mink the skunk and the otter are found everywhere in canada as far north as the forests extend the black bear is the common bear of canada the grizzly bear the most formidable animal of north america is found only in the rocky mountains two of the most important fur-bearing animals 
the beaver and the muskrat are common to all parts of the forest of the country the chief animals particular to the prairies are the gopher a boring animal which is a great pest to the farmers the prairie fox and the coyote the bison or buffalo once so plentiful is now extinct as a wild animal but thousands of them are now thriving in the national parks of western canada the northern plain also has some distinctive animals immense herds of caribou live on the coarse grass and moss of the tundra the musk ox ranges over the plain and the islands of the arctic archipelago there too are found the white wolf the arctic fox the blue fox and the polar hare the polar bear is another native of the coast and islands of the arctic ocean canada is noted for the immense number and variety of her game birds the wild ducks and geese breed in the summer time in far north and on their way south in the autumn they crowd the innumerable lakes of the country partridge and prairie chickens the latter almost entirely confined to the prairie provinces are abundant snipe plover and many other small game birds are found in great numbers rivers and lakes canada is a land of rivers and lakes to an extent unequalled by any other country in the world far more than half of all fresh water in the world is found within or on her borders about one twentieth of the entire surface of canada is water the waterways of canada were the paths followed by the early explorers and fur traders into the unknown heart of the continent today there are great avenues for transportation steamers ply on the mountain lakes of british columbia hundreds of them traverse the great lakes in the st lawrence river and even in the far north boats ply upon the mackenzie and the yukon the chief river of canada is the st lawrence which drains the great lakes to the atlantic it is the main waterway for canada's eastern commerce while the name st lawrence is applied only to the river which issues from the lower end of lake ontario we may consider the whole system of the great lakes and the st lawrence as one great river system known by different names in various parts of its course the total length of navigable waterway afforded by this vast system of lakes and rivers from the strait of bell island to port arthur is two thousand two hundred and sixty four miles almost as great a distance as that from halifax to liverpool there are many falls and rapids in the rivers of canada these although hindrances to navigation have a more than compensating value the power exerted by swiftly moving masses of water is very great for centuries men have utilized water power to turn the wheel of their mills and factories recently men have learned how water power can be transformed into electrical energy transmitted through wires for great distances and used to drive machines in factories hundreds of miles away the water powers of canada are unrivaled it is estimated that they total over twenty million horsepower at present not much more than one quarter of this amount is being developed and used yet that is enough to provide power for many factories to light whole cities and to drive the cars of many street and suburban railways the water powers of canada are one of her greatest assets and assure for her an immense industrial development resources industries and trade agriculture is the chief industry of canada grain and vegetable growing stock raising fruit farming and dairying are common to all parts of southern canada in nineteen twenty four the total value of the field crops of the whole country was almost one billion dollars in other words if the value of the farm crops 
had been divided equally among the people of canada every man woman and child in the whole dominion would have reached about one hundred dollars still millions of acres of good land are as yet untouched by the plough no other country possesses finer prospects for agricultural development the forests of canada are another great source of wealth originally all canada was covered with dense forest with the exception of the prairies and the barren lands of the north in the southern part of the country much of the forest has been cleared away by settlers much too has been destroyed by fire but enough remains to make canada one of the most important lumber producing countries hidden in the rocks beneath the soil of canada are stores of minerals whose value no man can even estimate comparatively little of canada has been thoroughly prospected yet the production of her mines is almost as great in value as that of her forests all the leading commercial metals except tin are found within her borders coal is mined in alberta nova scotia and british columbia ontario possesses nine-tenths of the known nickel supply of the world quebec leads the world in the production of asbestos copper silver and gold are found in british columbia and in ontario copper and gold are now being mined in manitoba lead is produced in british columbia natural gas and oil are found in alberta new brunswick and ontario not a year passes without valuable finds of minerals being made only a few years ago the great silver mines of colbat and the equally rich gold mines of porcupine were unknown just recently oil has been proved to exist in the mackenzie basin it is not too much to expect further discoveries in the vast unexplored regions of northern canada which will place the dominion in the first rank of mining countries of the world canada has another great source of wealth in the fish which teem in the oceans bordering her coast and in her inland waters on the east coast cod mackerel haddock herring sardines smelts and halibut as well as lobsters and oysters are taken in great quantities salmon and halibut are the most valuable fish caught on the western coast lake trout sturgeon whitefish pickerel perch and bass are all the chief food fishes found in the inland waters the waters of hudson bay are as yet untouched as canada develops this great inland sea may prove another valuable fishing ground thousands of men are employed in the fishing industry to ensure an abundant supply of fish the dominion government maintains about fifty fish hatcheries as the natural resources of the country are being gradually developed the manufacture of the raw materials is steadily increasing the list of manufactured articles is very large and varied including most articles of everyday use from thread to threshing machines from pins to pianos since canada has so great and varied a supply of raw materials as well as such splendid manufacturing facilities its trade reaches large proportions the principal exports are agricultural products particularly wheat oats vegetables fruit meat hides bacon butter cheese and eggs products of the fisheries such as fresh fish canned salmon lobsters and sardines mineral products principally gold silver nickel copper asbestos and mica forest products such as dressed lumber shingles laths wood pulp and paper and furs both raw and dressed the principal manufacturers exported are goods made from the natural resources of the dominion for example flour agricultural implements and leather goods the principal imports are goods which a northern country such as canada cannot produce for example tea coffee raw sugar rice spices 
tropical fruits, raw silk and cotton and rubber. Anthracite coal and certain articles manufactured from steel and iron are also important imports. Transportation. There are two great railway systems in Canada, the Canadian National Railways and the Canadian Pacific Railway. The total mileage of the railways in Canada is 41,024. The Canadian National Railways are owned by Canada and are operated by a president and a board of directors appointed by the Dominion government. They extend in many lines from St. John, Halifax, Sydney, and Charlottetown on the Atlantic coast to Vancouver and Prince Rupert on the shores of the Pacific. One or other of the lines serve every important city in Canada. The main southern line between Montreal and Chicago, Illinois, passes through the most densely settled and fertile parts of Ontario. The branch lines form a perfect network of railways, especially in the southern part of our own province. The total length of the Canadian National Railways in Canada is 21,880 miles. The Canadian Pacific, which is owned and operated by a private company, spans the continent from St. John, New Brunswick, to Vancouver, British Columbia. Its main line, 3,387 miles long, affords an unbroken route from ocean to ocean. The many branch lines which tap cities and towns and farming districts bring up the total length of the Canadian Pacific lines to 16,055 miles. From the Atlantic to the Pacific are frequent points of connection with the United States. In addition to the two great Canadian systems, there are a number of local railways built for the most part to open up and develop new districts. Thus, for instance, the Timiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway is of immense value in tapping of the great clay belt of Ontario for settlement. The Northern Alberta Railways serve a similar purpose. Of the 1,700 miles of electric railways now in operation in Canada, a large percentage is suburban, serving to bring the rural districts into closer touch with urban centers. The development of the water power of the provinces has had much to do with the advance of electric railways. In recent years, the great increase in motor transportation has given a strong impetus to the building of good roads. Every province of Canada has recognized the pressing need for providing highways suitable for motor traffic. Ontario, in particular, has expended great sums in this most useful work. The waterways of Canada and their great utility have already been discussed. The canals of St. Lawrence Water Route, the Sioux and Welland canals, and those of the main river, are of immense advantage to both inland and foreign trade. The facilities for ocean shipping are unsurpassed. Canada is blessed with good harbors on both the east and west coasts. Halifax and St. John on the Atlantic, Quebec, and Montreal on the River St. Lawrence, and Victoria, Vancouver, and Prince Rupert on the Pacific are unsurpassed as havens for ships. They all have railway connections with the interior of Canada, and so the products of Canada's farms forests mines and mills can be readily shipped to any port in the world both the canadian pacific and the canadian national railways have large fleets of merchant vessels which carry the product of canada to most parts of the globe many british and foreign vessels also make her harbors ports of call end of section thirteen Section 14 of Ontario Public School Geography. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. Ontario Public School Geography. By the Ontario Department of Education. Section 14. The Province of Ontario. Position, Extent, and People. The Province of Ontario, lying between Quebec on the east and Manitoba on the west, is, in respect to size, the second province in the Dominion. It is over 1,000 miles in greatest length, nearly 900 miles in its greatest width, and comprises a territory of more than 407,000 square miles, an area three and a half times as great as that of the British Isles. The eastern boundary of the province is more than 1,000 miles from the open Atlantic. The western province lies to the west of the centre of the continent. Naturally, we think of Ontario as an inland province. Yet, it has a larger coastline than many a maritime country. Along Hudson Bay and James Bay, the province touches salt water for a distance of 600 miles, while on the south, the shoreline along the Great Lakes and their connecting rivers measures at least 1,600 miles. Ontario also has a right-of-way five miles in width through Manitoba from the provincial boundary to Port Nelson. Three-quarters of the people of Ontario are of Canadian birth, largely of British ancestry. In certain sections of the province there is a considerable number of French Canadians, most of the inhabitants not born in Canada have come from the British Isles. There is a sprinkling of other nationalities as well, every country in Europe being represented to a greater or less degree. There are several large reservations for Indians within the province, with a population exceeding 27,000. Surface and Soil The whole of Ontario is a broad, rolling plain, without any prominent elevations marking its surface. From a belt of high ground, which crosses the province from east to west, to the north of Lakes Huron and Superior, the ground slopes imperceptibly to the Great Lakes on the south, and to James Bay and Hudson Bay on the north. Yet the province consists of two very different regions, Old, or Southern Ontario, comprising the lowlands along the shores of the St. Lawrence, and Lakes Ontario and Erie, and Northern Ontario, to the north of Lakes Superior and Huron. Old Ontario, the wedge-shaped portion of the province, which lies south of Lake Nipissing, between Lakes Huron, Erie, Ontario, and the Ottawa River, is one of the most beautiful and prosperous districts in the British Empire. The rolling land of fertile clay or sandy loam is in the main admirably adapted for farming, and tilled farms are found everywhere. The only surface feature of note in Old Ontario is the Niagara Escarpment which traverses the province from Queenston Heights to the western corner of Georgian Bay, close to Owen Sound. The escarpment faces toward the north and east, and is well marked throughout its length. It divides southern Ontario into two plains. The lower eastern plain lies between the escarpment and the Ottawa River. The higher western plain slopes gently down to the shores of Lake Erie and Huron, from the top of the escarpment. The western plain is so productive that it deserves its name, the Garden of Ontario. Northern Ontario is entirely within the Laurentian Highland, and exhibits the general characteristics of that highland. It is for the greater part a vast region of forests, mineral lands, lakes, and rivers. The timber supply, despite great annual cuts and heavy losses from fires, is still very large, while the amount of pulpwood available is enormous. The mines of northern Ontario are even now producing in immense quantities, although the mineral lands of the north are as yet largely unexplored or undeveloped. In addition to these resources, northern Ontario possesses one of the finest areas of virgin land in the world. This is the Great Clay Belt, to the south of James Bay. The Clay Belt is a region of 16 million acres of fine farming land, which, when cleared of its heavy growth of pine, spruce, and poplar, and brought under the plough, will easily support a population as large as the present population of the whole province. Since the whole of Ontario is a plain, with no mountains and few hills of great size, the divides, which determine the courses of the rivers, are low. The most important of these runs along the north shore of Lake Superior, at no great distance from the lake, then traverses the province to a point about forty miles north of Lake Tamagami. The Great Clay Belt lies upon the northern watershed, 
which slopes gradually toward James Bay and Hudson Bay. The St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes The St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes form one of the longest as well as most important waterways in the world, measuring 1,900 miles in length. In its course it expands into five great lakes, four of which form part of the boundary of Ontario, Lakes Superior, Huron, Erie, and Ontario. These lakes, together with Lake Michigan, contain as much fresh water as all the other lakes of the world combined. The St. Lawrence River really has its source in the headwaters of the St. Louis River. Its first and greatest expansion, Lake Superior, is 383 miles long, with an average breadth of 84 miles. This deep inland sea is subject to violent storms, which lash its waters into a fury rivaling that of the stormy North Atlantic. The shores are bold and precipitous, with cliffs of rock rising from 300 to 1,500 feet above the water. Numerous islands fringe the coast, and in their lee vessels find shelter from storms. Lake Superior receives its main water supply from Lake Nipigon, 1,450 square miles in area, through the Nipigon River. There are, however, other tributaries. Echemina Stiquia is one of the most important of these. The city of Fort William is built at its mouth. Lake Superior empties its waters into Lake Huron through the St. Mary River, 63 miles in length. The river is navigable throughout its entire course, except at one point where there is a fall of 22 feet in less than a mile. To overcome this difficulty, canals have been constructed on both the Canadian and United States side of the river. The tonnage passing through the Sioux canals during the seven to eight months of open navigation is three times as great as that through the Suez Canal in the whole year. Lake Huron is 247 miles in length, with an average breadth of 92 miles. Georgian Bay is separated from the lake proper by Bruce Peninsula and Manitoulin Island. Between Manitoulin Island and the mainland is the North Channel, a picturesque sheet of water bordered by high rocky cliffs along the north shore. In Georgian Bay the beauty of the scenery is enhanced by a great number of islands, variously estimated at 30,000 to 47,500, with which it is bordered. Several important rivers flow into the North Channel in Georgian Bay. The Spanish River passes through an important timber area, the French draining Lake Nipissing, the Severn providing an outlet for the waters of Lake Simcoe, and the Magnetowan are the chief feeders of the bay upon the east. At its southern extremity, Lake Huron narrows and discharges its waters into Lake St. Clair through the St. Clair River, 30 miles in length and navigable throughout. This lake, which is about 25 miles long and of almost equal width, is very shallow and muddy. Through it, a channel 16 feet deep and 300 feet wide is kept open by dredging. The Detroit River, 32 miles long, connects Lake St. Clair with Lake Erie. Lake Erie, the shallowest of the Great Lakes, is 241 miles long, with an average width of 41 miles. Owing to the shallow water, even a slight gale quickly raises a heavy sea, so that the lake is often very rough. The Niagara River carries the waters of Lake Erie to Lake Ontario. In its course it offers one of the grandest sights in the world, where the waters of the river plunge over the edge of the Niagara Escarpment in a sheer drop of 158 feet. Below the falls the river runs very rapidly between steep cliffs. At one place it is compressed to a width of 300 feet, between cliffs of rock 200 feet high. There the waters swirl in a seething whirlpool, with a wild beauty rivaling that of the falls themselves. At Queenston, seven miles from the mouth of the river, the waters once again become tranquil. Steamers from Lake Ontario ascend the river to this point. As navigation between Lakes Erie and Ontario is prevented by the falls, the Dominion government has constructed the Welland Ship Canal to overcome the difficulty. Lake Ontario, the smallest of the Great Lakes, is 180 miles long, with an average breadth of 42 miles. Its shores are quite low, the highest elevation being 350 feet at Scarborough Heights, not far from Toronto. The principal inlets are Burlington Bay, at the western extremity of the lake, Toronto Bay, and the Bay of Quinte at the northeastern end. 
The shores of Lake Ontario narrow as Kingston is approached, and a little below that city the St. Lawrence River proper begins. Between Gananoque and Brockville, the river passes through the labyrinth of the Thousand Islands, which by their picturesque beauty attract many visitors every summer. Below Prescott the river narrows, the stream quickens, and the water rushes fiercely down the long Sioux. Then it widens out into Lake St. Francis, down the Cedars and the Cascade Rapids, through Lake St. Louis, and past the mouth of the Ottawa, the river flows, to enter upon its headlong rush through the treacherous Lachine Rapids just above Montreal. All the rapids in its course are overcome by canals, built and maintained by the Dominion government, so that vessels can pass from Fort William on Lake Superior to Montreal, and thence to the Atlantic Ocean itself. Climate Southern Ontario, owing to its latitude and the influence of the Great Lakes, has a comparatively mild climate. The great expanses of water, which almost surround it, moderate the temperature at all seasons. Consequently, neither the summers nor the winters are so extreme as in many districts further to the south, but beyond the influence of the lakes. Farther north, upon the high land which forms the divide between the Great Lakes Basin and that of Hudson Bay, the climate is much more severe and summer frosts are not unknown. Still further north, however, the moderating influence of Hudson Bay is felt, so that in the Great Clay Belt the winters are milder than in the district further south around Lake Superior. On the whole, the summers of Ontario are delightful. There are few days when the heat is very oppressive, and the nights are usually cool. The winters are dry and exhilarating, with many days of unclouded sunny skies and clear, bracing air. As in Quebec, the heavy snowfall in northern Ontario and the frozen rivers and lakes are a great help to the lumberman. The rainfall, averaging 30 to 40 inches annually, is abundant at all seasons, but especially so in the spring and early summer, when the growing crops need it most. Agriculture Ontario is essentially an agricultural province. The fertile soil and admirable climate permit the cultivation of a great variety of crops, and farming has been the chief occupation of the people ever since the first settlers began to clear the dense forest which covered the rolling plains of southern Ontario. Much of the province is unsuited to agriculture, but there are still millions of acres of virgin land of the finest quality which await settlement. Oats, wheat, barley, corn, hay, and potatoes are the staple crops. The growing of grain and vegetables, however, is not by any means the sole occupation of the Ontario farmer. Stock raising and dairying are the backbone of the industry, and the fodder crops and much of the grain crop are fed to the stock. Ontario raises excellent horses, cattle, sheep, and swine. Within the province is produced more than half of the cheese and about one-third of the butter made in the whole of Canada. Much of the cheese is exported. Fruit growing is now an important branch of agriculture in the province. Apples are grown almost everywhere in southern Ontario, the crop in the western section being especially abundant. The great fruit growing section, however, is practically confined to the counties bordering Lake Erie and the western end of Lake Ontario. There apples, peaches, pears, plums, cherries, grapes, currants, raspberries and strawberries are cultivated with splendid results. Vegetables are also grown in great quantities in this district. Large canning factories, which handle both fruit and vegetables, are found in many centers. These prevent waste and enable the grower to find a ready market for his surplus products. Tobacco culture is a growing industry along the Lake Erie shore in the counties of Essex and Kent. Mining Ontario stands easily first among the provinces in respect to the value of mineral productions. Almost all the minerals of economic importance, with the single exception of coal, are found in Ontario. The silver mines of cobalt have proved to be exceptionally rich. Other districts, such as Gauganda, also contain promising deposits of silver, and the development of new fields gives assurance that northern Ontario will stand high among the silver-producing countries of the world for a long time to come. The gold mines at Porcupine include one of the largest in the world. Gold ores are being found in other widely separated districts in the northern section of the province, such as the Red Lake District. 
Northern Ontario is now one of the great gold mining districts of the world. Ontario ranks first among all the nickel producing countries. In fact, the nickel mines at Sudbury control the world's markets for this metal. Copper is found in the same district. In the country north of Lake Superior, and in the Rainy River district, there are extensive deposits of iron ore. It is probable that the Belcher Islands in James Bay will prove to be rich in iron. The chief works for smelting iron ore are at Sault Ste. Marie, Hamilton, and Port Colborne. Among the mineral products other than metals may be mentioned petroleum, produced in Lambton County, natural gas, which is especially abundant along the Lake Erie shore, salt, of which there are large deposits in southwestern Ontario, and stone and clay products, of which the value is increasing yearly. Lumbering The forest lands of Ontario comprise 102,000 square miles, an area more than equal to that of Great Britain. They contain great forests of red and white pine, which are valuable timber trees, as well as very large areas of spruce, balsam, fir, hemlock, jack pine, and poplar, suitable for pulpwood. Besides these, there are many other varieties of valuable trees, oak, beech, maple, elm, basswood, and cedar are fairly abundant, especially in the woodlots which still dot the farms of old Ontario. The most important lumbering districts are on the upper Ottawa, to the west of Lake Superior, and to the north of Georgian Bay. The rivers of these areas are of great advantage to the lumbermen in floating the logs to the sawmills, which are located at various points. One of the largest newsprint mills in the world is in operation at Iroquois Falls, and many other pulp and paper mills, such as those at Capus Casing, Sault Ste. Marie, Dryden, Fort William, Port Arthur, Fort Francis, and Espanola are scattered along the southern border of northern Ontario. Much timber has been destroyed in the past by forest fires and careless methods of lumbering. Fire rangers, however, now patrol the forests during the summer and autumn. Many splendid areas, totaling about 23,850 square miles, have been set apart by the government as forest reserves. Fisheries the freshwater fisheries of the province, which include the Great Lakes, Lake Nipissing, Lake Nipigon, and Lake of the Woods, are very valuable. Whitefish, trout, pickerel, and lake herring are the principal varieties sought by fishermen, but the catch includes pike, sturgeon, eels, perch, catfish, carp, and other coarse fish. Transportation Southern Ontario has a perfect network of railways, and Northern Ontario is being rapidly opened up by new lines. A line of the Canadian National Railways traverses Southern Ontario from end to end, and there are numerous branches running in many directions. The main line of the Canadian Pacific passes up the Ottawa Valley to Mattawa, and thence westward across the whole province. From Sudbury a branch line runs to Sault Ste. Marie. Another line passes through Toronto from Montreal to Windsor. A direct line also runs from Toronto to Sudbury, giving connection with Winnipeg and the western provinces. From these trunk lines radiate many branch lines. The Canadian National Railways traverse Ontario on their way from Montreal to Winnipeg. There is direct communication by these lines between Toronto and Winnipeg, and Toronto and Ottawa, in addition to various other branch lines. Another national line, on its way from the Maritime Provinces to Winnipeg, passes through the province upon the northern slope of the Hudson Bay Divide and helps to open up the clay belt for settlement. A branch connects the main line with Port Arthur. The Timiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway, owned and operated by the provincial government, runs from North Bay to Moose Factory on James Bay. Several United States railways, such as the Michigan Central and the Per Marquette, also enter the province from the south. The main waterway of the province is formed by the Great Lakes, with their connecting rivers. During the summer months, many lines of steamers, both freight and passenger, are in operation. Many steamers are engaged in carrying grain from Fort William and Port Arthur down to various lake ports or to Montreal. Ore steamers and boats carrying general freight help to swell the numbers of the Great Lakes fleet. Regular passenger liners run from Sarnia, Owen Sound, and Port McNichol to Fort William and Port Arthur. 
Magnificent steamers handle the tourist traffic between Hamilton, Toronto, Kingston, and Montreal, and the lower St. Lawrence. In addition to the canals of the St. Lawrence and Great Lakes route, there are two important canals in Ontario. The Rideau Canal connects Ottawa with Kingston by a much shorter route than that down the Ottawa River and up the St. Lawrence to Lake Ontario. The Trent Valley Canal, from Trenton through the Kawartha Lakes to Georgian Bay, provides a shortcut through the heart of the province from Lake Ontario to Georgian Bay. Besides these long canals, the Murray Canal, only a trifle over five miles long, separates the peninsula of Prince Edward County from the mainland, greatly shortening the distance into the Bay of Quinte for vessels coming from the west. Manufactures Ontario is fortunate in not being dependent upon coal alone to turn the wheels of her factories. Close to the great industrial section of the province is Niagara Falls, where electric power is generated. All over the province are many falls and rivers which are being used for a similar purpose. Blessed with an abundance of raw materials from field, forest and mine, with unsurpassed transportation facilities, and with this cheap and widely distributed power, Ontario is well equipped for manufacturing. There are about 10,000 factories in operation. Almost every village has its manufacturing plant of some size and importance. Nearly every class of goods on the Canadian market is manufactured within the province. The chief are iron and steel products, electrical apparatus, agricultural implements, automobiles, food products, flour, oatmeal, canned goods and meat products, textiles and clothing, leather goods, shoes, pulp and paper, brick, cement, and glass and wood products of all kinds. Summer Resorts Ontario offers not only profitable work of many kinds to its inhabitants, but also unequalled facilities for rest and sport. The delightful climate, the numerous lakes and rivers with their splendid fishing, and the beautiful scenery of many parts of the province make them ideal spots in which to spend vacations. The Georgian Bay and Muskoka districts, Lake Tomogamy, the Kawartha Lakes, the Thousand Islands, and Lake of the Woods are favoured resorts, not only for the people of Ontario, but also for thousands of tourists from the United States. The smaller towns on the shores of Lakes Ontario, Erie, and Huron also attract summer visitors. Niagara Falls ranks high among the famous beauty spots of the world. In addition to the privately owned summer resorts of Ontario, there is the Algonquin National Park set aside by the provincial government for the free use of the public. This great tract of 2,000 square miles presents all the native beauty of a Canadian Northland forest, unmarred by the hand of man. Its enchanting lakes and streams teem with bass and trout. The forests are alive with moose, deer, and beaver, while thousands of wildfowl and other birds nest within its confines. No one is permitted to shoot within the limits of the park, and only enough fish to supply needed food may be caught. Other Ontario reservations are the Rondeau Provincial Park and the Quetico Provincial Park. There are also several parks which are set aside by the Dominion Government, Point Pelee, Thousand Islands, and Georgian Bay Islands National Parks. Cities and Towns Toronto, situated on a spacious harbour of Lake Ontario, is the capital of the province. It is the largest city of Ontario, and the second in size in the Dominion. The city is noted for its splendid residential sections of well-built homes, spacious lawns, and fine old trees. There are many public parks which add greatly to the beauty of the city. In Queen's Park stand the legislative buildings, close to the grounds and splendid buildings of the University of Toronto and its affiliated colleges. The business of the city is large and varied as its situation and unsurpassed transportation facilities make it a great distributing centre. Toronto is the headquarters of the eastern section of the National Railways. Its industries include foundries, clothing and whiteware industries, meat packing establishments, implement factories, railway shops, and many others equally important. The city is the centre of the radio industry of the British Empire. Hamilton is the second city of the province. It is beautifully situated on a magnificent landlocked harbour at the western extremity of Lake Ontario. Behind the city rises the Niagara Escarpment, which there closely approaches the lake. Surrounding the city is one of the finest fruit districts in North America. Hamilton is essentially a manufacturing city. 
There are several huge industrial plants and a host of smaller ones. The chief manufactures include iron and steel products of all kinds, agricultural implements, machinery, electrical apparatus, cotton fabrics, boots and shoes, clothing, building materials such as brick, lumber and roofing, and furniture. The city is the seat of McMaster University. Ottawa, the third city of the province, and the capital of the Dominion of Canada, has a population only slightly less than that of Hamilton. It is picturesquely situated on a cluster of hills overlooking the Ottawa River. The Dominion Parliament buildings and government offices give an air of dignity to the city, and millions of dollars have been spent in improving its parks, driveways, and general appearance. Ottawa University is located there. The chief industry of the city is the lumber trade. The Chaudière Falls on the Ottawa River, between Ottawa and Hull, provide electricity to run the street railways and to light the streets of both cities, as well as to drive the machinery of the factories that cluster along the banks of the river. London, on the Thames River, is situated midway between Toronto and Detroit. Its situation in a fine agricultural district and its good railway facilities make it an important distributing centre. It is a city of many and varied industries. Many people are employed in making stoves and furnaces, boilers, boots and shoes, hosiery, ready-to-wear garments, biscuits, and confectionery. The University of Western Ontario is situated there. Windsor, on the Detroit River, is a thriving city with many flourishing industries, including those connected with the manufacture of tobacco, salt, automobiles and automobile accessories, and wire fencing. The city is connected with Detroit by a railway tunnel, and also by a passenger tunnel a mile in length from portal to portal. The city of East Windsor owes its importance chiefly to the automobile industry. The separate municipalities of Sandwich, Walkerville, and Ojibwe form a continuous city with Windsor and East Windsor, and the whole group is known locally as the border cities. Brantford, on the Grand River, is the centre of a prosperous agricultural country. Its manufactures, mainly agricultural implements, machinery, stoves, carriages, and woolens, add to its commercial importance. The Provincial Institution for the Blind is situated in this city. Kingston, situated near the eastern end of Lake Ontario, is the seat of Queen's University and the Royal Military College. The industries of the city include the manufacture of locomotives and leather goods. A short distance away is one of the Dominion government penitentiaries. Peterborough is situated on the Autonomy River, which provides electrical power for many factories. Its manufactures include electrical appliances, woolens, cereal foods, and packed meat. St. Catharines and Niagara Falls are distributing centres for the productive agricultural district of the Niagara Peninsula. Both have several large industries which increase their importance. Fruit canning, wine manufacture, paper making, and the manufacture of edge tools give employment to many people in St. Catharines. Niagara Falls, besides being a famous tourist resort, is also the centre for the power plants which are harnessing the Niagara River for the benefit of the province. At Welland, on the Welland Canal, is a large ferro-alloy plant with eight electric furnaces. Kitchener, Galt, Guelph, Woodstock, and Stratford are busy cities in the heart of the Lake Peninsula. All produce a large output of manufactured goods of many kinds. At Guelph is located the Ontario Agricultural College and Experimental Farm. The district around Woodstock is noted for its dairy products, and a great quantity of butter and cheese is shipped from this city. In Stratford are large railway shops belonging to the Canadian National Railways. St. Thomas and Chatham serve as distributing and marketing centres for the counties bordering upon the western part of the Lake Erie shore. The Michigan Central Railway maintains large construction and repair shops in St. Thomas. Chatham is situated at the head of navigation on the Thames River and enjoys the advantages of being a lake port. Both cities have large manufacturing plants which contribute to their prosperity. Belleville on the Bay of Quinte, Sarnia on the St. Clair River, and Owen Sound on Georgian Bay are lake ports of importance. At Belleville is located the Provincial School for the Deaf. At Sarnia is the St. Clair Tunnel, which connects the railway systems of Ontario and Michigan. Owen Sound has one of the finest harbours on the Upper Lakes. 
These three cities are manufacturing and distributing centers, as is also Oshawa on Lake Ontario. This last city is a noted center for the manufacture of automobiles. In fact, Oshawa takes third place among the manufacturing cities of Ontario. Cornwall and Brockville on the St. Lawrence River and Smith's Falls, an important railway junction, are among the larger manufacturing towns of eastern Ontario. Goderich on Lake Huron and Collingwood and Port McNichol on Georgian Bay are all busy lake ports. Barry and Aurelia on Lake Simcoe, and Lindsay on the Scugog River are thriving towns in the centre of southern Ontario. In northern Ontario, the twin cities of Fort William and Port Arthur are of prime importance. They are situated on Thunder Bay, at the head of Canadian navigation on Lake Superior. Fort William is the lake terminus of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Both cities are terminal points for lines of the Canadian National Railways. They have immense elevators for handling the grain from the western provinces. Both cities are well supplied with electric power and are making rapid progress in manufacturing. The city of Sault Ste. Marie on the St. Mary River is a hive of industry. Cheap power is provided by the river. The ore in the neighborhood furnishes raw material for its large iron and steel plants, while the supply of spruce for its pulp mills is almost inexhaustible. North Bay, on Lake Nipissing, is an important railway junction. It is the gateway to the North Country. Sudbury, Cobalt, and Timmins are mining towns of northern Ontario. Kenora, far in the west of the province, is a thriving town on the shore of the beautiful Lake of the Woods. Cochrane, at the junction of Timiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway, with one of the lines of the Canadian National Railways, is the centre of the fertile clay belt. It already numbers some thousands of inhabitants and is supplied with electric light and power. End of section 14. Section 15 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 15. North America. The Province of Quebec. Position, Extent, and People. The province of Quebec lies along both banks of the St. Lawrence River for almost its entire length. To the south, Quebec borders upon New Brunswick, the United States, and Ontario, and stretches northward as far as Hudson Strait. To the east, the coast of Labrador separates it from the Atlantic. To the west are the province of Ontario and Hudson Bay. From east to west, it extends for a distance of over 1,000 miles. From north to south, for about 1,200 miles. It is the largest province of Canada, being over 590,000 square miles in extent. It is about five times as large as England, Scotland, and Ireland together. About four-fifths of the population of Quebec are descendants of the original French settlers and speak French as their native tongue. The remaining fifth, chiefly of British descent, are found principally in the cities and in the eastern townships. Surface and Soil The province of Quebec falls naturally into three well-marked areas. The northern, or Laurentian area, comprising by far the greater part of the province. The valley of the St. Lawrence, extending along the river from the city of Montreal to the western extremity of the province. And the Appalachian area, in the southeastern corner of the province. The Great Laurentian Tableland of Quebec extends from Hudson Strait and Ungava Bay southward and eastward to a varying but never great distance from the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the St. Lawrence River. The southern edge of the tableland closely follows the north shore of the Gulf, the estuary, and the river St. Lawrence, from the Strait of Belle Isle to within 20 miles of the city of Quebec. There it runs away from the river, but still follows its general course at a varying distance until it meets the Ottawa River about halfway between the cities of Ottawa and Montreal. Much of its great tableland is yet unsurveyed. It is a rolling land of rounded hills and gentle valleys, with lakes and streams beyond all counting. The forest covers it from the southern edge of the latitude of Ungava Bay, 
where the northern plain begins. The lakes along the southern border are the sources of numbers of unfailing streams, which, flowing over the edge of the highland in rapids and cascades, provide enormous water power for the valley to the south. To the south of the St. Lawrence, a spur of the Appalachian Mountains enters Quebec, east of Lake Champlain, and extends to the northeast, right to the tip of Gaspé Peninsula. These are the Notre Dame Mountains. Southeast of this range is the rolling country of the section known as the Eastern Townships, where is found some of the best farming and grazing land in Canada. Bounded by the Laurentian Highland on the north and the Notre Dame Mountains on the south, lies the plain of the St. Lawrence Valley. The whole of the plain is splendid agricultural land, with a deep, rich soil of clay and sand. The greater part of it is laid out in well-tilled farms and is dotted with thriving towns and cities. Rivers The mighty St. Lawrence, the chief river of Canada and one of the great rivers of the world, is of incalculable value, not only to Quebec, but also to the whole country. Unlike the Orinoco, the Nile, or the Mississippi, it does not lose itself in a vast alluvial delta. Its banks are clear-cut to the ocean's edge, and a broad, deep channel extends from its mouth into the heart of the Atlantic. Above Quebec, its average width is two miles. Below that city, it rapidly widens. At the Saguenay, it is 20 miles wide. At Matain, 30 miles. And at Anticosti Island, 100 miles. Its link from Anticosti Island to Lake Ontario is 680 miles. The largest ocean steamers ascend the river to Montreal, almost 1,000 miles inland from the Strait of Belle Isle. No other country has its greatest seaport at so great a distance from the open ocean. The only tributary of any size falling into the St. Lawrence on the south bank is the Richelieu River, which drains Lake Champlain into the St. Lawrence. This river was the route taken in the old days by the French soldiers and their Indian allies for their forays against the English colonies to the south. Today, boats on peaceful errands pass through it to Lake Champlain and thence down the Hudson River to New York and the United States. The Ottawa River, the chief tributary of the St. Lawrence, drains an area of 80,000 square miles in the provinces of Quebec and Ontario. After flowing for 600 miles, marking throughout a great part of its course the boundary between the two provinces, it empties into the St. Lawrence by four mouths, forming several islands, of which the most important is the island of Montreal. With the help of two small canals, the Ottawa is navigable from Montreal to Ottawa. Here, the Chaudière Falls form an impassable barrier, although steamers ply on the upper reaches of the river. The waters of the Ottawa, like those of all the rivers flowing from the Laurentian Highland, are dark in color. The water poured into the St. Lawrence does not mix with the bright waters drawn by that river from the great settling basins of the Great Lakes, but flows on a separate current readily distinguishable from that of the main stream from the mouth of the Ottawa to the sea. The Saguenay River is the outlet for the waters of beautiful Lake St. John. It is a dark, gloomy stream flowing between walls of rock approaching close to the river on either side. The scenery is magnificent. The water power on the river is enormous and is being rapidly developed. The St. Maurice River drains the country lying between the basins of the Ottawa and the Sanguinay. The Shawinigan Falls are among the finest in Canada. Electric power derived from them serves Montreal in its vicinity. The falls of the Montmorency River, six miles distant from the city of Quebec, is another of the beauty spots of the Dominion. The river leaps over a sheer precipice 250 feet high. Climate the climate of Quebec is extremely varied, as indeed must be the case in a province of such great extent. In the valley of the St. Lawrence, the summers are hot. Below Quebec, the summers are moderated by proximity to the cold waters of the Gulf. And in this area, spring is later than it is farther to the southwest. All over the province, the winters are cold, with a heavy snowfall. For about five months of the year, the St. Lawrence River is ice-bound. During the winter, the farmers of the province use the frozen lakes and rivers as highways for the transport of their produce to market. The heavy snowfall aids lumbering greatly. Agriculture Quebec is one of the great agricultural provinces of Canada. Hay, oats, potatoes, turnips, and wheat are the most valuable crops, but corn, barley, buckwheat, beans, peas, and rye are also largely grown. 
Dairy products are a very important item in the total farm production, and stock raising is a growing industry. Apples, plums, and melons are the chief fruits grown. Quebec is the banner maple sugar province of the Dominion. Almost every farm has its maple sugar bush. Lumbering, the timber trade follows agriculture in importance. In the north, the predominant trees are pine, spruce, and fir, while farther south are maple, oak, elm, and other hardwoods. Much of the timber cut in the north is made into pulp and subsequently into paper. There are large pulp and paper mills at many points in the province. The greater part of the timber cut is exported to the United States, Great Britain, France, and South America. Only a very small part of the immense forest area of the province has been touched, so that the industries which depend upon the forest are assured of an abundant supply of raw material for many years to come. Large areas containing in all over 8,200 square miles have been set aside by the provincial government as forest reserves. Thus, giving further assurance that the lumber supply will not soon be exhausted. Mining, the mineral resources of Quebec are as yet little known. The whole extent of the Laurentian Highland may yet prove rich in minerals, and already the little explored district northeast of Lake Saint John has given evidence of rich deposits of many kind. At present, the most valuable commercial mineral is asbestos, with which Quebec practically supplies the whole world. Copper, iron. Mica, molybdenite, and graphite are also mined. Valuable copper and other ore deposits are now being developed at Reen, in the northern part of the province near the border of Ontario. Cement and phosphate of lime, a valuable fertilizer, are produced in large quantities. Fishing, fishing is an important industry along the shores of the Saint Lawrence and in the Gulf. In many cases, the habitants along the Saint Lawrence River combine fishing with farming. The chief fish caught are salmon, cod, herring, and mackerel. Manufacturing, Quebec ranks second only to Ontario in the amount and value of its manufactures. The abundance of water power almost everywhere in the province compensates for the absence of coal. The chief manufactures are sugar, woolen and cotton goods, boots and shoes, pulp and paper, tobacco and cigars, furs and hats, machinery, railway cars, musical instruments. Cutlery, rifles, and gunpowder. Cities and towns. Quebec, the provincial capital, is perhaps the most interesting of all Canadian cities, and certainly is the most picturesque. Upon the bold and precipitous height of Cape Diamond, crowned with the ancient citadel of Quebec, is built the upper town, while the lower town, the older portion of the city, spreads over the base of the promontory. In the steep and narrow streets of the lower town are still to be seen the old stone houses built before General Wolfe upon the plains of Abraham into the dominion of France in the New World. The modern city contains many splendid buildings, among which may be mentioned the legislative buildings, the courthouse, the city hall, and the imposing structures of Laval University. The harbor of Quebec is large enough to hold a navy and deep enough to float the largest vessels built. The city is the headquarters for the export of timber. The Montmorency Falls provide electricity for the city's use. The manufactures are varied and important, including leather goods, lumber, boots and shoes, furs, and tobacco. Across the Saint Lawrence from Quebec is Levy, which has a large dry dock. Not far distant on the north bank of the Saint Lawrence is the celebrated shrine of Saint Anne de Beaupré, which is yearly visited by thousands of pilgrims. A short distance above the city, the Saint Lawrence is spanned by the Quebec Bridge. A monument to the skill of Canadian engineers. The difficulties of building so huge a structure over the broad and steep Saint Lawrence were very great. The completion of the bridge in 1918 marked the accomplishment of one of the greatest engineering feats ever attempted. Montreal, the largest city in the Dominion, owes its greatness to its admirable position. It is situated far inland, so that it serves as a distributing center for great area of surrounding country. At the same time, it is at the head of summer navigation for the larger ocean vessels, and through it passes the major portion of Canada's overseas imports and exports. Furthermore, it is surrounded by one of the finest agricultural districts in the Dominion, and this contributes materially to the prosperity of the city. The city is built upon the east side of Montreal Island, which lies in the Saint Lawrence, at its confluence with the Ottawa River. This small island, only 32 miles long by 11 miles wide. Is one of the most important in the world. Upon it live over 12 million people. The city stretches for miles along the riverfront, 
while behind it rises the beautiful Mont Royal, a fitting background for a noble city. The buildings are largely of limestone quarried from Mont Royal, and these enhance the appearance of solid prosperity, which characterizes the city. The harbor of Mont Royal is well provided with docks and with facilities for the handling of incoming and outgoing products. Mont Royal is not only the commercial center, but it is also one of the chief manufacturing cities of the Dominion. The principal car shops of the Canadian National and Canadian Pacific Railways are located there. The city is also the educational center of the province, being the home of McGill University and the University of Montreal. Its public buildings include many churches, monuments, hospitals, and charitable institutions. At Saint Anne de Bellevue, near the city, is Macdonald College, one of the best equipped agricultural colleges in Canada. Westmount, lying side by side with Montreal, is peculiarly a residential city. Hull is built upon the north bank of the Ottawa River, opposite the city of Ottawa, with which it is connected by three bridges. Its inhabitants are employed mainly in manufacturing wood products such as lumber, wood pulp, paper, woodenware, and matches. Sherbrooke, the chief city of the eastern townships, rivals Hull as an industrial center. Its cotton and woolen mills and its machine shop are operated by power obtained from the Saint Francis River. They are among the largest and best in Canada. Drummondville, the center of the Quebec silk industry, Arvida, with a huge aluminum plant, Verdun, Three Rivers, Lachine, Saint Hyacinth, Valleyfield, Grand Mer, and Shawnigan Falls are among the towns which contribute to Quebec's manufacturing output. This has been steadily increasing as the natural resources of the province and its magnificent water powers have been gradually developed. So great are these resources that a splendid industrial future may be confidently predicted for the province, which historically, at least, is the core of the Dominion. End of section 15. Section 16 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 16. North America. The Province of New Brunswick. Position, Extent, and People. The province of New Brunswick lies between the state of Maine on the west and the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Northumberland Straits on the east, and between Quebec and Chalier Bay on the north and the Bay of Fundy on the south. Within these limits lies a block of land, almost square in shape, measuring about 200 miles either from north to south or from east to west. The total area of New Brunswick is nearly 28,000 square miles making it the largest of the maritime provinces. The Isthmus of Chignecto connects the province with Nova Scotia. The population of New Brunswick is about one-ninth as large as that of Ontario. About a quarter of the inhabitants are of French descent. The remainder, with the exception of about 1,300 Indians in the northern districts, are of purely British ancestry or birth. Coastline The coastline along the Bay of Fundy though rugged, is much lower than the Nova Scotia coast across the bay. There, in many excellent harbors, of which the best are those of St. John and St. Andrews, the Gulf of St. Lawrence shore is also well supplied with harbors. Chalier Bay is everywhere navigable, and has not a rock, reef, or shoal over its entire extent. Surface and Soil New Brunswick is a province of rolling plains. The only hills of considerable size are found in the wild and broken country about the watershed which separates the rivers flowing into the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the headwaters of the St. John and Restigouche rivers. The whole surface of the province was originally covered with one vast unbroken forest, and even yet the greater part so remains. About one quarter of the total area of the province consists of bogs, heath, barren rocky tracts, and swamps incapable of cultivation. The remainder consists of good arable land, the alluvial lands of the river valleys, and the low-lying marshlands at the head of the Bay of Fundy are extremely fertile. Rivers New Brunswick is the best watered country in the world, containing an unusual number of rivers which terminate at their mouths in estuaries, forming good harbors. 
the rivers in general have cut wide valleys which consist of low alluvial lands usually flooded in spring the valleys are clothed with hardwoods the land when cleared is very rich and easily worked the chief river of the province is the st john a noble stream draining half the province it is navigable for large steamers as far as fredericton eighty four miles from its mouth and for smaller steamers as far as woodstock sixty miles farther up the country traversed by the st john is notable for its productiveness and its scenic beauty next in importance to the st john is the miramichi which drains the whole central section of the province its mouth forms an excellent harbor upon which are built the thriving towns of newcastle and chatham the rest of coach forms part of the boundary between new brunswick and quebec in a land where every stream and river teems with fish the rest of coach takes first place as a trout and salmon stream the petticodiac is famous for its tidal bore which as far up the river as moncton reaches a height of from four to six feet the st croix forms part of the boundary between new brunswick and the state of maine climate the climate of new brunswick is healthful and invigorating although the sea is on three sides of the province the air is not so humid as might be expected and the heat and cold are not so trying as in moisture climates the snowfall is heavy and greatly facilitates lumbering the warm but not necessarily hot summers favor the rapid growth of vegetation and permit the successful cultivation of all fruits and cereals of the temperate zone agriculture the principal crops grown are wheat oats hay buckwheat and root crops of these potatoes hay and clover and oats are the staples new brunswick potatoes are especially good and find a ready market in the west indies the new england states and the central provinces of canada the meadows and pasture lands of the province are an incentive to stock raising and dairying fruit culture though as yet in its infancy is progressing the st john valley is now producing excellent apples and strawberries raspberries and the small fruits generally do well there within recent years fox farms have been established and the rearing of black foxes and other fur-bearing animals for their pelts is proving profitable fishing the coastline of new brunswick six hundred miles long and well provided with harbors offers splendid facilities for the development of sea fisheries the principal fish caught are cod herring haddock salmon and shad it is worth noting that the province has the only sardine canneries in canada mining new brunswick is known to be rich in minerals but the dense forest growth over much of its area has hindered prospecting and mining only three mining industries are as yet upon a commercial basis coal mining gypsum quarrying and stone quarrying coal is found in many districts and lies quite close to the surface gypsum is mined in considerable quantities there are large stone quarries on the miramichi producing such excellent stone that it has been used for the erection of many of the public buildings at ottawa and elsewhere beyond the borders of the province lumbering the forest lands of new brunswick produce timber of many kinds principally spruce fir pine birch cedar maple beech and hemlock the manufacture of these woods into sawn lumber lathes shingles pulpwood poles and railroad ties requires a large number of mills much of the output is exported to great britain and the united states the rivers of the province play an important part in the lumber industry manufacturing in addition to the sawmills and pulp mills of the province which employ thousands of men and are the outstanding manufacturing establishments there are many other industrial plants of various kinds among the most important of these are the sugar refineries at st john cotton mills at st john moncton and marysville boot and shoe factories at fredericton stove foundries at sackville fish and lobster canneries at chatham and many woodworking and furniture factories in the various towns of the province the province possesses excellent water powers which await only development to give an additional impetus to the growth of manufacturing the grand falls on the st john river about two hundred and twenty five miles from its mouth are the most valuable source of electric power in the province cities and towns fredericton the capital of the province is built up on the st john river eighty four miles from its mouth it is the seat of the government the commercial center of the interior in an important lumber and manufacturing place in the city are the legislative buildings and the university of new brunswick 
Fredericton has excellent railway facilities, lines branching out from it to every part of the province. The harbor of St. John is deep, sheltered, and free from ice at all seasons. The city possesses wharf and elevator factories and has a large number of factories. It has rail connection with every part of the North American continent and steamship communication with almost every port of the world. The magnificent dry dock is the largest in the world. Just north of the city are the famous reversing falls of the St. John River. Moncton, the second city of the province in size, is situated on the Petticodiac River. This city is the Atlantic headquarters of the Canadian National Railways. It has large textile mills and many other important industries. Chatham, on the Miramichi River, is the center of the lumber and fishing industries. Dalhousie, at the head of Chalier Bay, has a good harbor and is a shipping port for the lumber floated down the rest of Goch. It is also a well-known summer resort. St. Stephen, on the St. Croix River, has large lumbering interests, and Milltown, adjoining it, is noted for its colored cottons. Marysville has one of the largest cotton mills in Canada. End of section 16section 17 of ontario public school geography this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano ontario public school geography by the educational book company of toronto section 17 north america the province of nova scotia position extent and people the province of nova scotia consists of two distinct sections the peninsula of nova scotia proper and the island of cape breton the peninsula is about two hundred and seventy miles long and varies from sixty to one hundred miles in width the island is a little over a hundred miles long and of very irregular breadth the total area of the province is well over twenty one thousand square miles it is the smallest of all the provinces except prince edward island the great number of the inhabitants of Nova Scotia are of Canadian birth and of British ancestry. There are also in the province many descendants of the original French settlers. About 2,000 Mi'kmaq Indians still remain, but few of them are pure-blooded Indians. The total population is over half a million. Coastline Except for the Isthmus of Chignecto, only 12 miles wide at its narrowest point, the province is surrounded on all sides by salt water. To the north and west are the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Bay of Fundy. To the south and east is the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic coast is low and rocky, and studded with many rocky islets. It is very irregular, and there are many good harbors, some of which are capable of sheltering the largest ocean vessels. The coast of the Bay of Fundy is bordered by a cliff several hundred feet high, which is almost unbroken save for a few long inlets, such as Annapolis Basin and Minas Basin. The northern coast is low and has several harbors. The best of these is that of Pictou. Lying to the southeast of Nova Scotia, about 110 miles distant, is Sable Island, a sandbar very dangerous to navigation. The Dominion government maintains life-saving stations there. Surface and Soil Nova Scotia is divided into two nearly equal parts by a range of hills running through the entire length of the peninsula. The part sloping toward the Atlantic is in generally rocky and barren, dotted with many lakes and intersected by numerous streams. The whole area is forested and is a sportsman's paradise. Moose, caribou, and bears are to be found, while foxes, otters, and minks are fairly common. Partridges, snipe, and woodcocks are plentiful, and wild geese and ducks frequent the lakes and the bays. The only agricultural land is found along the river valleys. The northern slope toward the Bay of Fundy and the Gulf of St. Lawrence is quite different. There are ranges of hills, covered with beech, maple, and other hardwoods, running parallel to the coastline. Both hills and valleys are covered with deep, rich soil, and, when cleared, make fine farms. There are broad flats around the head of the Bay of Fundy, which, when diked, produce enormous crops of hay. These meadows require no fertilizing to maintain their productive power. The deep strait of Canso separates the peninsula from Cape Breton Island. The surface of the southern part of the island is low and level, but the northern part is rugged and mountainous. A canal leads from the open sea into the beautiful Bras d'Or Lake in the interior of the island. Rivers 
Owing to the narrowness of the peninsula, the rivers of Nova Scotia are small. They are, however, very numerous and provide the province with water power. Many are tidal rivers, in which the influence of the tide is visible right to their head waters. When the tide is out, nothing remains of these rivers but an expanse of smooth red mud. Climate The climate of the province is healthful and invigorating, despite the fogs which are prevalent at certain seasons along the Atlantic coast. The rainfall is abundant, averaging about 44 inches a year. Fishing we have already read about the fishermen and fisheries of Nova Scotia. The principal fish caught are cod, haddock, herring, and mackerel. Lobsters are trapped along the coast. Most of the codfish are dried. The haddock and other fish reach the inland cities of Canada, either fresh or smoked. Agriculture The climate and soil of Nova Scotia are suited to the cultivation of fruits and cereals. The apple is the king of fruits in the province. The famous Annapolis Valley, nearly 100 miles long, lies between a range of hills bordering the southeastern shore of the Bay of Fundy and the central ridge of the province. Here the early French immigrants planted apple orchards and laid the foundation of a great industry, which now yields annually about two million barrels of choice apples. Great Britain takes the larger part of the crop. Peaches, plums, pears, and cherries are also grown. Oats take the leading place among the cereals, closely followed by wheat, barley, and buckwheat. Potatoes and root crops generally do well. The abundance of hay from the tidal meadows encouraged stock breeding and dairying. Mining Nova Scotia contains much mineral wealth. Coal fields are worked in Cumberland and Pictou counties. More important are the Cape Breton mines, which produce three quarters of the output of the province. Iron ore is little mined, but is easily brought from Newfoundland, so that the manufacture of iron and steel is one of the leading industries of the province. Other minerals of less importance are also found. Gypsum, used as a fertilizer, and as the raw material for the manufacture of plaster of Paris, is mined in Cape Breton Island, in near Minas Basin. Sandstone and granite are also quarried. Lumbering More than half of the total area of Nova Scotia consists of good forest land, containing tamarack, spruce, and fir, as well as hardwoods, such as ash, beech, birch, and maple. Much of the annual cut is exported to Great Britain, the United States, the West Indies, and South America. Manufacturing the manufacturing establishments of the province include sugar and oil refineries, textile and boot and shoe factories, tanneries, pulp and paper mills, machine shops, and factories for agricultural implements. The steel works of Sydney and New Glasgow are the most important. Cities and towns Halifax, the capital and chief city of the province, is built upon a fortified hill which projects into a fine natural harbor 14 miles long. Across the mouth of the harbor lies McNab Island, also heavily fortified. The harbor is free from ice at all seasons. Halifax is an important naval center and is often visited by the cruisers of the North Atlantic Fleet. From this port there is a large export trade in fish, lumber, and agricultural products. Among its many factories are manufacturing establishments for agricultural implements, woolens, cottons, and chocolate. It contains the provincial legislative buildings, Dalhousie University, the Nova Scotia Technical College, and the Provincial Institutions for the Blind and for the Deaf. Public gardens are the admiration of all visitors to the city. Across the harbor from Halifax is Dartmouth, a prosperous manufacturing town. Sydney ranks next in importance to Halifax. It is built on one of the finest harbors in Canada, and has large steelworks. Nearby are the extensive coal fields. Other coal mining centers are Glace Bay, Sydney Mines, New Glasgow, and North Sydney. Amherst is a busy industrial center. Pictou has considerable shipping trade. Yarmouth is important because of its shipping trade. Digby is a seaport town with large fishing interests. Lunenburg is a fishing port, sending out 150 vessels to the cod fisheries on the banks. Truro is picturesquely situated at the head of Gobequid Bay in the midst of a fine agricultural country. The Provincial Normal School and the Provincial Agricultural College are both located here. End of section 17. Section 18 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. 
Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 18. North America. The Province of Prince Edward Island. Position, Extent, and People. Prince Edward Island, a crescent-shaped island lying close to the two other maritime provinces in the southern part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, is the smallest province in the Dominion. Its total area is only 2,184 square miles. The province is the most densely populated part of the Dominion. About 89,000 people live there, about 41 to the square mile. Almost all are of a Canadian birth and either of British or of French ancestry. There are also a few Mi'kmaq Indians. Coastline, Surface, and Soil The island is very irregular in outline, as the land is penetrated by deep bays and inlets. Everywhere the coast is low, and upon the north it is bordered by sand beaches and dunes. The surface is an undulating plain. In the central part, however, there are many picturesque wooded hills, but in no case do these rise to the height of more than 500 feet. The island is well watered, but the streams are small and are all tidal. The soil is a rich sandy loam of a peculiar deep red color. The red soil, contrasting with the vivid green of the vegetation, gives a very distinctive character to the landscape. Climate The proximity of the sea to every part of Prince Edward Island moderates considerably the heat of the summer and the cold of the winter. The air is bracing and healthful. The delightful summer climate brings many visitors who find additional attraction in the excellent bathing beaches of the northern shore. Industries Nearly the whole surface of the island is tilled, and the fertile soil, made still more productive by the use of seaweed and oyster and clamshells as fertilizers, amply repays the farmer's toil. The island deserves its name of the Garden Province of the Dominion. Beef, bacon, fruit, poultry, butter, cheese, and eggs are exported in large quantities. The island is famous for its potatoes. A very valuable export trade, under government supervision, is carried on in seed potatoes with the West Indies, tropical South America, and the United States. The shallow waters surrounding the island teem with food fishes of many kinds. Cod, herring, mackerel, oysters, and lobsters. The products of the fisheries and the farms are the chief exports of the island. As the land has been almost entirely cleared of trees, and as no minerals of value are found in the island, neither lumbering nor mining is carried on. Manufacturing is confined to the preparation of food products from the farm and the fisheries. Fox farming, which began on the island, still continues to be a very flourishing industry. Transportation The lines of the Canadian National Railway on the mainland and on the island are connected by a car ferry, which plies between Cape Tamartine in New Brunswick and Borden and is in operation all the year. There Northumberland Strait is but nine miles across. In summer there is direct communication by steamer between Charlottetown and Pictou and between Summerside and Point du Chêne. Cities and Towns The only city on the island is Charlottetown, the capital of the province. It is situated on Hillsborough Bay, one of the finest harbors on the North American continent. The provincial legislative buildings, St. Dunstan's University, Prince of Wales College, and workshops of the Canadian National Railways are located there. Summerside is the center of the oyster industry. End of section 18. Section 19 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepard. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto, Section 19, North America, the Prairie Provinces. Position, Extent, and People. The three prairie provinces comprise the block of land stretching for 900 miles west from Ontario to the Rocky Mountains and for 760 miles north from the international boundary to the 60th parallel. These three provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, are of almost the same size, each containing a little over 250,000 square miles, more than twice the area of the British Isles. 
At the time of Confederation, the inhabitants of the prairies were chiefly Indians and half-breeds. After Manitoba became a province, settlers began to come from eastern Canada and from Europe. As soon as railways were built, immigrants flooded the whole country. In a little over 50 years, the population of the prairie provinces has grown from a few thousand to nearly two millions. The greater number of the settlers speak English as their mother tongue. They have come from eastern Canada, the motherland, and the United States. There are many also from the various countries of Europe, who are rapidly learning the English language and becoming useful citizens of their adopted country. Surface and Soil The treeless prairies occupy only the southern part of the prairie provinces. In Manitoba, they extend only a short distance beyond Winnipeg. In Saskatchewan, as far north as the city of Saskatoon, and in Alberta, to about 100 miles north of Calgary. The prairies are divided into three steppes. The eastern and lowest steppe is entirely in Manitoba. It is an almost flat plain. This plain was once the bottom of a very large lake, known as Lake Agassiz, which long ago covered much of Manitoba, part of western Ontario, and even extended south into the United States. When the water receded, southern Manitoba was left with a coating of fine silt. This is now covered to a depth of from two to four feet with black, wonderfully fertile mold, formed from the decayed vegetation of thousands of years. The eastern steppe is separated from the middle steppe by an escarpment 360 to 400 feet high, which traverses Manitoba from the Pembina Mountains on the international boundary to the Porcupine Hills on the borders of Saskatchewan. West of the escarpment is open, rolling prairie. Here the country is more diversified in appearance, and there are many rough, stony hills and deep valleys. The soil of the middle steppe is lighter than that of the flat land of the first steppe, but it is still extraordinarily good. This steppe includes a small part of southwestern Manitoba and most of southern Saskatchewan. The rest of southern Saskatchewan and the whole prairie region of Alberta is in the western and highest steppe. Here the land is even more diversified than in the middle steppe. The rivers have cut deep valleys through it, and deep, narrow ravines, which were at one time the beds of tributary rivers, run out from them at right angles. These are the coulees of the west. The western steppe rises gradually to the west into the foothills of the Rockies. Alberta, although in its southern part a prairie province, contains within its borders part of the eastern side of the Rockies, with its abrupt slopes and irregular surface deeply cut by canyons and ravines. This part of Alberta is famous for its mountain scenery, and Banff, Lake Louise, and Jasper Park are visited by thousands of tourists. The most important of the mountain passes are the Crow's Nest and the Kicking Horse, which are both traversed by lines of the Canadian Pacific, and the Yellowhead, which is the route taken by the Canadian National Line. North of the prairies in Alberta and Saskatchewan is a belt of parkland where open prairie alternates with clumps of woodland, the innumerable coppices of birch and poplar provide fuel for the settler and also serve to shelter his house and stock from the cutting winter winds. The rainfall is heavier than farther south and the country is dotted with lakes and intersected by countless creeks and streams. These make it particularly well suited for stock raising. The soil is even better than that of the open prairies. North of the Saskatchewan River, the land is more heavily timbered although there is much open land even there. Northern Alberta is being opened up much more quickly than northern Saskatchewan. The Northern Alberta railways run into the Peace River district on the west and to the waterways near McMurray on the east. Settlers are rapidly making homes along the routes of these pioneer lines. Already there are many prosperous settlements in the valley of the Peace River. In Manitoba also, a well-wooded zone is found northeast of the prairie. It contains many lakes, three of which, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Winnipegosis, are of great size. Here, too, there is much fertile land well suited to agriculture. The Great Lakes of Manitoba are just at the edge of the Laurentian Highland, which includes the whole northern and northeastern portion of the province. This is a typical Laurentian area with northern forests, mineral-bearing rock, fur-bearing animals, many lakes, and turbulent rivers. Lakes and Rivers there are many small lakes in depressions scattered over the prairie. Many of these have no outlet and are consequently saline. The majority are merely salt marshes during the greater part of the year, becoming lakes only during the months of heavy rainfall. 
In the central and northern parts of the provinces, there are several large lakes and a host of smaller ones. Lake Winnipeg, with a length of 200 miles and an average width of 30 miles, is much the largest and most important of them all. It is the center of the drainage system of the southern and central parts of the three provinces. Into it flow the Saskatchewan River from the west, the Red River from the south, and the Winnipeg River from the east. Its overflow forms the Nelson River, flowing northeast into Hudson Bay. Lake Athabasca ranks next in size to Lake Winnipeg. It is partly in Saskatchewan and partly in Alberta. Lakes Manitoba and Winnipegosis in Manitoba, Wollaston Lake and Reindeer Lake in Saskatchewan, and Lesser Slave Lake in Alberta are all of considerable importance. The Saskatchewan is the great river of the prairies. Its two branches, the North Saskatchewan and the South Saskatchewan, drain almost the whole of southern and central Alberta and much of Saskatchewan. Its source is in the Rockies, and during the summer the melting snows of the mountains supply it with a large volume of water. From its source to its mouth at Lake Winnipeg, the river flows for 1,200 miles across the three prairie provinces. The Red River rises in the United States, crosses the international boundary at Pembina, and flows for the last 100 miles of its course through Manitoba. From the west it receives the Assiniboine River. The Assiniboine, with its chief tributaries, the Saurus, and the Capel waters a splendid farming country in the southwestern corner of Manitoba and the southeastern part of Saskatchewan. The Winnipeg River, the outlet of Lake of the Woods, drains the southwest corner of Manitoba. Its course is marked by many rapids. The water power so provided is now being used to generate electricity for the city of Winnipeg. The Nelson River, which drains the lake region of Manitoba to Hudson Bay, and the Churchill farther to the north, are the chief rivers of northern Manitoba. For much of its course, the Nelson flows through comparatively level, well-wooded country. Here, the ancient Laurentian rocks are mantled with a deep covering of sand and clay, forming good soil for the cultivation of cereals. The course of the Churchill is through rougher country, and the river has many falls and rapids. Even as far north as the Churchill, there are many tracts of arable land, and a considerable quantity of good spruce grows in its valleys. At the mouth of the river is Churchill, the terminus of the Hudson Bay Railway, which runs from the Paw, in Manitoba, to Hudson Bay. Farther north is the Northern Plain, on which little but mosses, lichens, and a few berries can grow. A small area in southern Saskatchewan and Alberta is drained by tributaries of the Missouri. The most important of these is the Milk River, which, after a course of 100 miles in Alberta, crosses the international boundary and joins the Missouri. Northern Alberta has two great rivers, the Peace and the Athabasca. These rivers, with their tributaries, are important as highways into the still more distant northland beyond the confines of the province. Their waters reach the Arctic Ocean by way of the Mackenzie River. Climate. The prairie provinces have a comparatively dry and clear, and so a very healthful, climate. The winter, while marked by low temperatures, is bright and invigorating, the spring and the autumn are delightful, and the long, warm summer days bring crops to maturity with surprising rapidity. The average rainfall is much less than in Ontario, varying from 12 or 13 inches in the dry southwest to 18 or 20 inches in the north and east. Though light, the rains come chiefly in June and July when needed most. The ground freezes to a considerable depth during the winter, and the seeding is done before it is completely thawed. The moisture, Welling up from beneath as the lower levels thaw out assures an ample supply for the young plants during April and May. This compensates for the light rainfall. In Alberta, the temperatures in general are not so extreme as in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Although the province extends for 760 miles from north to south, the summers are as warm at Dunvegan on the Peace River as they are at Cardston, close to the international boundary. The reason for this even spread of heat is found in the altitude of the land. The land slopes gently from north to south, and the lower altitude of northern Alberta offsets the higher latitude. The Chinook wind also has an equalizing effect in moderating the winter climate. The Chinook is a warm, dry wind caused by air currents ascending the eastern slope of the Rockies. As the air descends, it becomes warm and blowing eastward over the land, sweeps away the snow and raises the temperature as it goes. The Chinook has been known to cause a rise of 60 degrees in temperature in the course of a few hours. Agriculture. 
The Prairie Provinces well deserve their title of, quote, the granary of the empire, unquote. In all three, hard wheat grows to perfection, owing to a soil rich in nitrates, the dry climate, which ensures the absence of rust, and the large amount of sunshine during the long, clear days of summer. Southern Manitoba and the country east of Moose Jaw in Saskatchewan are particularly famous wheat-growing districts. The western wheats possess a particularly hard quality, which makes them very valuable as bread flowers. Oats rank next in importance to wheat, barley, flax, rye, peas, beans, hay, potatoes, turnips, and fodder corn are also widely grown. The method of handling the great grain crops of the prairie provinces is quite different from that used in eastern Canada. The grain is threshed in the fields and is generally hauled away at once to elevators. These are tall buildings equipped with bins and machinery to lift the grain into them. Almost every town and village along the railway lines of the west has one or more elevators. From the elevators, the grain can be easily transferred into cars and carried to the mills or to the lake ports of Port Arthur and Fort William. Here, there are numerous elevators. A large part of the grain crop of Alberta is now shipped to Great Britain by way of Vancouver and the Panama Canal. The early settlers on the prairies turned their attention almost wholly to grain growing, but the trend has been more and more towards mixed farming. Dairy farming is becoming an important branch of agriculture, and cattle raising is an industry of ever-increasing importance, especially in southwestern Saskatchewan and southern Alberta. There, cattle, horses, and sheep thrive the whole year round on the short, crisp herbage called buffalo grass. In the spring and early summer, this grass is green and juicy. Later, it dries and becomes a natural hay, retaining all its nutritious qualities. Cattle pastured upon it make beef of the first quality because of the Chinook winds, which melt the snow and lay bare the grass. Horses and cattle can live out on the prairie in these districts all through the winter, pasturing on the natural hay of the land. In recent years, great irrigation enterprises, which will eventually water over one million acres, have been put in operation in southern Alberta at Calgary, Lethbridge, Bassano, and Medicine Hat. The results have been amazing, and record crops of grain, vegetables, and alfalfa are now growing in these districts. As has been said, dairy farming is rapidly coming to the front in all three provinces. In particular, in Alberta, much attention is being paid to the raising of poultry for export to the other provinces, both east and west. A profitable trade in eggs is carried on with British Columbia and the Orient. In southern Alberta, enormous quantities of beets are grown to supply the beet sugar factories. Mining Coal is the chief mineral product of the prairie provinces. Alberta has enormous deposits of both bituminous and anthracite coal. It is estimated that the coal resources of the province exceed 670 billions of tons. Although development has just begun, already Alberta promises to become one of the chief coal-producing and exporting provinces of the Dominion. There are also extensive deposits of lignite coal in southern Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Those in Manitoba have not been developed to any extent, but about 30 mines in Saskatchewan help to supply local needs. Alberta is blessed with a large supply of natural gas, providing the province with cheap power, fuel, and light. Petroleum is found in the vicinity of Calgary and along the Athabasca River. There are also immense beds of tar sands, east of the Athabasca estimated to contain at least 6 billion tons of bitumen. The prairie provinces are well supplied with clay and stone for the manufacture of building materials. Gypsum is obtained at Gypsumville, northeast of Lake Manitoba. It is shipped to Winnipeg, where it is made into plaster walls and plaster of Paris. The mineral resources of the Laurentian sections of both Manitoba and Saskatchewan are being thoroughly explored, and many mines have been opened. The Flin Flon area in the two provinces where there are very valuable copper deposits, is being worked, and a railway is now in operation into the district. Lumbering In the east of Manitoba, the edge of the forest which covers northwestern Ontario projects a little way into the province. The dividing line between woodland and prairie runs to the northwest from a point not far to the west of Lake of the Woods. In the southeast, therefore, the province has a narrow belt of forested land along its eastern boundary, which gradually widens to the north and merges into the wooded lands of the lake region. 
This eastern forest strip furnishes much of the timber used in Manitoba. In the forested lands of northern Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, lumbering is carried on extensively, and many sawmills are in operation. Although the individual trees are small, the immense tracts of jack pine, poplar, spruce, and tamarack provide fuel and building material in abundance. In all three provinces, a number of very large areas, over 50,000 square miles in all, have been set aside by the Dominion government as forest reserves. The making of pulp and paper is becoming a very valuable industry in Manitoba. A huge mill at Pine Falls manufactures an immense quantity of newsprint. Fishing Fishing is an industry of some importance in Manitoba. Lakes Winnipeg and Manitoba are noted fishing grounds. White fish of unsurpassed quality form the greater part of the catch, although sturgeon, pike, and pickerel are also taken. The catch is large enough to supply the needs of the province and to provide a surplus for export to the United States. The lakes and streams of Saskatchewan and Alberta teem with fish. These provide wholesome food for the settlers. Although there are fish in plenty for millions of people, the development of the fisheries on a commercial scale is still in its infancy. Fur trading. The northern forests still abound with fur-bearing animals, although many thousands have been caught in past years, and although furs to the value of many millions of dollars have been exported since the Hudson's Bay Company first entered the country. Bear, wolf, otter, beaver, marten, and mink skins are still brought to the trading posts of the north in large numbers. Prince Albert and Battleford are the leading centers of the fur trade in Saskatchewan, Edmonton in Alberta, and Winnipeg in Manitoba. To Edmonton are brought the skins taken in the whole Mackenzie Basin. As the muskox, which ranges the northern plain, is now protected, its pelt is no longer an article of commerce. Many companies and private traders are engaged in the lucrative business of fur trading. Manufacturing Though the prairie provinces are mainly an agricultural county, and the total value of their manufactured products and the products of their mines, forests, and fisheries combined is much less than that of their farm crops, yet in Manitoba, manufacturing takes first place. The growth of manufacturing in the three provinces has been quite rapid. Flour milling and meat packaging are important. Lime burning and brick making employ many hands. Wire fencing, leather goods, carriages, and farm machinery are manufactured. There are also foundries and machine shops at various points. Manufacturing is developed to a greater extent in Alberta than in Saskatchewan, owing partly at least to the cheap fuel which the province possesses in her coal and natural gas. Cities and Towns Winnipeg, the capital of Manitoba, is the only considerable city in the province. Sixty years ago a mere trading post of the Hudson's Bay Company, today it is the great metropolis of the Canadian West. Its situation at the junction of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers, at the entrance to the great prairie country, is particularly favourable, as practically all commerce between the East and West must pass through it. The wonderful railway facilities of Winnipeg render it the chief distributing centre for the West. It is also one of the largest grain markets in the world. The magnificent water power near at hand has helped it become a prosperous manufacturing centre. The largest abattoirs in the West are at Winnipeg and St. Boniface. Winnipeg is noted for its educational institutions, which include the University of Manitoba with its affiliated colleges. The splendid buildings of the Agricultural College and also the institution for the deaf are within a few miles of the city. The provincial legislative buildings are outstanding. St. Boniface on the Red River opposite Winnipeg has large industrial interests. Brandon on the Assiniboine River is the second city of Manitoba. Its wholesale trade is very large, and its grain elevators, flour mills, and machine shops help to make it a bustling, thriving city. It is the seat of Brandon College. Portage La Prairie, on the main line of the two great continental railways, 56 miles west of Winnipeg, lies in the midst of a rich agricultural country known as the Portage Plains. It has large grain elevators and flour mills. Regina, on the main line of the Canadian Pacific Railway, is the capital and largest city of Saskatchewan. It is a commercial and distributing centre and has direct railway connection with all the important points in the west. A large oil refinery gives employment to many men. Metalworking is one of the chief industries. The beautiful provincial legislative buildings are situated there. 
Saskatoon, situated on the South Saskatchewan, is the second city of Saskatchewan. It is a busy commercial city, being an important railway and distributing centre. Flour milling and the making of road machinery are among its many industries. Saskatoon is the seat of the University of Saskatchewan. Moose Jaw is the third city of the province. It has excellent railway facilities, being the terminal point of a branch of the Sioux Line, which runs to St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Sault Ste. Marie. It has large stockyards, big flour mills, and capacious elevators. Prince Albert, situated at the edge of the wooded lands in the north, is the chief centre for the lumber, fur, and fish trades. Edmonton, the capital of Alberta, is splendidly situated on a tableland 200 feet above the North Saskatchewan River. It is the centre of northern traffic and is on the main line of the Canadian National Railways. It is the gateway to northern Alberta. Coal is near at hand, and natural gas is supplied from the wells at Viking, about 80 miles distant. The city has many large manufacturing establishments, including flour mills, saw mills, and meat packing plants. The provincial legislative buildings and the buildings of the University of Alberta are imposing structures. Calgary is the largest city and the commercial metropolis of Alberta. It is situated on the main line of the Canadian Pacific in the valley of the Bow River, a tributary of the South Saskatchewan. It is the chief distributing centre for southern Alberta and its wholesale trade is very large. Its manufacturers include meat packaging plants, flour mills, harness factories, lumber mills, and brick and cement works. A large oil refinery is now in operation. Electricity is supplied from waterfalls on the Bow River, and natural gas is piped from the gas fields in the vicinity. Coal in abundance is found in the immediate neighborhood. Calgary is the headquarters of the irrigation districts of the province. Medicine Hat is the thriving center of a ranching and farming country. The immense supplies of natural gas in the vicinity afford cheap and abundant fuel. It is among the most foremost milling towns of Canada. Bricks and sewer pipes are among the most important of its manufacturers. Lethbridge is the centre both of a great coal mining district and of a fine agricultural country, which has been wonderfully improved by irrigation. End of section 19. Recording by Doug Shepherd. Section 20 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. Ontario Public School Geography by the Ontario Department of Education. Section 20. The Province of British Columbia. Position, Extent, and People. British Columbia the most westerly of the Canadian provinces, extends from the 49th to the 60th parallel of latitude, and from Alberta to the Pacific Ocean and southern Alaska. It averages 425 miles in width, and has an area of 355,000 square miles. It ranks third in size among the provinces, being surpassed only by Quebec and Ontario. When British Columbia entered Confederation, the white population numbered only about 10,000. Since then, the population has steadily increased and now totals over 500,000. Owing to the position of British Columbia on the seaboard facing the Orient, there has been a considerable immigration from China and Japan, and about 30,000 Chinese and Japanese have made their homes in the province. There are also about 20,000 Indians. The Chinese are mainly engaged in fishing, market gardening, and domestic service. The Japanese make their living by fishing and lumbering. The Indians live for the most part upon their reservations. The white population is almost entirely of Canadian or British extraction. Coastline. Only the southern half of the province fronts on the Pacific, for a long, narrow coastal strip belonging to Alaska cuts off the northern portion from the sea. The coastline, about 500 miles in length by airline, is so irregular and indented with long inlets reaching far into the land that the mainland of the province has an actual shoreline measuring 7,000 miles. If the shoreline of the islands fringing the mainland be added, British Columbia can boast of 15,000 miles of coast bordering on the Pacific Ocean. The islands along the coast are very numerous. The most important is Vancouver Island, 
Separated from the state of Washington by Juan de Fuca Strait, and from the mainland of British Columbia by the Strait of Georgia and Queen Charlotte Sound. Vancouver Island is 285 miles long, and from 40 to 80 miles wide, with an area of 20,000 square miles, almost the size of Nova Scotia. The next largest are the islands forming the Queen Charlotte group, separated from the mainland by the Hecate Strait. The multitude of bays and sounds along the whole coast, both of the mainland and of the larger islands, provide numerous harbours. In some of the inlets the water is too deep to afford anchorage, but in all there is shelter from the storms of the Pacific. Surface and Soil The province is traversed from north to south by four principal ranges of mountains, the Rocky and Selkirk ranges on the east, and the coast and island ranges on the west. The Rocky Mountain Range preserves its continuity, but the Selkirk Range is broken and confused. Four mountainous areas together form the Selkirk Range, the Purcell, the Selkirk, the Gold, and the Caribou Mountains. Between the Selkirks and the Rockies lies a remarkable valley, extending northerly from the international boundary for a distance of 700 miles. West of the Selkirks is the great interior plateau. Much of the plateau has been so eroded by streams that in many parts its surface presents the appearance of a succession of mountains. In other places the surface is less broken, and there are wide rolling plains dotted with low hills. These are excellent farming and pasture lands. The coast range is considerably lower than either the Selkirks or the Rockies, averaging about 6,000 feet in height. The island range, paralleling the coast range, is mostly submerged. Only the highest parts are above water. These form the thousands of islands along the coast. Although British Columbia is so mountainous, it contains much good soil in the valleys and on the alluvial plains through which the rivers flow when nearing the sea. Even upon the mountain slopes there is sufficient depth of soil to nourish the immense forests, which are distinctive features of the province. Rivers and Lakes The rivers and lakes of British Columbia are very different from those of the rest of Canada. The rivers are turbulent, rushing streams which turn and double and twist as they sweep around the bases of the mountains in their eager rush to the sea. Sometimes they expand into long, narrow lakes, often of great depth. In British Columbia there are no long stretches of river navigation without serious impediments. There are no great inland seas such as those of eastern and central Canada. The province is, however, literally studded with small lakes, which, nestling in placid beauty in the mountain valleys, are a delightful contrast to the stern grandeur of the surrounding peaks. British Columbia is the watershed of the Pacific Slope. All the great rivers flowing into the Pacific, with the exception of the Colorado, take their rise within its boundaries. Of these, the most important are the Columbia, which flows for 600 miles through the province before crossing the international boundary, forming in its course the Upper and Lower Arrow Lakes. The Fraser, 750 miles long, which flows for the last 80 miles of its course through a fertile alluvial plain, and the Skeena and Stikeen, which drain the northwestern part of the province. The northeastern portion is drained by the Peace and Laird rivers, which flow toward the northeast and eventually pour their waters into the Mackenzie River. Scenery The mountains of British Columbia, especially the Rockies and the Selkirk Range, present to the traveler an endless variety of scenery, which ranks with the finest in the world. They themselves are unspeakably grand. There is no monotony in them, for the jagged outlines of the huge masses of rock flung high against the sky are ever different ever-changing as the traveller journeys on. There is endless variety, too, in the narrow canyons, in which far beneath the mountain torrents rush headlong to the distant sea, and in the green valleys and grassy meadows nestling at the base of the frowning mountains. To them the eye turns with relief when wearied with the vain attempt to grasp the gigantic portions of the mountains. There is a feast of colour everywhere, the dark grey of soaring pinnacles of bare rock, the dazzling white of the eternal snow, the brilliant green of grassy plots, and the deeper hue of the forest trees, the white foam of turbulent streams, the glint of mountain lakes, 
the blazing patches of vivid red, purple, and yellow which blotch the canyon walls. The mountains never grow wearisome to the traveller. Not in a whole lifetime could he discover all their beauty and grandeur. Climate The climate of British Columbia varies considerably in different parts. The westerlies, blowing over the warm North Pacific drift, exercise a moderating influence upon the coast, and provide a copious rainfall. The westerlies are cooled to a certain extent by the comparatively low coast range, and yield a portion of their moisture upon the western slopes. In the lee of the mountains there is a dry belt of country with little rainfall. The Selkirks, being much higher than the coast range, cool the west winds still more, and force them to give up most of the moisture which they have retained after passing the coast range. There is, therefore, a heavy snowfall upon the peaks of the Selkirks. The still higher Rockies complete the process of condensation, but the precipitation of moisture upon them is comparatively slight. In this way a series of alternate moist and dry belts is formed. The climate of Vancouver Island and the coast, generally, is much like that of England. The summers are warm, with much bright sunshine, while severe frosts are uncommon in winter. To the east of the coast range the climate is quite different. The summers are warmer, the winters are colder, and the rainfall is rather light. In the extreme north the winters are severe. Agriculture Although a large part of British Columbia is mountainous and covered with forest growth, it is estimated that the province has over 12 million acres of land suitable for agriculture. Only a small part of this area is now under cultivation. Further, much of this acreage is fit only for pasture. In the valleys, however, and in the bottom lands at the mouths of the rivers, there is a great deal of really valuable agricultural land, and these lands produce abundant crops. Wheat, barley, hops, and roots and vegetables of all kinds do well. Sugar beets, celery, and tobacco are beginning to be cultivated on quite a large scale. In fruit growing especially the province has made great progress. Apples, grapes, apricots, peaches, plums, and cherries grow to perfection, as well as strawberries and other small fruits. Good pasture land makes dairying and stock raising easy and profitable. Lumbering The magnificent forests of British Columbia are her greatest asset. Throughout the coast region, and to a smaller extent the wet belts of the interior, there are huge tracts of superb trees, such as the Douglas fir, hemlock, red and yellow cedar, spruce, larch, and pine. The coniferous trees attain an immense size. A diameter of eight to ten feet is not unusual, and there are individual specimens with a girth of fifty feet or more. The cedar cut is used mainly for the manufacture of shingles. The spruce yields the raw material for pulp and paper manufacture. The timber of British Columbia is in constant demand in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and much is also sent to eastern Canada, the United Kingdom, China, Japan, South America, Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. Mining The mountains of the province are rich in minerals. Gold, silver, copper, lead, coal, and iron are all found, copper yielding the most abundantly. The coal deposits both on Vancouver Island and on the mainland are especially noteworthy. It has been estimated that they contain 40 billion tons. At the present rate of removal, that is sufficient to last for 13,000 years. Fishing The waters of the North Pacific around the coast of British Columbia rival those of the North Atlantic in productiveness, and fishing is one of the great industries of the province. British Columbia for some time has ranked first among the provinces in the value of fisheries, and now contributes nearly one-half of the entire production of the Dominion. The fish of outstanding importance is the salmon. When the spawning season comes, the salmon move from the sea into the rivers in immense numbers. The salmon are caught while entering the rivers from the ocean during the season from June to September. Many forms of traps, nets, and fish wheels are used for this purpose. If most of them were caught on their way up the river, the fish would soon be all destroyed. To avoid this, the government regulates the placing of nets, so that a large number of the fish may still get past the nets to the spawning grounds. 
After the fish are caught, they are sent to large modern canneries, where the work of cleaning and canning them is done by machinery. Immense numbers are handled in a very short time without being touched by hand. The halibut fisheries are also valuable. Prince Rupert is the centre of this branch of the industry. One of the largest cold storage plants in the world devoted exclusively to fish has been erected there, and from it halibut, packed in ice, is shipped as far as the Atlantic seaboard. Herring and black cod are also caught. The whale fisheries are of considerable importance. Manufacturing The manufacturers of British Columbia are closely connected with the natural resources of the province. Lumber is manufactured, in all its forms, for home consumption and export purposes. Large smelters are operated in the mining districts, and coke is manufactured on a large scale at Fernie and other places. Pulp and paper production is steadily increasing in importance. Salmon canning is, of course, one of the largest industries. There is a large sugar refinery at Vancouver. Victoria and Vancouver have well-equipped shipbuilding yards. Cities and Towns Victoria, the capital of British Columbia, is built upon the eastern side of a narrow inlet opening into Vancouver Island from the Strait of Juan de Fuca. There are excellent harbour facilities. Although the commerce of the city is considerable, and although there are several important industries in it, Victoria is essentially a residential city. The legislative buildings, which overlook the harbour, are among the most beautiful and imposing structures on the continent. Three miles from Victoria is the fine harbour of Esquimalt. It has a large dry dock. Near the city also is erected a Dominion Observatory, possessing a telescope which is one of the largest in the world. Vancouver, with its important rail and ocean connections, is the chief city of the province, and the third in population in the Dominion. It is situated on a peninsula jutting out into Burrard Inlet, and has one of the finest natural harbours in the world. Its dockyard facilities are excellent. Vancouver is the western gateway of the Dominion, and its import and export business is very large. It is also the headquarters of the larger industrial enterprises of the province, which include the manufacture of lumber, the refining of ore, salmon canning, sugar refining, and shipbuilding. As much of the Alberta grain crop passes through the port, the city has several huge elevators. It is the seat of the University of British Columbia. New Westminster, 12 miles from Vancouver, and connected with it by both steam and electric railways, has large fishing and lumbering interests. Nanaimo, on the east coast of Vancouver Island, has large coal mines in the vicinity. The surrounding country is good farmland, and both fruit growing and mixed farming are rapidly increasing. Prince Rupert, one of the western terminals of the Canadian National Railways, is a port of growing importance. It is also the headquarters of the fisheries of the northwestern coast. Rossland, surrounded by hills containing immense deposits of iron and copper ore, is an important mining city. At Trail, 14 miles away, are immense smelting works, a lead and silver refinery, and a factory for making lead pipe. Fernie, on the Crow's Nest Pass Railway, is a coal mining centre. Great quantities of coke for smelting are made nearby. Nelson, on Kootenay Lake, is the commercial centre of the southern interior part of the province. It has a large smelter, a flour mill, and fruit packing establishments. Kamloops, on the line of two transcontinental railways about 250 miles east of Vancouver, is the distributing centre for a large agricultural, mining, and lumbering district. End of section 20. Section 21 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto. Section 21 North America. The Yukon in Northwest Territories. The Yukon. Position, Extent, and People. The Yukon Territory comprises the farthest northwest portion of the Dominion. It extends from the northern limit, or British Columbia, to the Arctic Ocean. 
and from the Rockies to Alaska. No part of it touches the Pacific Ocean, although at one point it comes within 30 miles of tidewater. The territory has an area of over 207,000 square miles. Prior to the discovery of gold in the Klondike, the Yukon Territory was inhabited only by a few Indians, who roamed undisturbed over its surface. Then came the great rush to the new gold fields, and thousands of men poured into the country. The population rose in a few years to nearly 30,000. Since then, there has been a steady decrease, until now the population numbers only a little over 4,000. Surface and Climate The territory forms part of the Rocky Mountain system, and is in general mountainous. There are, however, many stretches of rolling land, with wide flats in the river valleys. The lower tracts of the country are covered with thick coating of clay, gravel, or sand. Although the lakes of the territory are fairly numerous, they are all comparatively small, with a combined area of about 700 square miles. There are, however, many large rivers. The Laird, in the south, drains a small part of the territory to the Mackenzie River. The Yukon and its tributaries, the Loos, Pelly, Stewart, and Porcupine, are navigable over nearly their whole length, and drain the rest of the territory to Bering Sea. The moderating winds of the Pacific are barred from the Yukon Territory by the high Pacific Coast ranges, so that the climate is very rigorous. The winters are long and extremely cold, with temperatures ranging down to 70 degrees below zero. The short summers are delightful, and the long summer days are so warm and sunny, the vegetation grows with amazing rapidity. Even in this far northern territory, the cultivation of the hardier cereals and vegetables has been carried on with considerable success. Resources Although oats, barley, rye, flax, turnips, potatoes, and other vegetables are successfully grown in some parts, the Yukon Territory has too severe a climate to become an agricultural country. It is estimated that there are about 30,000 square miles of land available for agriculture, and this land may possibly be put to use in the far distant future. The southern part of the territory is well wooded with timber of fair size, principally white and black spruce. Smaller trees are scattered over the northern half of the territory, with the exception of a strip along the Arctic coast, where the severity of the climate permits only a few hardy shrubs and plants to survive. The waters of the territory are well stocked with fish. Salmon, whitefish, trout, pickerel, and pike are all found, and add materially to the supply of food available within the territory. The mineral wealth of the Yukon is very great. In 1896, the richness of the Klondike district in gold became known, and a rush of prospectors followed. Since then, gold estimated to be worth over $150 million has been mined. Coal, copper, silver, and other minerals are also mined in considerable quantities, but there is not now so much mining carried on as formerly. Towns Dawson, at the junction of the Yukon and Klondike rivers, is the capital and chief town of the territory. It is connected with Bonanza by a railway 12 miles long, and with Whitehorse by steamer during the summer months. Whitehorse, the terminus of the White Pass and Yukon Railway, is the center of a rich copper mining district. The Northwest Territories Position, Extent, and People That part of Canada extending from the Yukon Territory to Hudson Bay and from the northern boundaries of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba to the islands of the Arctic Ocean, is given the general name of the Northwest Territories. For purposes of administration, it is divided into three provisional districts, Mackenzie, Franklin, and Kewadden. The boundaries of these districts may be changed at any time by the Dominion government. The islands in Hudson Bay and James Bay are included in the district of Kewadden. Of the estimated area of the territories, more than 1,200,000 square miles, much has never been adequately explored. There are only a few people within the territories, mainly Indians, Eskimos, trappers, and employees of the fur trading companies, totaling about 8,000 in all. The affairs of the territories are administered by the Department of the Interior, one of the departments of the Dominion government. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police enforce observance of the laws of Canada throughout the whole vast area of the Northwest Territories and the Yukon Territory surface and climate. Much of this vast area is a treeless wilderness of rock and swamp, covered with mosses and coarse grass, which provide food for the caribou and the musk ox. This desolate land lies northeast of a curving line drawn from the mouth of the Seal River on Hudson Bay, through the middle of Great Slave and Great Bear Lakes, to the mouth of the Anderson River on the Arctic Ocean. To the south and west of the northern plain are well-wooded regions. 
the climate of the Mackenzie Basin is much milder than that of the northern plain in the same latitude, which is due partly by the low elevation of the valley lands, partly to the influence of the Chinook winds, and partly to the presence of large bodies of water. Trees a foot in diameter grow in the delta of the Mackenzie, well within the Arctic Circle, while wheat has been successfully grown at Fort Simpson, in latitude 62 degrees, a point as far to the northwest of Winnipeg as Winnipeg is from New York. Resources In addition to a certain limited extent of agricultural land along the Mackenzie and Laird rivers, the Northwest Territories have other resources of great value. Copper is known to occur in vast quantities in the northern plain, and these deposits may prove worth developing in the future. It is now known that the basin of the Mackenzie is rich in petroleum, coal, and natural gas, and drilling in the oil-bearing areas has already begun. There is also an enormous supply of pulp wood, which should also prove a valuable asset in the future development of the country. At present, the fur trade is the chief occupation of the inhabitants of the territories. End of section 21section twenty two of ontario public school geography this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano ontario public school geography by the educational book company of toronto section twenty two North America, Newfoundland, and Greenland. Position, Extent, and People The island of Newfoundland lies at the entrance of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. As a consequence, ships from Great Britain to Montreal and Quebec must pass either through the Strait of Belle Isle, which in some places is but twelve miles wide, or through Cabot Strait, about sixty-five miles in width, which separates Newfoundland from Cape Breton Island. The former is much the shorter route, but the strait is frozen for five or six months of the year. Newfoundland includes not only the island itself, but also about 115,000 square miles of territory along the eastern side of the Labrador Peninsula. This district, known as the Coast of Labrador, was awarded to Newfoundland by a decision of the Privy Council in 1927. The island proper is triangular in shape its greatest length being about 325 miles, and its greatest width about 310 miles. Newfoundland has a population of a little more than a quarter of a million, the greater number of whom are of British birth or descent. The country is a self-governing dominion, forming part of the British Empire. Surface and Coastline The surface of the island is very irregular. In general, the hills are near the coast. The interior is an undulating country, covered with marshes, lakes, and tracts of barren land. The almost innumerable small lakes take up about a third of the surface of the entire island. The higher hills are covered with forests, but along the streams and the valleys there is a considerable area of arable land. The rivers are small, and for the most part not navigable. The largest are the Humber and the River of Exploits. The coastline, which is about 2,000 miles in length, is very irregular. The coast itself is high and rugged, and there are, near the coast, many small, rocky islands. There are a number of excellent harbors. Climate Owing to the Arctic current which flows along the eastern coast of Newfoundland, the eastern part of the island is cooler than the western section. All over the island the temperature in winter rarely falls below zero, while the summers are quite hot. The meeting of the moist warm air over the Gulf Stream with the colder air above the Arctic Current causes frequent fogs along the south and southeastern coasts, making navigation dangerous. The rainfall is abundant and extends over the year. Industries About one-fourth of the people of Newfoundland are engaged in the catching and curing of fish. Cod are caught, some in the bays and inlets along the shore, and some on the Great Bank while the latter fishing ground is open to all nations. The necessary bait is for the most part found within the territorial waters of Newfoundland, that is, within three miles from the coast. The privilege of selling bait to foreigners is jealously guarded by the islanders, and is a source of considerable revenue. 
salmon herring and haddock are also caught on the grand bank a great deal of the cod is dried before being exported lobsters are trapped along the shores and a part of the catch is shipped to the united states the remainder being canned in factories along the coast freshwater fishing is also of importance the streams of the island teeming with salmon and other fish sealing is the industry next in importance each year thousands of seals which have taken refuge on the ice to bring up their young are carried along the coast of labrador and newfoundland on the ice fields or floes brought down by the arctic current these seals fall an easy prey to the hunters who set out early in the spring in vessels specially constructed for navigation among the ice hunters make their way from floe to floe slaughtering the seals with clubs and carrying away the skins and blubber the industry is dangerous but very profitable the departure of the sealing fleet usually about the middle of march is one of the great events of the year in newfoundland much of the blubber is refined on the island and exported as seal oil the forest wealth of the country especially of the coast of labrador is enormous in material both for lumber and for pulp wood spruce fir tamarack and birch are the principal trees there are several large pulp and paper mills on the island most of the product of which is exported to england there are many sawmills on the north coast the island is also rich in minerals so that mining is likely to displace fishing as the leading industry iron ore exported largely to sydney nova scotia and coal are the chief mineral products vast deposits of gypsum are found on the western coast copper lead and asbestos are produced in paying quantities petroleum has lately been discovered at various points the soil of newfoundland is in general cold and wet and not well adapted for farming however there are large tracts of fertile land in the river valleys oats barley and vegetables are the principal crops the manufactures with the exception of lumber pulp wood and paper are few and are mainly connected with the fishing industry the most important are twine nets ropes seal oil frozen fish and canned lobsters owing to the irregular and rugged nature of its surface the island has few railways the principal places are connected by a railway about seven hundred miles in length owned and operated by the government communication with canada the united states and europe is maintained by a number of steamship lines as the southeastern part of the island is the point in north america nearest to europe it is the landing place for several of the cables crossing the atlantic cities and towns st john's the capital and largest city is situated on a beautiful landlocked harbor on the east side of the avalon peninsula the harbor is capable of accommodating vessels of the largest tonnage and is provided with a large dry dock many manufacturing plants are located there harbor grace a fishing center and heart's content are thriving places the french islands near the coast of newfoundland to the south are the small island groups of st pierre and michelin which belong to france the islands have cable connection with europe and america and have also regular steamship service with halifax and boston the majority of the people are engaged in the fishing industry there is little farming greenland greenland has an area estimated at eight hundred and fifty thousand square miles but less than fifty thousand square miles are habitable on the west it is separated from the northern canadian islands by davis strait and baffin bay and from iceland on the east by denmark strait the surface is mountainous but during the ages the valleys have become so filled with ice and snow that the visible surface is almost level the coastline is very rugged with many fjords which run far into the land thousands of giant icebergs are broken off each year from the enormous glaciers and drift southward till they gradually melt away in the warmer waters of the atlantic as the greater part of the island is within the arctic circle the climate is extremely cold in winter vegetation is fairly abundant along the coast from june to september in greenland there are over four hundred flowering plants growing wild in addition to trees such as the birch alder and willow potatoes lettuce radishes and other vegetables mature rapidly in the central and southern coast districts during the summer months the fox polar bear musk ox and reindeer roam over the island and along the coast myriads of birds make their nests the population consists of about twelve thousand eskimos and probably three hundred danes 
the island is a colony of denmark and its trade is a government monopoly maintained in the interests of the natives there are extensive cod and haddock fisheries on the east coast the principal products are whale oil and seal oil eider down and the skins of the fox bear seal and walrus end of section twenty two Section 23 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepard. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto, Section 23, North America, The United States of America, Part 1. Position, Extent, and People The United States of America extends from Canada on the north to Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico on the south and from the Atlantic Ocean on the east to the Pacific Ocean on the west. Not including Alaska and other dependencies, it has an area somewhat smaller than that of Canada, but it has a population about twelve times as great. The majority of the people in the United States are of European extraction with the British element predominating. Germans, French, Spaniards, Italians, Swedes, Norwegians, Poles, Russians, Hungarians, and Jews have emigrated in large numbers to the United States during the last fifty years. The Negroes, who are the descendants of slaves, form about ten percent of the population. They live chiefly in the southeastern states. The Indians, who formerly occupied the whole country, are now mainly confined to reserves, and are not increasing very much in numbers. Dependencies The United States has acquired in the last sixty years certain territories beyond its own boundaries. In 1867, Alaska was taken over from Russia. Later, the Hawaiian Islands voluntarily joined the United States. Puerto Rico and the Philippine Islands were acquired as the result of a war with Spain and three of the Virgin Islands were purchased from Denmark. In 1903, the Panama Canal Zone was obtained by purchase from the Republic of Panama. The United States possesses also a number of small islands in the Pacific Ocean. Surface and Divisions The general features of the surface of the United States have already been considered. In the east there is the Atlantic Slope, narrow in the north, but broadening rapidly toward the south. Back of the eastern slope is the Appalachian Highland, steep and abrupt upon its eastern face, but sloping gently toward the great central plain. West of the Mississippi River, the ground rises gradually to the western highland, which, with its wide plateaus and basins, occupies about a third of the country. An adequate knowledge of the surface of the United States, however, requires a more detailed study. The six states occupying the northern part of the Appalachian Highland form a distinct group, known collectively as New England. These states are, in general, rough and rocky. Of the mountains, the best known are the Berkshire Hills in Massachusetts, the Green Mountains in Vermont, and the White Mountains in New Hampshire. In the north, thousands of small lakes dot the surface, but some of them are little more than swamps. The rivers, for the most part, flow southward. Flowing from the upland, they are short and rapid, with numerous waterfalls. Many of them are tidal. The coastline is very uneven. In some parts it is rocky and rugged, while in others there are long stretches of waste and sand. There are, however, both on the coast and on the numerous small offshore islands, many safe harbors, which are of great use to the fishermen. The surface of the middle states of the Atlantic coast consists of four fairly well-defined divisions. Along the sea coast lies the Atlantic coastal plain. Rising abruptly from the plain is the Piedmont Plateau, the edge of which is called the Fall Line. This plateau borders on the Appalachian Mountains, which extend in parallel ranges through the Middle States. West of the Appalachians is the Appalachian Plateau, sloping toward the Ohio and the Mississippi Rivers. The surface of the Middle States is well drained by many large rivers, the chief being the Hudson, Delaware, Susquehanna, Potomac, James, flowing to the Atlantic, and the Ohio, flowing to the Mississippi. There are many lakes, principally in the northern section. Champlain is the largest of these. 
there are along the coast numerous bays such as the Chesapeake and Delaware. South of the Middle States are the southern states of the Atlantic coast. In these states, the coastal plain is much broader and includes all Florida and about half of the other three states. It is generally flat, with sand hills covered with pine forests in the central section. It has also many swamps, the best known of which are the Everglades of southern Florida. These are a tangle of water, mud, roots, underbrush, and small trees. Only the Indians can find their way through their intricate mazes. Back of the plain is the Piedmont Plateau and the Appalachian Highland. The rivers in these states are not important for navigation. The Savannah is the chief. The coastline is generally low, with sandy beaches and sandy offshore islands, very dangerous to navigation. South of Florida are a large number of small coral islands known as Florida Keys. The bays along the coast are few, and there are few good harbors. Almost the entire region occupied by the southern states of the Mississippi Valley is a great coastal plain. In some parts, however, there are highlands. The Appalachians extend into Tennessee and Alabama in a highland known as the Cumberland Plateau. Parts of Oklahoma and Arkansas are occupied by the Ozark and other low mountains. The western part of Texas is in the western highland. The Mississippi, after it is joined by the Ohio, flows through low-lying lands all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. In order to prevent the river from overflowing its banks, embankments, or levees, have been built. Frequently, a sudden flood sweeps away the levees with disastrous consequences to life and property. In the lowlands, on both sides of the river near its mouth, are innumerable small streams known as bayous, which form an extensive swamp. The present delta of the Mississippi is of immense extent, forming a large part of the surface of Louisiana. The principal tributaries of the Mississippi in this section are the Arkansas and the Red from the west. The surface of the northern states of the Mississippi Basin is largely a level plain, sloping gently from the Appalachians on the east to the Mississippi River and rising in an easy slope from the Mississippi westward to the Rocky Mountains. There are highlands, however, in many of the states. The Ozark Mountains occupy the southern part of Missouri, while West Virginia and part of Kentucky lie within the Appalachian Plateau. There are also highlands in Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and the two Dakotas. The greater part of this huge area is drained by the Mississippi River and its two tributaries, the Ohio and the Missouri. The rivers of Michigan, however, flow for the most part into the Great Lakes, while parts of North Dakota and Minnesota are drained into Hudson Bay through the Red River. West of the states of the Mississippi Valley are the Plateau States. The great mass of the Rocky Mountains runs through these states from north to south. On the west of the Rockies, a part of the surface is included in the Columbia Plateau, a part in the Great Basin, and a part in the Colorado Plateau while the Sierra Madre Mountains occupy a portion of the southwestern section. On the east of the Rockies, part of the surface is included in the Great Plain. Almost the entire plateau is a mile above the level of the sea. The scenery among the mountains is very grand. The government has set aside three great national parks, the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, the Yellowstone National Park, and the Glacier National Park. The Grand Canyon is one of the wonders of the world. This canyon, through which runs the Colorado River, is in many places a mile deep and from 2 to 12 miles wide. The Yellowstone National Park, most of which is in Wyoming, has much magnificent scenery, canyons, waterfalls, geysers, and hot springs. The coloring of the rocks in the canyon of the Yellowstone River is superb. The Glacier National Park in Montana has many beautiful mountains, glaciers, and lakes. The Pacific Coast states lie along the coast of the Pacific Ocean from Canada to Mexico. The surface of these states is almost everywhere mountainous. The coastal range parallels the Pacific Ocean. East of this is the Cascade Range in the north and the Sierra Nevada in the south. The Sierra Nevadas are very high mountains and contain Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the United States. The Cascade Range is not so high as the Sierra Nevadas but it is broader and has many noble peaks. Between the Coast Range and the Cascade Range in the north lies the Willamette Valley. 
and between the Sierra Nevadas and the Coast Range in the south is the Great Valley of Central California. The Pacific Coast states are rich in beautiful natural parks reserved by the government for the benefit of the people. Among these are the famous Yosemite Valley in California, Crater Lake in Oregon, and the Mount Rainier National Park in Washington. The coastline from Puget Sound to Southern California is so regular that with the exception of San Francisco Bay, there are practically no good harbors. Climate. In New England and the northern middle states, the summers are warm and the winters cold. The prevailing winds are from the west, but frequently they change and blow from the east and the northeast, bringing raw and chilly weather. In the southern section of the middle states, it is much warmer, owing partly to the latitude and partly to the absence of cold winds from the ocean. Everywhere the climate is subject to rapid changes. The rainfall over the whole region is abundant. The climate of the southern Atlantic states varies according to latitude and altitude, but it is almost everywhere warm and pleasant. On the coast, the climate is influenced both in summer and in winter by the warm winds from the ocean. It is much cooler on the Piedmont Plateau than on the coastal plain, and cooler still on the Appalachian Highland. The winter climate is, on the whole, so delightful that all the South Atlantic states, especially Florida, are thronged with visitors from the north during the winter months. Along the coast of the southern Mississippi states, the temperature is never extreme, since the heat of summer is moderated by the winds from the Gulf of Mexico. As the distance from the Gulf increases, the summer temperature becomes somewhat higher. In the uplands, snow sometimes falls in winter, and ice forms on the small lakes and ponds. The rain is abundant, especially in the south. Western Texas and Oklahoma, however, have less rain as they are not influenced by the winds from the Gulf and are shut off from the winds of the Pacific by the mountains. In general, the climate of the northern states of the Mississippi Valley is warm in summer and clear and cold in winter. The rainfall is less in the west and southwest than it is in the southeast, but the prevailing westerlies bring sufficient rain over almost the entire region. In the southwest, cyclonic storms are frequent and sometimes do much damage. The waters of the Great Lakes moderate the climate of the states adjacent to them. The climate of the Plateau states shows many variations. As these stretch from Canada on the north to Mexico on the south, a distance of 1,200 miles, it is obvious that it may be snowing in Montana while it is uncomfortably hot in Arizona or New Mexico. The rainfall is nowhere abundant. In fact, except among the highest mountains, the climate of this vast district is very dry. The rainfall in the Great Basin is so small and the evaporation so rapid that the streams from the mountains either disappear or empty into the salt lakes with which the surface of the basin is dotted. A good example of these salt lakes is Great Salt Lake in Utah, which has an area of 2,500 square miles. The climate throughout the Pacific Coast states, except among the high mountains, is never very cold. Generally, it is delightful. The rainy season comes during the winter. The winds from the Pacific bring an abundance of moisture, heaviest in Washington and Oregon, and decreasing toward the south, so that frequently Southern California is very dry. The climate is more equable along the coast than it is farther inland. Agriculture. On the whole, New England cannot be considered a good agricultural country. In many districts, the soil is thin and poor, while in others, it is filled with boulders and small stones. There is, however, some fertile soil, especially in the valleys of the larger rivers and in the Lake Champlain district. The farms are generally small and are devoted to market gardening, poultry raising, and dairying. The large cities scattered all through New England easily use all the vegetables, milk, butter, cheese, poultry, and eggs that are produced in their neighborhood. Massachusetts is particularly famed for its onions and cranberries, and the valley of the Connecticut River for its tobacco. Agriculture is of much greater importance in the middle Atlantic states than it is in New England. The rich soil and the moist climate, together with the early spring and the late autumn, are favorable to farming in all its branches. With the exception of the Appalachian Highland, almost all the land is good. Wheat, oats, barley, and rye are raised, but the farmers have found that these grains can be grown on the western prairies and shipped to the great eastern cities 
much more cheaply than they can be produced in the middle Atlantic states. These states are, therefore, turning their attention more and more to fruit farming, dairying, market gardening, and poultry raising. Immense quantities of tobacco are produced in Virginia, where the peanut is also a staple crop. As a result of the large quantities of fruits and vegetables grown on the farms, a huge industry in the canning of these products has sprung up. Many farmers dispose of their entire crop to the canning factories. Most of the people of the southern Atlantic states and of the southern states of the Mississippi Valley are engaged in the cultivation of the soil. Cotton, tobacco, rice, and sugarcane are the principal products. The islands along the coast of Georgia and South Carolina yield much sea island cotton, the fibers of which are long and very strong. Market gardening is also a very profitable industry. As the growing season opens much earlier than in the north, these southern states are able to supply the northern markets with early vegetables and fruits. Florida also produces oranges, lemons, grapefruit, and pineapples. In the southern sections, corn and wheat are grown, particularly in Oklahoma. In western Texas and in Oklahoma, the ranching industry is of prime importance. On the great ranches of these two states are raised vast herds of cattle, horses, and mules. Texas is one of the great cattle states of the Union. As a general rule, the surface of the northern Mississippi states is good agricultural land. The soil is rich and deep, and there is a long growing season with sufficient rainfall and abundance of sunshine. In the western section, however, irrigation is necessary in many parts. Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Ohio, and Indiana are the chief corn growing states. The corn is used for the fattening of cattle and hogs, so that an immense meat packing industry has grown up in the corn belt, as these states are called. Wheat is the big crop in Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, Indiana, and in the states adjoining the Canadian border. Oats, barley, and rye are raised in large quantities in all the states, while in many parts, flax is cultivated for the oil from its seeds. Sugar beets and potatoes, grown chiefly in Michigan and Wisconsin, celery, apples, and grapes in Michigan, and hay in Ohio are other important crops. Tobacco is cultivated on a large scale in Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, and Wisconsin. The western section of the northern states is given over chiefly to ranching. Millions of horses, cattle, and sheep wander over the ranges almost at will. Sheep, cattle, and horses are raised in immense numbers in the plateau states. As the grass is everywhere somewhat thin and the water scarce, the herds have to be moved frequently and large ranges are needed. But while the grass is sufficient for pasturage, there is, in general, not sufficient rain for the growing of crops. Recourse, therefore, has been had to irrigation. Since its introduction, the Great American Desert, as this district was formerly called, has completely changed. Marvelous results have been achieved. Large crops of sugar beets, alfalfa, wheat, and other grains are grown, but more attention is paid to the cultivation of small fruits and vegetables. Agriculture is of the greatest importance in the three states along the Pacific coast. Washington and Oregon grow wheat, barley, hops, and sugar beets, and the rich soil of the valleys yields wonderful crops of apples, plums, strawberries, and small fruits generally. California grows wheat, barley, and sugar beets, but its most valuable crop is fruit. The subtropical climate, the even temperature, and the ample sunshine bring all kinds of fruits, temperate and tropical, to perfection. Oranges, lemons, grapefruit, figs, grapes, apples, plums, pears, apricots, and olives, as well as almonds and walnuts. Fruit farming is carried on scientifically, assisted by the most modern methods of irrigation. The fruit is carefully packed and shipped so that it reaches the markets of the world in first-class condition. Side by side with fruit growing, there is a large industry in the canning of fruit and in the drying of grapes into raisins and of plums into prunes. Stock raising and dairy farming are of importance. The butter, milk, and cheese from the farms find a ready sale. There are also large sheep ranches, and poultry raising is engaging the attention of more and more farmers. End of section 23. Recording by Doug Shepard. Section 24 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Shepherd. Ontario Public School Geography by the Educational Book Company of Toronto, Section 24. North America, the United States of America, Part 2. Fishing. As in Nova Scotia, fishing is one of the principal industries of New England. The irregular coastline, with its many small snug harbors, and the proximity of the rich fishing grounds of the Grand Banks, have favored the development of the fisheries. Cod, halibut, mackerel, and herring are the principal fish caught. Lobsters are trapped near the shore, while oysters, clams, and scallops are found in abundance in the shallow waters along the coast. The lakes and streams of Maine are filled with excellent freshwater fish. The canning of lobsters and fish is a flourishing industry. Fishing is not so important an industry in the Middle Atlantic states as it is in New England. The Grand Banks are too far away, and the fishermen find it more profitable to reap the harvest of shad, bluefish, and mackerel, which swarm along the coast. Shad roe is shipped in large quantities, especially to New York. Oysters are plentiful along the coast, particularly in Chesapeake Bay. The collecting and shipping of oysters is very profitable and gives employment to a large number of people. Salmon fishing is one of the great industries of Washington and Oregon, as it is of British Columbia. Connected with the fishing is the canning of the product. Tuna are also caught along the Pacific coast. Lumbering. Although New England and the Middle States have been cleared of much of their forest growth, there are still large timber areas. Pine, spruce, and hemlock are the principal softwoods, while white oak, ash, maple, and birch are the chief of the harder woods. Lumbering is carried on in the same way as it is in Canada. Much of the forest product is used in the manufacture of paper. Another important forest product is tannic acid, which is made from the bark of the hemlock and is used in the tanning of leather. There is much valuable timber in the mountain sections of the southern Atlantic states. Oak, ash, maple, hickory, walnut, and birch are the principal trees. Georgia pine is much used for floors and interior fittings, while the southern pine is equally valuable. Stretching from North Carolina to Florida is a huge belt of pine forest, from which is obtained nine-tenths of the world's supply of turpentine, tar, and resin. Wood alcohol and tannic acid are also obtained from these pines. All of the southern Mississippi states, with the exception of Texas, have extensive hardwood forests. Indeed, Louisiana ranks next to the states of Washington and New York in the value of its forest products. In connection with the lumbering industry, the manufacture of furniture, doors, and window sashes is becoming of great importance. Lumbering in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota is a leading industry. Most of the lumber is used for home manufacture. The principal trees are spruce, white pine, cedar, and hemlock. There are large districts in Ohio which are well covered with hardwood, such as maple, birch, and oak. There are many forest areas among the mountains of the Plateau states. Practically the whole forest region is under very careful supervision. The settlers are allowed a certain amount of wood for fuel, but if they want more, they must pay for it. The lumbermen are allowed to cut only such trees as are marked by government inspectors. The trees are principally pine, spruce, and hemlock, although birch and poplar are plentiful. In the Pacific states, lumbering is mainly confined to the immense forests of Washington and Oregon. The forests there are similar to those of British Columbia, and lumbering operations are carried on in much the same way. Washington stands first in the United States in the value of its forest products. In California, the enormous redwood trees are prized for their beautiful wood, much in demand for interior decoration. In some districts they are carefully preserved, but in others, they are being ruthlessly sacrificed. Some of these trees grow to a height of 300 feet. Minerals Coal is widely distributed in the United States. With the exception of the New England states, this valuable mineral is found in every section of the country. There are large deposits in Tennessee and Alabama, in Oklahoma, in all the northern Mississippi states, in all the Plateau states, and in Washington. Most important of all are the rich mines of Pennsylvania, which, in addition to a very large output of bituminous coal, produce almost all the anthracite coal that is mined in the world. Iron also is found in many places. 
There are large deposits close to the coal mines of Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Alabama. The richest and most productive iron mines, however, are in the states bordering on Lake Superior. This district is the main source of supply for the smelters of Pennsylvania. In the smelting of iron, limestone and coke are necessary. Large beds of limestone in Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Alabama, close to the coal and iron mines, have helped these states to become the leading states in iron production in the whole country. Petroleum is another mineral product of outstanding importance. A few years ago, Pennsylvania was the leading producer of this valuable mineral. At that time, the oil wells of Pennsylvania were gushers. That is, the oil was so plentiful and the pressure of gas beneath so powerful that the oil was thrown high above the surface of the ground. Now all the wells have to be pumped. The crude oil is sent through pipelines from the wells to the refineries, where it is manufactured into coal oil, gasoline, benzene, Vaseline, paraffin, and many other products. California is now the leading state in the Union in the production of petroleum. Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and all the northern Mississippi states also are rich in petroleum. Natural gas is also found in the coal and petroleum-bearing areas of the United States, providing a cheap and convenient fuel for local use. Many metals, in addition to iron, are mined in great quantities. Lead and zinc mines are in operation in Missouri, and copper mines in the area around Lake Superior. The Plateau states yield gold, silver, copper, and lead. California, in addition to a large output of gold, also possesses valuable deposits of mercury. Among the other mineral products of the United States may be mentioned, salt, produced in large quantities in New York State, Louisiana, Texas, and Utah, building and pottery clays, especially valuable in the Middle Atlantic and Northern Mississippi states, building stone of many varieties, marble, quarried extensively in New England and Colorado, phosphate, found in Florida and South Carolina, mica, mined chiefly in North Carolina, and soda and borax, found in the desert regions of California. Manufactures The magnificent water and electric power available almost everywhere in New England, the proximity to the coal fields of Pennsylvania, the excellent harbors along the coast, and the numerous railways are the chief reasons for the growth of this region as a great manufacturing district. More than half the people are employed in factories. The principal manufactures are cotton, woolen, and leather goods, silk, furniture, boots and shoes, wood pulp and paper, hardware and cutlery, watches and jewelry, and dress granite and marble. So many factories are in operation in the numerous cities and towns of the Middle Atlantic states that even to make a list of the manufactured products would take up many pages. A few only of the more important need to be noted in addition to those already mentioned. One of the most flourishing is the glass industry, which has its center in Pittsburgh. The success of this industry is due to the presence of large deposits of pure sand and to the abundant supply of natural gas, which affords the best heat for glass blowing. Cotton, woolen, silk, leather, and boot and shoe factories employ thousands of operators. The factories which produce ready-made clothing, whiteware, shirts, collars, and articles of a similar nature employ tens of thousands more. The Middle Atlantic states are abundantly supplied with coal, natural gas, and water power, and all these have made possible the giant strides taken during the last half century in manufacturing. Water power is being recognized as of increasing importance. For instance, the power provided by the streams flowing from the Adirondack Mountains of New York State, together with the forests which clothe the mountains, have built up there the largest paper-making industry in the United States. Again, the electricity generated from Niagara Falls has helped to make Buffalo and other nearby cities great manufacturing centers. There is ample water power in every state in the Middle Atlantic states. There is no reason why the South Atlantic states should not become great manufacturing centers. Water power is abundant on the Piedmont Plateau, and these states have the necessary raw material. Until very recently, however, manufacturing was not an important industry there. For many years, the planters were accustomed to ship their entire cotton crop to the northern United States and to Europe, but now North Carolina is second only to Massachusetts as a cotton manufacturing state. There are many factories for the canning of fruit and vegetables and for the manufacture of tobacco. 
In addition to the manufacture of iron and steel products, furniture, etc., already mentioned, there are in the southern Mississippi states many cotton factories and sugar refineries. One industry has recently grown up which promises well for the future of these states. In former years, the seeds of the cotton were thrown away as worthless, but now they are saved, and from them is extracted an oil known as cotton seed oil. This oil is used in the making of oleomargarine and soap, and as a substitute for olive oil. The part of the seed that remains after the oil has been extracted is used as cattle fodder. The meat packing industry of the northern Mississippi states has already been referred to as of great importance. Tens of thousands of men are employed in the stockyards and packing plants in Chicago, Kansas City, Omaha, and other cities. Much of the meat is sold fresh, but a great deal is canned for export. Hog fat is used for lard, and cattle fat for the making of oleomargarine. The hides are tanned for leather, the horns and hoofs are used for making glue, the bones for buttons and combs, and the refining of sugar, the hair for upholstery and plaster, and the blood for fertilizer. Even the bristles from the ears of the hogs are used in the making of brushes for children's paint boxes. Nothing is wasted in the packing plants. The other important manufacturers of these states can merely be mentioned. These are agricultural implements to supply the enormous demand of the farming regions close at hand. Automobiles, carriages, iron and steel goods, furniture, wood pulp, flour, ready-made clothing, boots and shoes, gasoline and coal oil, and textiles of various kinds. This section is second only to the middle states of the Atlantic in the variety and extent of its manufactures. In the plateau states there is plenty of water power furnished by the mountain streams, but this power has so far not been extensively developed. At present it is used chiefly for the generating of electricity to furnish light and power for the mines and the smelters. Manufactures in the Pacific states are rapidly increasing, partly on account of the excellent water power available, partly on account of the opening of the Panama Canal, and partly on account of the development of trade with Asia, South America, the Philippines, and Alaska. The most important are the canning of fruits, vegetables, and salmon, meat packing, fruit drying, flour milling, the making of condensed milk, the refining of sugar and petroleum, the smelting of ores, shipbuilding, and the manufacture of lumber products, such as furniture, shingles, glass, and fence pickets. Transportation. Railway lines cover the United States running in all directions. Many lines cross the Rocky Mountains, thus connecting the vast eastern territory with the states of the Pacific coast. In fact, the United States has a greater railway mileage than any other country in the world. The Mississippi River, with its tributaries, forms a gigantic system of waterways which leads almost from the Canadian border on the north to the Gulf of Mexico on the south and serve the entire region lying between the Rockies on the west and the Appalachians on the east. Lake Michigan lies wholly within the territory of the United States. The southern half of the other Great Lakes belongs to that country. Ore from Duluth can thus be carried down the Great Lakes entirely through United States territory to Cleveland or Buffalo and thence by rail to the smelters of Pittsburgh. Waterways such as the Erie Barge Canal, which connects New York with Buffalo, have been a boon to the commerce of the districts through which they pass. In its railways and its waterways, the United States has unrivaled advantages for the development of trade within its own borders. Trade The United States, so far as its natural resources and its manufacturing facilities are concerned, is probably the most self-contained nation in the world today. When we think of its iron and coal, its wheat and its corn, its fish, its cattle and sheep, its sugarcane, rice and cotton, its timber, its oil and its fruits, we see that within itself the country produces practically everything that is really necessary for its population. If we accept rubber, silk, coffee, tea, currants, spices and products of a similar nature, the United States needs to import very little either in the way of raw materials or of manufactured products. With these great resources and a population of over 122 million, we can easily see how great must be the interchange of products among the various parts of the country. The external trade is also very large. Canada is the best customer of the United States, 
buying many hundreds of millions of dollars worth of goods annually. Immense shipments, especially of foodstuffs, are sent to Europe. There is also a large trade with South America, Asia, Australia, and in fact with every part of the world. Cities The city of Washington, the capital of the United States, is situated on the Potomac River in the District of Columbia, a small tract of land set aside in 1790 as the location of the capital. It is beautifully laid out and contains the White House, which is the residence of the President, and the Capitol Building, where Congress assembles. Other beautiful and imposing structures are the Library of Congress and the Pension Building. Situated on a magnificent harbor at the mouth of the Hudson River is New York. With a population of nearly 7 million, it is the financial, commercial, and industrial center of the United States. Through it passes the greater part of the exports and imports of the country, so that its shipping trade is enormous. Hundreds of thousands of people are employed in various manufactures within the city. Its parks, museums, art galleries, and public buildings are famous all over the world. It is also the art, musical, educational, and publishing center for the entire country. The largest and most important city of the northern states of the Mississippi Basin is Chicago, on Lake Michigan the second largest city of the United States. It is especially noted for its stockyards, nearly a square mile in extent, and for its packing plants. Its situation close to the corn, coal, iron, and lumber regions, and its excellent rail and water connections have made it one of the greatest manufacturing cities in the world. It has handsome public and educational buildings, museums, art galleries, and beautiful parks and avenues. At the head of ocean navigation on the Delaware River is Philadelphia, the third largest city of the United States. It has excellent railway connections, is close to the iron and steel districts, and has large shipping interests and many manufacturers. The city is the chief center for the manufacture of locomotives. Boston, the largest and most important city in New England, has a fine harbor and has the additional advantage of being within easy reach of at least 20 large manufacturing towns. The greater part of the commerce of these towns passes through Boston. The city is noted for its trade in foodstuffs, wool, and leather, and for its extensive shipping interests. It has beautiful parks, fine public buildings, and large educational and charitable institutions. Across the Charles River from Boston is Cambridge, the seat of Harvard College, one of the oldest universities of the United States. Providence, the second city in New England, is situated on the Providence River. It has large manufacturers and a growing shipping trade. The third city, Worcester, near Boston, has large iron and steel and wire works. Baltimore is situated near the head of Chesapeake Bay on a good harbor. It is an important shipping point and a center for the trade in canned fruits, vegetables, and oysters. The manufacture of clothing and tobacco and meat packing are other industries. Many railways center in Pittsburgh, which is situated at a point where two small rivers join to form the Ohio River. The city has large manufactures of iron and steel goods and plate glass. Buffalo, at the eastern end of Lake Erie, has direct shipping connections with the Upper Lakes and has many large manufacturers. The most important city of the southern Mississippi states is New Orleans, situated about 100 miles up the Mississippi and easily reached by ocean-going vessels. The ground on which the city is built is below the level of the river, but protection is afforded by high, strong embankments called levees. New Orleans is a great shipping port and has many manufacturers. The large cities of the northern Mississippi states are numerous. On Lake Superior are Superior and Duluth, both with excellent harbors and a large shipping trade in grain and ore. St. Paul and Minneapolis on the Mississippi River are commercial and manufacturing cities, the latter being the leading flour milling city in the United States. St. Louis on the Mississippi has a large water trade and many manufacturers. Omaha and Kansas City have large packing plants and are important railway centers. Cleveland on Lake Erie is noted for its oil refining and shipbuilding and for its lake carrying trade. The manufacture of automobiles has added much to the prosperity of Detroit, the fourth city in size in the Republic. Cincinnati is a large commercial and manufacturing center, as is Milwaukee on Lake Michigan. Indianapolis is situated in the midst of the Corn Belt, 
Louisville, on the Ohio River, is the largest tobacco market in the world and has many other manufactures. The largest and most important city in the Plateau states is Denver in Colorado. It is a railway city with many large smelters. Its situation and climate are so healthful that invalids visit the city in large numbers. Salt Lake City in Utah lies in the midst of a fertile district and is the home of the Mormon Church. The Mormon Tabernacle there is a magnificent building. San Francisco, situated on a peninsula lying between San Francisco Bay and the Pacific Ocean, to which it has access through the Golden Gate, is a very busy shipping, commercial, and manufacturing city. It has one of the finest harbors on the continent, and through it passes much of the trade with the Orient. It also has large shipbuilding yards and many sugar refineries. In 1906, the city was almost destroyed by an earthquake, but the energy of its inhabitants soon restored it from its ruins. Across the bay from San Francisco is Berkeley, the terminus of several railways from across the mountains. Los Angeles, with a harbor on the coast, is the fifth city in size in the United States, and is the commercial metropolis of Southern California. It lies in the midst of the oil and fruit districts. Portland, on the Willamette River, is the commercial and manufacturing center of Oregon. Seattle, situated on a splendid harbor on Puget Sound, has had phenomenal growth. It has a large shipping trade with Alaska and with China and Japan, and is the terminus for several transcontinental roads. It has an important shipbuilding industry, as well as many factories. The Territory of Alaska The peninsula of Alaska occupies the northwestern corner of North America. Alaska includes the Aleutian Islands, which stretch in a long chain over a thousand miles out into the Pacific Ocean. Its area is nearly one and a half times that of Ontario. Its present population is about 60,000, of whom the greater number are Indians and Eskimos. The surface of Alaska is very mountainous. The Rocky Mountain Highland grows narrower there and contains several high peaks, such as Mount McKinley and Mount St. Elias. The Yukon River, which has its source in Canada, flows across Alaska and empties into the Bering Sea. The central and northern district is a broad plateau, for the most part bare of trees, broken occasionally by mountains and dotted with many lakes and swamps. The climate is much the same as that of the Yukon Territory, except that the warm ocean winds temper that of the coastal regions. Many of the harbors along the coast are free from ice all the year round. Products The greatest wealth of Alaska lies in its minerals. Gold, silver, and copper are the principal, but there is plenty of coal and petroleum. The bays along the coast abound with salmon, which are caught in immense numbers and canned for shipment. Quite an important trade is carried on between Alaska and the cities of the Pacific coast. Supplies for the stores and mining camps are shipped in, and millions of dollars worth of the country's products are exported every year. While there are extensive forests, spreading over an area covering nearly 40,000 square miles, and yielding mostly red and yellow cedar and spruce, yet little timber is cut, owing to the many difficulties of transportation and to the rough nature of the country. During the short summer, it is possible to raise potatoes and other vegetables. There are many large herds of reindeer in the territory, and on the islands are to be found not only reindeer, but also caribou, otter, seals, and other animals. There, too, a few fishermen make their homes. Towns Nome, Juneau, and Wrangell are the principal places on the coast, while Fairbanks is an important center in the interior. End of section 24. Recording by Doug Shepard. Section 25 of Ontario Public School Geography. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Ontario Public School Geography by the Ontario Department of Education. Section 25. Mexico. Position, Extent, and People. Mexico, including the peninsulas of Yucatan and Lower California, lies between the United States on the north and Central America on the south. In area, it is about one-fifth as large as Canada, but it has a population almost one-half greater. A large part of the population of Mexico is made up of peons, 
or laboring class. The peons are poor, lazy, and ignorant. They are the workers in the mines, in the fields, and on the ranches. They live in houses built of sun-dried bricks called adobes, usually with one room for the whole family. The ruling class in Mexico are the descendants of the original Spanish settlers. The foreign population, who live principally in the cities and in the mining districts, have been attracted by the commercial and mining activities of the country. Surface and Coastline the surface of Mexico is divided naturally into four distinct sections. First, there is a coastal plain along the Gulf of Mexico, which in Yucatan widens out until it includes the greater part of the peninsula. Along the Pacific coast, there is a similar plain. Rising abruptly from the plain on both the eastern and western sides is a series of rugged mountains, which gradually come together as the country narrows toward the south. Lying between these ranges is a high plateau, which occupies the greater part of the interior. This plateau is varied by low mountain ranges. South of the central plateau is a region of high mountains and lofty volcanic peaks. The highest of these, Mount Orihaba, Star Mountain, and Mount Popocatapetl, Smoking Mountain, are covered with snow and ice even during the hottest months of the year. The peninsula of Lower California is mountainous and almost desert. The rivers, with the exception of the Rio Grande, are short and, owing to their rapid fall from the mountains close to the coast, are of little use for navigation. Dotting the central plateau are thousands of small, shallow lakes, which add much to the beauty of the scenery. The coastline is regular on both the eastern and western sides, with few bays and only two or three good harbors. Climate The climate of Mexico varies greatly according to the altitude and the distance from the sea. The Mexicans themselves speak of their country as divided into three regions, hot, temperate, and cold. The coastal plain of the Gulf of Mexico and the mountain slopes to a height of about 3,000 feet are included in the hot region, with hot summers and warm winters. The northeast trade winds provide plenty of moisture. The climate is tropical, with the trees, swamps, flowers, animals, and birds peculiar to the tropics. The west coast along the Pacific is very hot and dry, while the southern district, lying between the Pacific and Gulf of Mexico, is not so warm and is much more moist. Included in the temperate region are the higher mountain slopes to a height of 6,000 or 7,000 feet, and the greater part of the central plateau. The plateau is shut off from the influence of the trade winds. Consequently, it is in many places so arid that irrigation must be employed. The cold region includes the high mountains towering above and to the south of the plateau. Industries Although the farms of Mexico yield heavy crops of cereals, fruits, cotton, tobacco, and other products, the chief source of the country's wealth is in its mines. Some of the gold and silver mines, still extraordinarily rich, were worked by the Indians before the Spaniards conquered the country. Valuable minerals are found from one end of Mexico to the other. At one place there is a mountain which is a solid mass of iron ore. Productive petroleum wells are in operation on the coastal plain. There are rich mines of copper, zinc, lead, sulfur, and quicksilver. Most of the precious and semi-precious stones are found, such as emeralds, opals, jasper, garnets, topazes, and turquoises. Until recent years, the mining methods employed were exceedingly crude, and transportation was difficult, so that the industry did not prosper as it might have done. Now, with the introduction of modern methods and the building of railways, mining has made great strides forward. The mineral products at present form almost three-quarters of the total exports of the country. Manufacturing has not been one of the leading industries of Mexico. For this, the ignorance and the laziness of the people are partly responsible. But the main reason is the absence of coal. Of late years, however, water power has been developed and more factories are being built. The most important manufactures are cotton, 
tobacco, earthenware, leather, and iron and steel products. In the homes of the people, rugs, blankets, hats, hammocks, and ornamental leather goods are manufactured, and they find a ready sale, especially to the traveling public. Cities and Towns The city of Mexico, the capital and largest city, nestles among the mountains at the southern end of the central plateau. It has many old buildings dating back to the days of the Spanish occupation, and side by side with these are modern business structures. The cathedral is one of the most beautiful buildings in America. Near at hand on the plateau is Puebla, one of the oldest of the Spanish cities, and now a manufacturing center. Veracruz, owing to the recent deepening of its harbor, has become the chief port on the Gulf of Mexico, and Tampico also has a considerable trade, especially in petroleum. Acapulco, on the Pacific side, has an excellent harbor and is a coal station for vessels. End of chapter 25section twenty six of ontario public school geography this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by larry wilson ontario public school geography by the ontario department of education section twenty six central america Position, Extent, and People Lying between Mexico and South America on the narrow neck of land known as Central America are six small republics, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama, and one British colony, British Honduras. All these touch upon both the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea, with the exception of British Honduras, which lies along the Caribbean. There is also the Panama Canal Zone, which belongs to the United States. Central America has an area somewhat more than half as great as that of Ontario, and a population twice as large. The population of Central America is made up of whites of Spanish descent, Indians, and half-breeds. There are many Negroes. The Spanish language is spoken, and Spanish customs prevail. Progress has been much hindered by the ignorance of the people and by the unstable character of the governments. Surface and Climate The surface of Central America, except in Panama, is extremely mountainous, with the highest elevation near the Pacific coast. On the higher mountains are huge forests of oak and pine. About 40 active volcanoes are known, and destructive earthquakes are frequent. Many plateaus and deep valleys are found among the mountains. The coastal plain on the east is low, swampy, and very unhealthy. The country is well watered by many rivers. As Central America lies between the Tropic of Cancer and the equator, the climate is tropical. The northeast trade winds blow over the country and bring an abundance of rain, particularly on the east coast. Industries the lowlands of Central America are covered by a dense tropical forest. Mahogany, rosewood, logwood, and rubber trees abound. The cutting of mahogany alone employs thousands of the poorer natives. Bananas, oranges, coconuts, and other tropical fruits are cultivated and exported in immense quantities. Coffee, sugarcane, cacao, and tobacco are grown. There are large stretches of pasture land among the mountains, on which cattle, horses, and sheep are raised. Beans, corn, and potatoes are raised mainly for home consumption. Gold and silver are the principal minerals, but the mines are little worked. There is very little manufacturing. Cities and Towns The cities and towns are not large, and there are but few that are worth mentioning. The largest city, Guatemala, is in the center of the rich coffee district. Other important cities are San Salvador, Panama, Managua, and Tegucigalpa. The Panama Canal Zone 
In 1903, the United States obtained the concession of a narrow zone of land from the Panama Republic, and undertook to dig a canal across the Isthmus of Panama at the expense of the government. The first care of the engineers in charge was to make the zone safe for the workmen. The forests with their tangled undergrowths were cleared away, the swamps were drained in order to destroy the disease-carrying mosquitoes, and sanitary devices were installed. An immense number of workmen were employed, and an enormous amount of material was used. Part of the route of the canal is through Gayoon Lake, which is 85 feet above sea level. Locks at each side of the lake were, therefore, necessary. At the end of ten years, the work was completed, and the canal was open to the commerce of all nations. The Panama Canal is of great importance to Canada, as it very much shortens the sea route between Montreal, Quebec, St. John, and Halifax on the Atlantic, and Victoria, Vancouver, and Prince Rupert on the Pacific. The sea route to Asia from the eastern coast of Canada is also very much shortened, as is also the distance by sea between the western coast of Canada and Europe. Colón and Panama at the eastern entrance, and Balboa within the zone at the western entrance, are supply and repair stations for ships passing through the canal. End of chapter 26section twenty seven of ontario public school geography this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson ontario public school geography by the ontario department of education section twenty seven the West Indies and Bermuda. General. Lying to the east of Mexico and Central America and to the north of South America are several groups of islands, large and small, known as the West Indies. The four largest islands, Cuba, Haiti, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico, are frequently called the Greater Antilles, while the Lesser Antilles include all the smaller islands with the exception of the Bahamas. The islands entirely enclose the Caribbean Sea, and with the peninsulas of Florida and Yucatan almost shut in the Gulf of Mexico. For the most part, the West Indies belong to various European powers, but Haiti, which includes the two Negro republics of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and Cuba are independent. Jamaica, Trinidad, the Bahamas, Barbados, the Leeward Islands, the Windward Islands, and a number of smaller islands are part of our own empire. Puerto Rico and the small islands of St. Thomas, St. Croix, and St. John belong to the United States. France owns Guadalupe and Martinique, and there are some small islands under the rule of the Netherlands. Surface and Climate With the exception of the Bahamas, all the islands are mountainous, although on some of the larger islands there are low coastal plains. There are many coral islands, some raised above the surface and some in process of formation. Many of the mountains are volcanic, but in only a few cases in recent years has there been any activity. The eruption in 1902 of Mount Pele on the island of Martinique was accompanied by great loss of life. In the same year, an eruption of the Sufire a volcano which was supposed to be dormant, laid waste a large part of the island of St. Vincent. Five years later in Jamaica, a violent earthquake caused great destruction both of life and of property. The climate of the West Indies is tropical. They lie in the path of the northeast trade winds, so that the northeastern parts have an abundance of rain, while the western and southern parts are not so well provided with moisture. The rainy season begins about the end of the summer. From July to October, the islands are frequently visited by tropical hurricanes, which do much damage and are dreaded by the inhabitants. Cuba Cuba, with the Isle of Pines and other small islands, has an area about 44,000 square miles and a population a little larger than that of Ontario. The people are mainly of Spanish descent, but there are many Negroes and half-breeds. 
Much of the surface is very mountainous, but there are large coastal plains and an extensive interior lowland. Vegetation is exceeding luxuriant. The forests contain valuable woods such as mahogany, ebony, and cedar. The principal crops are sugarcane, tobacco, coffee, and rice. All the tropical fruits grow in abundance, especially pineapples, bananas, limes, and oranges. Cattle, horses, and mules are raised on the rich grass of the mountain slopes. Sugar and tobacco are the leading manufacturers. There is an enormous export trade in cigars, which are packed in boxes made from the native cedar. Copper and iron are mined. There are many excellent harbors along the coast, the most important of which is Havana, the capital. Santiago, on the south side of the island, has also a good harbor. Puerto Rico. At the close of the Spanish-American War in 1898, Puerto Rico, which up to that time had been a colonial possession of Spain, was surrendered to the United States. The population is about 1,550,000, almost four-fifths of whom are white, the remainder being Negroes and half-breeds. Puerto Rico is about one and a half times as large as Prince Edward Island. A range of mountains runs through the islands from east to west, but there are large coastal plains. The plantations are mainly on these plains and on the lower mountain slopes. There is little manufacturing except sugar, cigars, and cigarettes. Oranges, grapefruits, pineapples, and vegetables are largely exported, mainly to the United States. San Juan, the capital, is the principal city. Haiti Haiti is about 400 miles in length, with a breadth varying from 60 to 150 miles. The surface is mountainous, with long, deep valleys and many lakes. Covering the mountains are dense forests, which supply mahogany, logwood, ebony, and other valuable woods. Coffee and cacao are exported. The mountains are rich in unworked minerals. Port-au-Prince is the chief city of Haiti. Santo Domingo is the capital of the Dominican Republic. Jamaica Jamaica is twice as large as Prince Edward Island and has a population of about 975,000. Sixty percent of the people are Negroes and half-breeds. Forested mountain ranges separated by deep narrow valleys cover the island. The coastline is in some parts low, with a gentle slope from the hills. In other parts it is steep and rugged. There are a number of good harbors, including Kingston, the capital. The products are much the same as those of other West India islands. Sugar, rum, molasses, cacao beans, cocoa nuts, coffee, bananas, oranges, vegetables, and spices, particularly ginger. Bananas are the chief export. Tobacco and sisal are now being cultivated with advantage to the island. Trinidad Sixteen miles off the coast of Venezuela is the island of Trinidad, a crown colony of Great Britain. It is less than half the size of Jamaica and contains a population of about 400,000. Of this number, about 130,000 are East Indians, who came originally to work on the plantations. The chief products are sugar, coconuts, cacao beans, rice, coffee, and rubber. Asphalt is obtained from the famous Pitch Lake. Petroleum is the only other mineral product of importance. The capital, Port of Spain, has a well-protected harbor. The Bahama Islands It was on San Salvador, one of the islands of the Bahamas, that Christopher Columbus made his first landing in the New World. The group extends in a chain 600 miles in length from near the coast of Florida to Haiti. About 40 of the 700 low coral islands are inhabited, mostly by Negroes and half-breeds. Although the soil is not very fertile and there are frequent droughts, cotton, oranges, lemons, pineapples, and vegetables are grown for export as well as for home use. Sponges and turtles are obtained in the coast waters and there are salt beds on some of the islands. Many people from Canada and the United States are attracted to the Bahamas each year by the delightful winter climate. Nassau, situated on the island of New Providence, is the capital. The smaller islands. The lesser Antilles have the same general characteristics as the larger islands already described. 
Most of the people are Negroes. The products are mainly tropical fruits, sugar, rum, molasses, tobacco, cotton, dyes, and spices. The principal islands belonging to Great Britain are the Leeward Islands, the Windward Islands, and Barbados. Barbados is a favorite winter resort for tourists from Canada and the United States. Its capital is Bridgetown. The population of all these islands is a little over half a million. The Bermuda Islands The Bermudas are a group of about 360 small coral islands, only 20 of which are inhabited. They do not form part of the West Indies. The soil is not very fertile, but it is carefully cultivated all the year round. The principal exports are potatoes, onions, Easter lilies, lily bulbs, bananas, and arrowroot. The islands are used as a naval station by the British Admiralty. Hamilton is the capital and leading center. The islands may be reached easily from Halifax or New York by steamer and are, like Barbados, a favorite winter resort for people from Canada and the United States. End of chapter 27section 28 of ontario public school geography this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson ontario public school geography by the educational book company of toronto section 28 south america the continent as a whole Map questions. What ocean is east of South America? West of it? At what cape do they meet? What large sea is between South America and the West Indies? What is the name of the narrow land bridge connecting North and South America? What large island forms the southern tip of South America? What strait separates this island from the mainland? What group of islands is almost due east of the Atlantic entrance to the Strait of Magellan? What is the general shape of both North and South America? Which continent has the more regular coastline? Where is Cape St. Rock? Bahia Blanca? The Gulf of Guayaquil? How many highlands are there in South America? Name them. Which corresponds to the Rocky Mountain Highland in North America? To the Appalachian Highland? To the Laurentian Highland? Near what ocean is the highest highland in both continents? In what zone do you live? In what direction from your home is South America? In what zones is South America? What part of South America is in the South Temperate Zone? What part is in the Torrid Zone? Which part is larger? Find on the map a large river flowing near the equator. In what highland does it rise? In what direction does it flow? Which has the hotter climate, the valley of the Amazon or that of the St. Lawrence? Why? Where is the Orinoco River? What highland partly separates the valley of the Orinoco River from that of the Amazon River? Into what ocean do both the Orinoco River and the Amazon River empty? Find the Plata River. What large river empties into it? Between what highlands does the Parana River flow? Into what ocean does it empty? Why are there no large rivers flowing into the Pacific? How many countries are there in South America? Name those which front on the Pacific Ocean. What countries have an Atlantic coastline? What ones front on the Caribbean Sea? Name those which are entirely inland countries. What countries of South America are entirely within the Torrid Zone? What countries are partly in the Torrid and partly in the South Temperate Zone? What is the only country of South America entirely in the South Temperate Zone? Shape and Size South America, like its sister continent of North America, is triangular in shape. The northern continent is, however, the larger of the two by over two million square miles. Structure 
Along the whole western side of the continent there is a broad belt of lofty mountain chains, which turns to the east at the far north and ends at the shore of the Caribbean Sea. These are the mighty Andes Mountains, the longest continuous mountain range in the world. Many of the peaks tower high above the lower ridges. The loftiest of them are crowned with eternal snow. Some are rough and jagged in outline, others form regular cones. The latter are volcanic peaks, which have been built up around volcanoes by the lava poured out during eruptions. In the central and northern part of the Andes, the belt of mountainous country is widest. Here are broad plateaus, king between parallel mountain chains. Farther south, the mountains become narrow, and instead of wide tablelands, there are several long, narrow valleys which run parallel with the coast. Between the mountains and the sea lies a narrow coastal plain along the whole length of the continent, except at the southern extremity, where the mountains rise right from the shore. South America has other mountains, small indeed when compared with the mighty Andes, but still of considerable height and extent. On a northeast coast is a mountainous district lying between the valleys of the Amazon and the Orinoco rivers. On the north it is separated from the northern Andes by a wide plain. These mountains are the Guiana Highlands. The Brazilian Highlands are much more extensive. They stretch from the valley of the Plata River to Cape St. Rock and extend for a long distance inland. These two areas with the Andes form the skeleton of the continent. The rest of it consists for the most part of vast low plains which cover the whole continent between the mountainous regions. The Western Coast From the Isthmus of Panama to the Gulf of Guayaquil, there is a heavy tropical rainfall over the whole coastal plain and the western mountain slopes. It is greatest in summer, for then all the northern part of the continent is heated to a high degree by the direct rays of the sun and forms an area of low pressure toward which the winds blow from the ocean. There is a dense tropical forest growing in the rich, moist soil. Bamboos of many varieties abound, and palms are numerous. Back in the mountains, the river valleys have a more temperate climate, since they are high above the level of the sea. In them, sugar cane, bananas, lemons, and oranges grow well. More important still is the cacao tree. This tree grows from 15 to 30 feet high, and looks much like a big lilac bush. It bears a large fruit about the size of a big cucumber, containing about 30 seeds embedded in white pulp. Each seed is about the size of a lima bean and is dark brown in color. From these seeds, chocolate and cocoa are manufactured. Cacao trees are found almost everywhere in tropical South America, and their cultivation is one of the great industries of the continent. For almost 2,000 miles south from the Gulf of Guayaquil to the coastal plain is a long strip of sandy desert. This part of South America lies in the belt of the southeast trades, which bring abundant rain to the eastern coast of the continent. By the time they have reached the Andes, they have lost much of their moisture, and what is left is condensed as snow upon the lofty mountain peaks. Therefore, the land lying to the west of the mountains is parched. Here and there, the long desert strip is broken by rivers which, fed by the melting snow of the Andes, have sufficient volume of water to force their way across the sand into the Pacific. The valleys of these rivers are extremely fertile. In them can be seen green fields of sugar cane, looking much like the fields of Indian corn, and fields of rice, of tobacco, and of cotton, as well as orchards with almost every variety of tropical fruit. The desert, apart from the river valleys, is not entirely valueless. Part of it is underlaid by a vast bed of mineral called nitrate of soda. Many men work in the nitrate beds, blasting out the mineral and preparing it for shipment. Much of it is used to make nitric acid, but more is used to fertilize land. The west coast from about 35 degrees south to the tip of the continent lies within the belt of the westerlies. It is therefore well watered, for the westerly winds yield their moisture when cooled by the wall of the Andes. This rough and rugged coast is heavily timbered with pines. 
Few people except Indians live in this part of the continent. The Andes. The Andes are full of mineral wealth. Gold and silver are abundant in the northern ranges. Tin and copper are also plentiful. Although several railways have been built from coast towns to the most important mining districts, much of the transport of goods over the mountains is done by llamas. The llama is an odd-looking animal, about four feet six inches in height, with a long neck, a head like that of a camel, and long slender legs something like those of a deer. It is covered with straight hair, sometimes all white, sometimes blotched with black. The llama can carry a load of 100 pounds and is as sure-footed as a goat. The Andes are the home of the biggest bird that flies. This is the condor, a huge vulture. The condors soar high above the mountain peaks until they see some animal dead or dying on the ground. Then they come down to the feast, for, like all vultures, they are carrion birds and prefer to gorge upon dead carcasses rather than to catch their prey alive. The mountain valleys of the Andes are fertile farmlands. The great plateaus, however, are not so fertile, and some of them are so high and cold that even our hardy northern cereals will not mature upon them. These plateaus are the original home of the potato, which grows wild in many places there. From this region the potato has been taken to all lands and now forms one of the great food crops of the world. The Andean potatoes are quite unlike those we grow in Canada. They are not much larger than walnuts and of such poor appearance that no Canadian farmer would sell them. Yet they are one of the principal articles of diet of the Indians who live on these bleak plateaus. The eastern slopes of the Andes are covered with forests from the north of the continent down as far as 35 degrees south, where the belt of the trade winds ends. Two important medicinal plants are found there in profusion. One is the cinchona, from the bark of which is made quinine, so useful a medicine in fever cases. The other is coca, a shrub about five feet high. From its leaves comes cocaine, which is useful as an anaesthetic. The Guiana Highlands The Guiana Highlands lie in the belt of the northeast trades. When these winds reach the land, they are laden with moisture absorbed during their long journey over the Atlantic. This is condensed over the northern slope of the Guiana Highlands, which have a very heavy rainfall. The southern slope is much drier, although it also receives some rain. The highlands are little known. Much of them is densely forested, and much consists of wide, grassy plains. The coastlands are very fertile and sugarcane, cotton, and coffee are grown there. The Brazilian Highlands The southeast trades sweep over the Brazilian Highlands and water them well. The mountains in this region are not high enough to condense all the moisture from the winds, which, therefore, bring rain to almost the entire breadth of the continent. The land upon the eastern slopes of these highlands is a rich red clay, and the soil and climate are especially well suited to the coffee bush. Here is grown much of the coffee which is used by the people of Europe and America. In its wild state, the coffee bush grows to a height of 18 feet, but when cultivated, it is kept pruned to 7 or 8 feet. It bears a fruit something like a cranberry. The red berries grow in clusters, each berry containing two seeds. These are the coffee beans, so familiar to us all. Rivers and River Valleys there is an extremely heavy rainfall over tropical South America, for the ocean winds drawn into the heart of the continent by the low pressure area over the hot Amazon Valley penetrate right to the Andes. The whole area, drained by the Amazon and its tributaries, has an average rainfall of over six feet annually. As you have seen, there is also a heavy rainfall upon both the Guiana and the Brazilian highlands. It is obvious that a country with so much rain must have huge rivers to carry back to the sea, the enormous quantity of water brought by their winds. The Orinoco Valley The rain which falls upon the northern slopes of the Guiana Highlands and upon the eastern slopes of the northern Andes runs down in many streams toward the lowland which separates the two mountain districts. These streams unite to form the Orinoco River, 
and its tributaries. The Orinoco itself is navigable for 1,200 miles, and is said to have at least 400 branches which are navigable for small vessels. At its mouth, the Orinoco forms a large delta, through which the river passes by several channels. The delta is covered with dense tropical jungle. Farther inland, its valley broadens out into wide plains, covered with tall, coarse grass. Here, wild herds of cattle roam, finding abundant pasture on the open plains. These plains are called the Llanos of the Orinoco. The Amazon Valley the valley which falls upon the Andes south of the Llanos, and that which falls on the northern slopes of the Brazilian highlands and upon the southern slopes of the Guiana highlands, as well as that which falls upon the whole vast plain enclosed by these mountains, all drains into the Amazon River, truly named the King of Rivers. It is by far the largest river in the whole world. In the rainy season, the Amazon is like a long inland sea, fifteen to one hundred miles wide during that season it overflows its banks and much of the forest for miles inland is flooded so that only the tree tops stand above the water even in the dry season its breadth is from three to five miles for two thousand miles back from the atlantic into this great river many tributaries pour their waters and form a navigable network of rivers which covers the greater part of the interior of the continent the valley of the amazon is the most extensive region of dense forest on the face of the earth the banks of the rivers are lined with tall forest trees interfaced with creepers so closely that a man can penetrate the forest only by actually chopping a pathway as he goes the most important plant of the selvas as these dense forests are called is the rubber tree it is a stately forest tree with whitish gray bark and with leaves somewhat like those of the ash the indians who collect the rubber cut gashes in the bark of the tree and set little tin cups to collect the white milky sap which drips out from the cuts when enough is gathered the indian builds a fire of palm nuts which emit a very dense smoke then he dips a flat paddle into the sap and holds it in the smoke turning it so that none of the sticky sap can drip from the paddle the sap thickens and turns dark colored in the smoke it is repeated until a big lump of rubber has been formed this is the raw material which is used for so many purposes in our own land much of the amazon valley has never been explored owing to the impenetrable forest with which it is covered its inhabitants are for the most part tribes of uncivilized indians the parana valley the valley which falls upon the southern slopes of the brazilian highlands and upon the eastern slopes of the andes south of the amazon valley flows into the lowland between these two mountain areas and forms another great river system of which the two main rivers are the parana and the paraguay these unite and flow into the great estuary called the plata which is two hundred miles long and one hundred miles wide at its mouth to the west of the paraguay river lies a great palm forest broken here and there by long stretches of grassland the country east of this river is heavily timbered in this forest is found the shrub which provides much of south america with its most popular beverage this is mate or paraguay tea it is made from the young tender leaves of the mate bushes it is a bitter drink but very stimulating the pampas toward the mouth of the parana river the forests gradually become less dense until the plain becomes a treeless grassland these plains are called the pampas it is a country of great estates where land is sold not by the acre but by the square league a block containing about six thousand acres here are great herds of cattle and enormous flocks of sheep horses are so plentiful that many are slaughtered just for their hides the better watered sections of the pampas make fertile farms and much wheat is grown on them patagonia the pampas cover the eastern lowland from the parana river to the bahia blanca south of this we come again to the belt of the westerlies which cannot bring rain over the andes to the eastern plain therefore this district known as patagonia is almost a desert 
Here and there are thorn bushes, and in some places there is scanty grass. There are scattered sheep farms along the coast. Animals. The rivers of South America swarm with life. There are numberless alligators and many varieties of fish, some of which are huge creatures ten feet long. The Indians eat the tails of young alligators, and travellers who have tasted this dish speak well of it. Turtles are extremely abundant, and many of them are very large. Their flesh is good to eat. The Indians use as food their eggs also, and prepare an oil from them for cooking and for fuel. The forests are full of snakes, many of them poisonous. The largest snake found in South America is the anaconda, which, like the python, crushes its prey to death. The jaguar and the puma are beasts of prey which correspond to the tiger and the lion of the old world. They are, however, not quite so large and fierce. They seldom molest man, but they often attack the flocks and herds of the ranchers. The tapir is peculiar to South America. It is an animal of about the size of a pony, with a head shaped much like a pig's, but with a much longer upper lip. It is very timid and hard to shoot. More dangerous are the herds of little wild pigs called peccaries. These beasts are very ferocious, and a drove of them is more dangerous to meet than either a jaguar or a puma. In the grasslands to the west of the Paraguay River, are herds of antelopes and deers which are hunted by the uncivilized indians who still live in this region here too are many armadillos curious burrowing animals found in many parts of south america the armadillo has a shell like a turtle the flesh is considered dainty food by the natives south america is rich in bird life there are many varieties of parrots of bright colors the toucan is a brilliant bird of red and blue, with a heavy hooked bill. Vultures are common everywhere. The Guiana Highlands are noted for their hummingbirds, which flash from flower to flower like living jewels of topaz, ruby, or emerald. Over the pampas roam flocks of rheas, birds very much like the ostrich, but without plumes. The natives of Argentina hunt the rhea on horseback with the bolas, a thong of leather eight feet in length with a weight at each end as soon as the hunter is near enough he throws the bolas which winds itself around the legs of the bird and brings it to the ground so much is the rear esteemed by the natives of food that like our buffalo it is in danger of becoming extinct people the original population of south america was of course indian soon after the discovery of america the spaniards conquered the west coast and the southern part of the continent and the portuguese formed settlements on the east coast but the portuguese brought over many negroes from africa to work in their plantations today many of the coast population are descendants of the spaniards and the portuguese who intermarried with the indians there are also pure-blooded indians and negroes and people of mixed indian and negro blood in addition there are many europeans of various races who have gone to South America to settle. In the interior, there are few people yet, except Indians. End of section 28